So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Naruto is neglected by his family and releases wood style. Part 2. If you guys enjoy this what if. And want to see part 3. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. The boy lands with a thud on the ground onto his back. His eyes widen in horror, but the scream he attempts to let out doesn't accompany this look as a hand covers his mouth. He murmurs, his pleas for mercy incoherent but can do nothing as a kunai descends on him in a horizontal slash, slicing his throat open. The kunai wielder rises to his feet and watches as the young male thrashes about on the floor for a few moments before finally his body goes limp and silent. He looks to his left to see two grown masked individuals laying still, not far apart from one another. One laying on his back with the setting sun shining on his skin, a sickly purple color and another on his stomach, two swords through the upper back pinning his body to the ground. The killer throws his kunai onto the ground, stabbing it into the ground standing upright. He looks behind him as three other masked individuals meet his eyes, two of them clearly adults, the third having the killer's own height. Are any of you injured? The tallest of the masked individuals questions. The shortest mask wearer shakes his head, and so does the second tallest. They all look ahead as the kunai-wielding killer reaches for his face, it being adorned by a mask of its own. Unlike all others on the scene though which are white and each bear an animal design of their own, this particular one is pitch black, bearing the design of a human skull. Its wearer pulls it off, sparing one last look at his victim, who has a head of brown matted hair and eyes, adorned in standard leaf shoe and in attire before, walking off towards one of the many trees on either side of the dirt path the bloody scene has unfolded. Clean up while I get changed. Then we rendezvous with Seal and the real work begins, he says. Right hissa terror the shortest cloak mask wearer says. The kunai wielder stops turning his head to look at the mask wearer in question, his brown eyes shining in the setting sunlight as the wind blows his dark spiky hair. We're on a mission. Don't call me that he says before continuing to walk off. Of course. Apologies, Shadow the mask wearer responds. Naruto's training ground. Naruto stands in silence looking across at his jonin commander's son and teammate's brother. For only a second chills run down his spine as he looks at the boy's face and notes the resemblance between him and. He shakes the thought away. What? What was that? Naruto asks, an eyebrow arched. I said I want you to fight me. Right here and now Sasuke replies. Naruto stands in silence, the blonde narrowing his eyes. Why would you want to fight me out of all the people in this village? He muses before he stumbles upon what he sees to be the answer. His father and sister told him what happened in the land of waves did they? Now he's here to see for himself what his ears can't believe. Well whatever the case I'm not interested the blonde boy speaks inwardly. No. Now please leave Naruto out. Perhaps my tone was deceptive. Sasuke says taking just a few steps forward I wasn't asking for anything. I was telling you I'm not leaving until you and I fight. He says his fists come up as his feet and legs move as well, shifting into the tajutsu stance of his bloodline. Do you know where you are? Naruto asks, visibly beginning to lose his temper. This training ground isn't assigned to anyone is it? It's open to all shinobi personnel for use. Like I said, I'm not leaving without a fight, the Ichiha says sternly. Naruto's eyes narrow in response as the wind blows through the clearing, whilst the two stand facing each other, the trees shaking in the wind almost in anticipation as the two young shinobi stare at each other, the tension palpable. Naruto sighs. If he won't leave, I'll just make him leave here he lents. Alright. I'll humor you. But once I've beaten you the whiskered boy clad in black says leave and don't come back and what exactly makes you think a dead last loser like yourself could beat someone like me Sasuke taunts, trying to frustrate his opponent early on. Naruto, not even having shifted into a battle stance, smirks for a second, chuckling inwardly, before his face goes turn. He brings his open hand up and moves his fingers in an inviting gesture. Come and find out, hidden leaf strict correctional facility, interrogation wing. Yugaku stands in front of the glass screen looking at the scene on the other side. A young man with white shoulder length hair clad in the standard grey uniform of the facility he finds himself in, tied to a chair, his head down, blood dripping onto the ground from his face. A man dressed in a black trench coat with a bandana tied onto his head stands over him, his gloved hands wet with blood. You're my only visible hope at this point Fugaku, a voice from his left cutting through his thoughts. He turns his head in this direction to be met with Minato's blue eyes. Are you sure you can do it? The blonde asks. What's the point of Minato? If I couldn't get anything, then he can't either, Inoichi says, earning the two men's attention, their heads turning to look at him. Fugaku smirks at the Yamanaka who stands with his arms crossed looking away. The Ichiha looks back at the village leader. Don't worry. I've got this. 
Let me in, he says, turning and walking to his right towards a steel door sporting a complex ceiling array, and Anbu Shinobi standing next to it. Minato nods at the masked shinobi who weaves through a series of hand signs before yelling, release the ceiling array disappears. Fugaku places his hand on the door, opening it with a simple push. The bandana-clad male in the room turns to him, the leaf insignia on his headband, as well as the scars on his face now clearly visible. Fugaku moves his head to the side, gesturing to the male to leave the room. Fugaku walks into the dimly lit room, eyes on the white-haired boy whose head stays down. He sits himself down in the chair opposite to the young man as the sound of the steel door, shutting echoes throughout the room. He looks to his left, met with the glass screen from before, its color now pitch black, nothing on the other side being visible. He looks back at the prisoner whose head is still bowed. Boy. Look at me Fugaku speaks. Mizuki raises his head and sees Fugaku, his eyes widening a bit at seeing the Ichiha patriarch here. Fugaku sits back in his chair crossing his arms examining the Chuanin's marred, bruised and bleeding face, much like the rest of his body. The two stare at each other for a few silent moments. Mizuki's injured face contorts into a smirk. Do whatever you want. You'll get as much as they did. I'm not telling you anything. He utters defiantly. Oh don't worry Fugaku responds casually, still leaning back in his seat. He blinks his eyelids rising to reveal his eyes having morphed, now bearing a crimson red color, three tomo marks arranged around each of his pupils in a triangular formation. You won't have to say a word he says slowly. Mizuki's heart skips a beat as he is met with the sight of the legendary Sharingan. Both ninjas suddenly turn their heads to the right as a sound earns their attention. They look to see a crack right about in the center of the glass screen. The small crack begins to grow becoming a spiderweb of cracks, growing until it reaches the edges of the glass screen. The cracks grow immersing the screen before the glass explodes all over the place, shards flying as a cacophony of screeches fills the room. Countless bats swarm through what was once the glass screen. The horror-filled scream leaves the restrained Mizuki's mouth as the bats fill the room, surrounding the two males. Hidden Leaf Strict Correctional Facility. Entrance. The drawbridge is raised behind three individuals after they've walked forwards off of it, a sea of molten lava stretching out on either side of them, and the bright blinding light from two watchtowers on either side of a tall building before them, shining down onto them. Two of these individuals are wearing the standard attire of the Anbu Black Ops of the Leaf, complete with grey combat vests and animal design masks. They walk on either side of the third individual who is clearly a male in his teens, clad in the standard Chunin attire of the Leaf, missing only the headband. He has brown matted hair and eyes. Flashback, this Ateru sits back on his sofa, sighing while looking at the shogi set. Game over. The streak continues. Well played, the old man says. You've gotten better. Not long now. Soon you'll be able to beat me, he muses. Woohoo the boy responds sarcastically raising his fist into the air, laying his head back on the sofa. He squeaks in pain as the feel of the old man's cane reaching across the coffee table and smacking his knee lightly registers. Ouch. He cries you're a real pain, you know that the boy complains. And one day you will be grateful for it, the elderly man replies. A few moments of silence pass before one of them speaks again. The Chunin examinations will be commencing in less than two weeks, here in the leaf the old man says. Yeah I know Hesitera responds no such fun for me though. I'm a rookie he scoffs in frustration. There is no existing regulation that bars rookie Genin from competing in the exams. It simply isn't common practice in these times as a safety precaution. So don't make assumptions or lose hope Danzo says. Isatera raises an eyebrow at these words do you know something id. The boy has no chance to finish his sentence. A figure wearing a black cloak with a hood appears at the edge of the coffee table in a burst of smoke, kneeling on one knee. Lord Danzo addresses the old man with his head bowed. He raises his head, revealing his porcelain mask. He looks to Hisatera for a moment, placing his hand on his chest and bowing his head slightly. Hisatera nods in response. A shinobi reaches into his cloak and pulls out a brown envelope from his cloak, presenting it to the elderly man. Hisatera watches as the old man rests his cane against the coffee table and takes the folder, opening it silently and reading its contents. A good few silent moments pass before Danzo takes a few of the several that were contained in the envelope and slips them into his robe. He takes the remaining documents and files, places them back into the envelope, and slides it across the coffee table that separates the two sofas. At a moment's is your assignment the elder says as the boy takes out the contents of the envelope and lays them out on the coffee table. Your mission has been assigned. You are to infiltrate the Hidden Leaf Strict Correctional Facility and eliminate the former Leaf Chunin known as Mizuki. You have been provided with a means of infiltration. There is a Leaf Chunin, 14 years of age, named Kenji Sato. He's been arrested, convicted and sentenced for several counts of armed robbery and assault in the countryside of the Land of Fire. He's currently being held in a holding facility in the village and is supposed to be transported to the Leaf Strict Correctional Facility in a few days. 
however an altercation that will take place today in the holding cells will have him moved for safety reasons. Considering your closeness in terms of age as well as similar physical build, it shouldn't be too difficult to assume his identity. Two newly promoted Anbu Black Ops Shinobi have been tasked with transporting him to the facility. Taking into consideration the abilities of these shinobi an assault squad has been assembled, including yourself, that should be able to eliminate these two individuals without much trouble. One of the members of this unit, as well as another you are to rendezvous with en route to the facility, will assist you in playing the role of prisoner in order to get in. Once inside our contact inside the facility will ensure you make it out of your cell and are freed of any chakra suppressors. From there it will be your responsibility to ensure you carry out the mission and escape the facility without detection or capture. Your instructions have been given. Are they clear? Danzo questions. Isatera listens to this while reading the contents of the envelope. A detailed map of the Hidden Leaf Strict Correctional Facility and other details concerning the mission, such as rendezvous details and points with assignment participants. Four files rest on the coffee table. Two containing information on the two Anbu in question, the third containing information on the Kenji Sato in question, and the fourth being Mizuki's prisoner file, which among other things contains his cell location. Crystal Hisatera responds after a few silent moments. Danzo reaches for his cane, grabbing it and standing up. It must be done before sunrise tomorrow he says as the tapping of his cane once again fills the room. He gestures to the masked shinobi who, for the first time since arriving, stands up. Hisateru hears the two bursts that signal his guest's departure and sees the smoke only out of his peripheral vision, his eyes glued to a picture amongst the documents spread out on his coffee table. A picture of a young male in his teens with brown matted hair and eyes of the same color. His eyes then move from this picture to another of an older male, though still young by general standards, with white shoulder length hair and green eyes. Flashback end, the three newly arrived individuals come to a stop as three men, all clad in standard gown and attire stand before them, one stepping forward and two standing back. Identification he says. One of the masked shinobi pulls out a file from the inside of his grey combat vest and hands it to the guard Jonan. He opens it, wiping the sweat from his brow. He reads for a few moments, the only audible sound being the rumbling of the surrounding molten rock. He raises his head, laying his eyes on the newly arrived prisoner, looking him up and down and glancing back at the file in his hands. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a pen, scribbling away on the file before closing it. He turns his head and nods at his colleagues, who step forward walking towards the three males, before handing the file back to the masked shinobi who had handed it to him. Kenji Sato. Welcome to your new home, the man says, turning and walking away as the other two Jonin grab either arm of Kenji the masked individuals he'd arrived with turning and walking away. Kenji hears the sound of the drawbridge being lowered behind him as he's led towards the towering building that houses the watchtowers. One of the blinding spotlights still shining down on him and the guards whilst the other shines on the masked ninja he'd arrived with. A large steel door in the center of the front of the building is visible. A ceiling area appears on it for a second before it disappears, and the door opens, the three guards and prisoner walking in. Naruto's training ground. Sasuke rushes toward his opponent, his left fist cocked back to throw the first attack. He launches the first forward at Naruto's face. The blonde tilts his head to the right casually evading the strike. Sasuke aims a kick at the blonde's midsection with his right leg, but Naruto stops it, grabbing it with ease. His reflexes were never anywhere near this impressive before Sasuke says to himself as he attacks that grip he notes as the blonde grabs his leg, stopping his kick aimed to the stomach how strong is he? The Ichiha boy raises his left leg aiming a kick at the blonde's head with the leg he still has. Naruto releases Sasuke right leg, lowering and dodging the swinging kick aimed at his head. He grabs both the Ichiha's feet and tosses him through the air like a rag doll. Sasuke slams into the ground, grunting in pain as he impacts the surface, rolling before skidding to a stop. Naruto watches as the raven-haired boy quickly gets up onto a knee first and then back onto his feet. He chuckles inwardly at his own surprise that he's actually enjoying this sharp reflexes and strength the Ichihim uses inwardly, brushing the dirt of his garments. What was it you said earlier? Naruto asks, a smirk on his face, dead last. He taunts. His opponent scoffs in frustration. Not a single attack landed. Usually Sasuke would have landed at least one attack on his opponent by this point. If Tijutsu won't work th the Ichiha doesn't get to finish his thought as the air leaves his body as he hunches over, eyes wide open. Naruto, noting that neither he nor his opponent have landed a real attack on one another, bursts at top speed towards the red-haired boy. He watches his, his onyx eyes widen as he drives a fist into his stomach. He swings his right fist, colliding with the side of Sasuke's face, the force of the hit turning him and causing him to stumble and sway side to side as his vision blurs for a moment. At speed. How? The top graduate says to himself in disbelief as he tries to steady himself. Naruto stands still waiting to see if he'll collapse. 
Sasuke launches himself off the ground back flipping and aiming a kick at Naruto's head. The blonde brings his arms up shielding his head and stopping the right-footed kick. Sasuke, seeing the opening, cocks his left foot back and slams his foot into Naruto's chest in a stomping motion, sending the blonde back while landing on his own two feet. Naruto heaves and coughs a bit, catching the breath that was just knocked out of him. His opponent's quick reaction after that sucker punch caught him by surprise. He stares down his opponent while brushing the dirt off his chest, now understanding a bit more about him. I see. In terms of speed and strength he and Satsuki are actually dead even. But he's more troublesome than her because his movements, attacks and reactions are more instinctive and quick. He's more of a natural fighter. He inwardly muses. Sasuke stares right back at his opponent, thoughts of his own running through his mind. This is incredible. He's been hiding this kind of ability. Why? He questions, eyes narrowed he's a better Tejutsu fighter than his brother. What else does he have up his sleeve? Sasuke watches as Naruto stares silently at him, asking himself what to do next. Damn it. He's faster and stronger than me and he knows it. If he moves at the speed he did when he nailed me with that right, there's no way I can react to him. Continuing with Tejutsu means certain losses Sasuke muses running forward while reaching behind his back, putting both hands into his weapon's pouch and pulling out shuriken between each finger. He throws the ninja tools at the blonde who reaches casually with one hand into his own weapon's pouch and unleashes a flurry of shuriken that clash with the incoming projectiles, changing their trajectory enough to cause them to clash with one another, stopping them in midair. Sasuke meanwhile jumps into the air weaving through a set of hand signs as the clashing projectiles fall to the ground. Higher style. Phoenix Flower the raven-haired boy shouts as a flurry of fireballs each about the size of a fist fly down at Naruto. The blonde weaves through a set of hand signs of his own, cursing his own mastery of only two water styles now when facing an Acha. Water style. Water bullet he shouts before unleashing his own fist-sized projectiles, these made of water. They clash with his opponents, cancelling one another out and creating a cloud of steam in the air. Sasuke lands on the ground flipping out a kunai from his weapon's pouch and running towards his opponent. Naruto scoffs at the boy's arrogance for attempting to attack him at close range again. He speeds forward at him. Sasuke releases hold of the kunai in his hand as once again he takes a fist to the stomach, his eyes widening once again. A burst of smoke immerses the boy, a log now in his position and meeting with Naruto's fist. Of course Naruto muses as he hears a whirring sound coming from behind him. He turns to see a demon windmill shuriken flying through the air with the Ichiha standing there weaving through a set of hand signs. Naruto moves to the side dodging the incoming ninja tool with ease. His opponent follows suit, moving in the same direction. Sasuke inwardly exclaims triumphantly as his guess of which way his opponent would dodge hits the mark. His hands together in the tiger sign, he inwardly shouts, higher style. Fireball Jutsu a large ball of fire emerges from his mouth, flying at the blonde. Hidden Leaf strict correctional facility interrogation wing. Izuki screams in horror and confusion as the bats fill his field of vision, the sound of screeching filling the room. He hears the Ichiha clan head grunt and then yell in what sounds like pain before a loud thud against the ground hits his ear. The flying creatures all around him begin to fly away from the center of the room. They all fly towards the opening of the glass screen, filling up the room that lies on the other side and flying about and screeching in there. Mizuki, still restrained, looks ahead of him and sees Fugaku laying in a heap on the ground, out cold, bleeding from what seems like two needle-sized holes in his neck. Next to him stands a figure. He raises his head as he takes in the figure's appearance. Black sandals and baggy pants of the same color, tucked into combat tape tied around the legs. A long sleeve polo top, also black, with a gray short sleeve robe that extends just past the knees and is open on the sides on the lower half of the body, with a large purple rope belt tied around the figure's waist. No. It can't be Mizuki says to himself in disbelief. He looks up, and his green eyes are met with another pair which are of a golden color and have slits for pupils with purple pigmentation, coloring their contours and marking the sides of the bridge of the nose of their owner, as well with long black hair that extends past the shoulders and frames an extremely pale face. El Lo Lord Arachimaru Mizuki stutters out in a tone reminiscent of a question in its disbelief. Hello child. It's been a while since the male speaks in a smooth manner, a smirk on his face. You're not looking particularly healthy at the moment. I'm very interested to know how it came to be that you found yourself in such a place, Arachimaru says, casting his gaze to the unconscious Yugaku on the ground. I you see the Mizuki continues to stutter, still not believing his eyes. No matter what Arachimaru says, raising a pale hand to silence the young man can come later. As long as you haven't told our good friends here anything they shouldn't know he says, you haven't have you? He questions, his eyes still glued to the unconscious Achiha at his feet. No. Not at all. Mizuki replies in almost a shout I've said nothing. I would never in my wildest nightmares dream of betraying you. The white-haired young man exclaims. 
But Orochimaru says finally taking his eyes off of Yugaku and casting his gaze to the room full of screeching bats on the other side of what was once a darkened glass screen. The night is still young. Our hosts won't want to sleep for too long. You I and my friends over there should get going now he says watching the bats, a smile spreading across his face. Rr right he stutters out again, looking at the bats. He looks back at his master who turns his head to him. His own green eyes meet those golden ones. The pale man blinks and his eyelids rise to reveal a crimson color in place of gold, the slitted pupil now round as it would be for most men, three tomo marks surrounding it. Azuki's eyes widen in shock and confusion as Orochimaru stands before him, the Sharingan glowing in both his eyes. The young man blinks and in the fraction of a second it takes his eyelids to rise, they rise to reveal a completely different scene. Standing where his master had been is the same Ichiha who had been on the ground unconscious only a fraction of a second ago. He notes the screeching of the horde of bats is suddenly gone, and his head turns sharply to the left to see no bats and the darkened glass screen in place, not a single break or crack in sight. W what? Mizuki stutters out for the umpteenth time, his breathing quickening. He looks all around the room, his eyes darting around. W what's going on here? He asks, confused, looking up at the Ichiha clan head. Orochimaru huh? So that's who you stole the scroll for, Fugaku says. I, I don't understand. I never. A hidden sound village. Very interesting, Fugaku says, causing Mizuki to gasp and look up at him, his Sharingan eyes still glowing in the dimly lit room. I? How? I never said anything. Mizuki cries in a manner of almost desperation. I told you Fugaku replies you didn't have to. The moment you looked into my eyes it was done he says plainly, as said eyes return to their original black color, the tomo pattern disappearing. Fugaku walks off towards the steel door he came through, leaving Mizuki staring into space, his mouth agape. Yugaku walks towards the door with a smirk on his face, chuckling for a moment, as one thought in particular swirls in his mind. Naruto, he says. He's taking more and more of a liking to his blonde student. Other side of the screen. A steel door opens and Fugaku steps through it to see Minato, Ibiki, Inoichi and Anko, as well as a few Anbu, all part of Minato's security detail, one of them the one who opened the steel door, all staring at him in awe and shock, having been paying attention to the conversation taking place on the other side of the glass screen. The Ichiha Patriarch had gone into the room, sat down and stared at Mizuki for only a few seconds before standing up and leaving. Yugaku leans against the wall with his arms crossed as the Anbu shuts the steel door behind him and looks straight at Minato. Let's head back to your office. You're not gonna like this, he says. Hidden Leaf Strict Correctional Facility, Juvenile Wing. Isateru pulls the gray top of his prison uniform off of his body. He paces around the pitch black cell, practicing his tojutsu. Bam. Before sunrise. So he could show up any minute or he could show up in hours. The boy had gone through processing without any issues. He and Kenji had the same height and weight. Same build. And so using his transformation had been made easier by said circumstances. He launches a fist through the air and just as he's about to raise a leg for a kick, hears the sound of a hand slamming against the door of his cell. Moments later, the door opens. He walks towards the now open door, knowing who awaits. Shadow, sir, a male voice says. Brad Hisateru acknowledges with the man's own codename. He holds out his hands and feels something soft fall into his hands. Garments. Something more conspicuous sir the voice says. Of course he responds. But first allow me to deactivate the chakra suppressor, the voice says. Hisateru hears the sound of hands coming together a few times before a palm touches his bare chest. Releases. The voice says lowly. Hisateru suddenly feels a rush of strength flow through his body. Ah he grunts in satisfaction. That's better, he remarks. He drops his pants and pulls on the black garments. The older male steps out into the dimly lit hallway, and so does Hisateru. He looks himself over. Black pants, long sleeved black top complete with a hood and mask. The cameras have malfunctioned sir. They'll be back up and running in 45 minutes to an hour. Mizuki's cell is only a minute away from here. You have ample time. I understand you're already familiar with the facility's layout. The male now revealed to be young, likely in his very early twenties, having short brown hair and blank emotionless look on his thin face. Yeah history says turning away your help is enormously appreciated. I won't forget this he says running off down the corridor. Naruto's training ground, Sasuke watches as his clan's signature technique engulfs his opponent. He plants his feet on the ground skidding to a stop and narrowing his eyes, examining his handiwork. Suddenly he yells as the wind is knocked out of him, a kick to the back launching him forward. He grunts as he collides with the ground once again, rolling and skidding across it. He steadies himself with a hand to the ground, jumping to his feet and flipping out a kunai. He immediately releases the kunai as a hand grips his left wrist. The hand pulls him forward into a knee to the stomach, causing him to hunch forward and cough up spit. 
Naruto, still gripping Sasuke's wrist with his right hand, slams his left fist into the side of the raven-haired boy's face once again. He grabs the boy with his left hand by his large collar, letting go of his wrist and cocking his right fist back. He launches it forward and nails his opponent, square in the face, sending him through the air. Sasuke lands on the ground with a thud and lays still, unmoving. Naruto gazes at the unconscious boy for a few silent moments before looking up at the newly arrived night sky. That exchange had only lasted a few minutes, he muses to himself. When did it get dark? He turns his head back to the Ichiha male and begins to walk towards him. Despite holding back his strongest ninjutsu and the brief nature of the exchange, he'd actually kind of enjoyed the skirmish. He comes to a stop with Sasuke at his feet and looks down to see the trail of blood now leaking from one of the boy's nostrils. He crouches down onto his haunches, reaching out and tapping his hand lightly against the boy's face. Hey, wake up no response comes from the unconscious Genin. Hey. Sasuke. Wake up. Time to go home. Repeated tapping turns into light slaps. Naruto sighs heavily, grabbing the Ichiha's form by his shoulders and shaking him violently. Hey. Come on. Wake up. This isn't your first rodeo, is it? Naruto pleads. You have got to be joking, he sighs exasperatedly, releasing the boy and pinching the bridge of his nose in frustration. He sighs once again and grabs his sparring partner for the day, placing him onto his back and walking off. Tower. Hokage's office. The Hokage sits at his desk with his hand balled into a tight fist in front of his mouth, the Ichiha clan head, sitting across from him. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. One should never put anything past Orochimaru, the village leader surmises. True. It seems he has the Daimyo Lord of the Land of Rice firmly in his pocket, Higaku says. The Daimyo allowing Orochimaru to set up a base in his nation, conducting his operations there, providing him with taxpayer funding and even letting him perform his disgusting experiments on citizens of the nation, was all proof of the fact. Well either he's sweet-talked and tempted him or he's threatened him. Either one is typical Minato assesses. Or maybe the Daimyo's already dead, the two men say at the same time. They look at each other and shake their heads, chuckling bitterly. So. What happens now? Fugaku asks, staring out of the window behind the Hokage. You know what he did to Minato. Do we give the land of rice a chance to denounce the hidden sound? Or. He turns his head, looking Minato in the eye, as it were, no questions asked. He asks. No, the yellow flash responds, we're not going to give Orochimaru any heads up. I'll have to let the elders know but this stays between us. Let's let him think he's off the radar for now while we observe and watch everything in the land of rice. So that when he does stick his head out of whatever hole he's hiding in, he won't be expecting anything, Minato says staring off deep in thought. Fugaku nods standing up excuse me then old friend. I have to head home and have dinner with my family, he says walking away. Wait Fugaku the blonde says stopping his friend in his tracks, are you sure you didn't see anything that could let us know who took down Mizuki? It could lead to more intelligence, he says. Fugaku turns his head to look at Minato. Like I said to my old friend. He or she was wearing a cloak. And a dull clearly but masked. It was all Tajutsu too, a style I don't recognize either so nothing distinguishing. Sorry the clan head says. His friend nods at him, clear disappointment on his face. Don't you dare sleep here. You'll wake up tomorrow with a red-headed demon looking to claim your soul, Fugaku says, closing the door behind him, leaving a chuckling Minato. Hidden Leaf Strict Correctional Facility. Mizuki stumbles forward into his cell, the guard helping him in with a shove to the back. The slam of the steel door echoes throughout the cell, though to Mizuki it doesn't even register. The young man clutches his head in his hands, grabbing at his hair, his heavy breathing audible throughout the cell. I, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything he said to himself repeatedly, beginning to pace back and forth. The sound of screeching bats fills his head. He whips around repeatedly trying to ensure there aren't any bats near him. I didn't say anything he said again the sound of screeching bats still plaguing his mind. He claws and grabs at his ears, almost threatening to rip them off, shutting his eyes in a desperate attempt to rid himself of the sound. His eyes shoot open, the haunting image of a silhouette with a glowing pair of red eyes, with a tomo pattern around the pupils appears to him, while his eyes are closed. I didn't say anything he shouts at the top of his lungs. Mizuki once again darts his eyes around the cell for any flying rodents, when for the first time he makes out a silhouette seated in the corner. Shadow watches on at this display, shaking his head. The T and I department is no joke he says to himself. Hey. Who's there? The white-haired rogue Chunin shouts at him. Are you another one of them? Stay back. He yells. Shadow sighs. He had planned on lying to Mizuki and telling him he was a fellow subordinate of Orochimaru, sent to rescue him to fool him into giving up any useful intel, but clearly there was no worthwhile or trustworthy information he was going to get from the rogue Chunin anymore. Not in this state. 
Mizuki tries to keep his eyes glued to the silhouette, but they occasionally dart as red pairs of eyes every so often appear in his peripheral vision, in the darkness of the cell. Aya the white-haired male yells running forward at the silhouette who calmly jumps to his feet and sidesteps a punch aimed at his face. He grabs the outstretched arm and performs a judo throw on the older male, laying him out on the ground. The brown-eyed boy grabs his target by the head, lifting it off the ground and wrapping his arm around his neck. Mizuki claws away at the boy's arms in response, desperately trying to free himself. He tightens his grip and twists his former academy teacher's neck. An audible snap rings out and Mizuki's body goes limp. Shadow lays him down gently and stands up. He gazes at the silent Mizuki for a few moments before turning and walking towards the steel door, weaving through a set of hand signs. Time to go, the Chiha clan compound. Humming Satsuki shouts as she walks to the front door to respond to the knock, her mother being preoccupied in the kitchen and neither her father nor brother having come home yet. She turns the knob and pulls the door open. Oh. H. Hi Satsuki stutters out, her cheeks turning pink as her eyes lock with those deep cerulean blue ones. Hey Naruto responds, a small smile on his face. Your brother needed a ride home. Her gaze falls on Sasuke for the first time, and she goes even more red at the fact that she only noticed her brother after he pointed out her twin is on his back. Um and she welcomes opening the door and standing to the side to allow him in. The small smile on Naruto's face disappears as he notes his own confusion at his reaction to seeing his female teammate. He steps through the door after removing his shoes as Satsuki stands aside to let him in, her brother still on his back. He walks into the household, looking around and observing the grand and regal interior design of the household, matching its exterior architecture which stands out even amongst the rest of the compound's impressive construction as well. He looks on in concealed awe. The Hokage's compound was itself impressive and a sheer display of opulence and wealth, but even it didn't match this. And Naruto, having spent the vast majority of his nights since turning five years old, sleeping under a tree for shelter, was amazed by a home of such status. Satsuki, who's at the door. The blonde hears a feminine voice call out accompanied by the sound of footsteps. A dark-haired woman emerges from another room dressed in a dark purple blouse with a red plump skirt and an apron on and comes to a stop in front of the two, her long straight black hair forming bangs on either side of her fair-skinned face and roughly framing her cheeks and eyebrows. Naruto. Makoto happily greets, seeing her best friend's eldest child. The evening lady Makoto Naruto responds formally with a bow of the head for the Ichiha matriarch. Makoto looks taken aback a bit, the fact that she hadn't seen Kashina's eldest in years only occurs to her now. Not since. Kashina's other three all referred to her as Aunt Makoto, considering her family because of the close bond she holds with their mother as a sister and because of how she had watched them grow. They had all visited and slept over at the compound many times years ago, but now that she thinks about it, this is Naruto's first time setting foot here since before he was around five years old. She had heard the rumors that the boy had packed his belongings and left his family's home, and Fugaku had confirmed them for her, not divulging much else much to her chagrin. Kishina seems to Alway be nowhere to find these days for the past few weeks, and so the opportunity to question the redhead about what was going on hasn't presented itself. I see you're with Sasuke, she says looking at her son on the blonde boy's back, his clothes dirtied and his body sporting a fair amount of bruises. Is everything okay? What happened? The smile on her face turning into a look of concern as she walks towards the blonde carrying her son on his back. We were training and Naruto responded and. He took a knock. Nothing severe I assure you Naruto responds plainly casting a glance at the unconscious boy on his back before looking back at the boy's mother now standing in front of him. Really? Makoto raises an eyebrow at the blonde's response, looking him up and down. Not a single scratch, bruise or speck of dirt on the blonde's body indicates combat. Fugaku wasn't exaggerating about his male student's ability. Tsutsuki looks on at Naruto with an eyebrow of her own raised, not surprised that the blonde had beaten her brother handily, but rather that the two had trained with one another. The eyebrow lowers as she muses about what likely happened. Naruto wouldn't have gone looking for Sasuke or perhaps anyone for that matter. Sasuke must have gone looking for Naruto to fight him because of what he heard from Dad and I. Such would be typical of her twin brother. His desire to get stronger and be the best meant that whenever he came across someone who was stronger than or rivaled him, he would do all in his power to match and surpass them. The result of this mentality had been years of one-upmanship between him and Menma and a close friendship, now no longer existent. Herself and Sasuke were once equals, and she even remembers being superior to him at a time, but now it's clear to her that her sibling had surpassed her, even if marginally. As talented as he is, such a fact is as much the result of Sasuke's burning determination and hunger for an increase in strength as it is his natural ability. Perhaps her new eyes will help close the gap though. Well, alright then Makoto says concern is still present in her voice. I'll check on Sasuke in a few moments, but first I need to check on the food. 
Satsuki, showing Naruto to Sasuke's room, the Achiha woman says walking off before turning her head. You'll be joining us for dinner, right? Makoto asks. Naruto's eyebrows rise for a moment. I'd rather end the blonde is interrupted by the sound of the door behind him opening. He turns to see his jonin leader walking into the home. He will be joining us. I insist Fugaku says with a small smile on his face looking right at the blonde boy. Naruto's mouth opens and then closes, sighing inwardly. If it's Fugaku then there's no point in arguing. Training ground 11. Hayori drops down onto her knees, gasping for breath, logs laying before her in pieces with hard clumps of earth amongst them. Her clothes stick to her body soaked with sweat. She places her hands to the ground, bent over in order to support herself. She shuts her eyes tight as the sensation of tears stinging them arrives. The blue-haired Kinoichi balls her hands into fists, gathering clumps of dirt into her palms. The young girl, about seven or eight years of age with black eyes, hair of a light blue color tied into a spiky ponytail, stands still with a look of horror etched across her face as a large white snake slithers up her body, wrapping around her as she shakes like a leaf in the wind. Ikeori isn't even able to utter a word as the breath leaves her body, and she collapses forward, laying out on the ground with a thud under the starry night sky. Elsewhere in the hidden leaf, the elderly man looks to his left out at the impressive view of the village from atop the restaurant, sitting alone at the table. The fedora hat atop his head and dark glasses obscuring his eyes matching the black suit he has on. His eyes stay glued on the view, even as his ears register the sound of footsteps approaching his position. He turns his head to see a sharply dressed young male with brown slicked back hair. The male places the silver platter in his right hand onto the table and sits opposite Danzo without a word. Finally Danzo turns his head to History who sits back in his waiter disguise. Mission accomplished old man he utters casually while lifting the lid on the silver platter, grabbing a pair of chopsticks, separating them. Danzo watches on as the boy pulls the platter of food he had ordered and begins eating casually. M.H., quite quick Danzo muses looking at the boy from behind his dark shades. So Mizuki is dead. Affirmative history replies using one hand to ruffle his own hair, attempting to get it back to its usual spiky look. He can't wait to wash this stupid dye out. I see. And you ensured not to leave any trace of distinctive evidence? The old man asks. The boy in response shoots him a deadpan look, showing his feeling of being insulted by the question before continuing with a meal before him, the old man watching in silence. In his last moments history says after a few moments of silence, bar the sound of his eating he seemed. Rattled talking to himself, seeing things, displaying paranoia. His psychological state clearly wasn't stable. It's possible that the T&I department may have broken him before I got to him, he muses casually, not looking up at the old man, but rather fully focused on his incredibly delicious meal. He'll have to check this place out himself sometime. Perhaps. Perhaps not. That is of no concern to us. He knew nothing of the foundation and any affiliation or ties we may have had to his master. The client's request was the elimination of Mizuki. That has been done and the payment for our services has been given, he says plainly. Isatero looks up from his platter for a moment, an eyebrow raised in curiosity. What had Orochimaru offered or perhaps rather what had the old man demanded in exchange for this mission's completion? Money. Necessary when running a top secret organization of military black operatives, but Gramps isn't short on that and certainly wouldn't waste an opportunity to leverage the snake on just money. He resolves to do mental gymnastics about that later. The point is his work is done. Mizuki's remains won't offer the opportunity for any information to be retrieved either. Hard to retrieve intel from ashes, at least from his knowledge. You understand that this doesn't count as an official mission report right? Danzo asks, his chin resting upon his interlocked hands, one of which is hidden by a black glove that seems to extend up his sleeve. He watches on as history places the last bit of food left on the platter in his mouth. I know. He responds by standing up. I'll do that tomorrow. I'm tired of gramps. See ya he yells running towards the edge of the rooftop dining space and jumping off, disguise and all, disappearing in a burst of smoke. Hey. Danzo calls out to the boy in vain as he leaves abruptly. He turns his head back to the platter of food he had ordered, not a shred of it left. He sighs heavily, shaking his head. MHM. There's quite a lot to be desired but. You're coming along nicely he says inwardly before turning his head, his shaded eyes once again glued to the grand view of his home. The Chiha compound. A groan escapes the boy's mouth as his eyelids flutter and rise. Sasuke's eyes are met with the white ceiling of his bedroom once again. He turns his head to the left, looking out of his bedroom window and seeing the night sky. How long has he been unconscious? He reaches for his face and touches it, wincing at the pain in his jaw and taking note that the cuts and bruises all over his body are now concealed by band-aids. He continues staring out of the window at the night sky in thought. The last thing he remembered was a fist rushing at his face in the light of the setting sun. He had been. Naruto Sasuke says to himself out loud. Naruto Uzumaki Namaka's had beaten him and had done it handily. 
Sasuke, still laying on his back, balls his fists in a gesture of prideful frustration. He had been thoroughly outmatched. He had landed one measly and ultimately ineffective kick and hadn't landed a scratch on his flesh. He places his hands on either side of himself and pushes himself up into a sitting position, once again wincing in pain, placing a hand to his hurting stomach. How is that guy so strong? Why and how had he hidden such ability for so long? He's not like his brother. Or sisters. He's. Different the Achiha says inwardly narrowing his eyes in thought. But Naruto. Naruto and Fugaku walk side by side, each with his hands in his pockets, the latter having asked to speak with the former in private. Naruto looks around at the compound, an eerie silence hanging over it, save for the chirping of crickets. He looks through the windows, the inside of each household they pass dark and silent, staring in thought. You remind me of what my son Fugaku says, breaking the silence between the two and causing Naruto to turn his head to his sensei, an eyebrow raised in thought. Who does he? Well, technically he was my nephew, but he and his older brother became mine after his father, who was my elder brother, and his mother passed. Fugaku continued looking at his student. His name was Shisui. Fugaku says, looking up at the sky. Naruto recognizes the name easily. Shisui the teleporter. One of the most formidable shinobi the leaf had seen in recent history, touted to be, at the time of his death, the second strongest of the Achiha clan, second only to the man that walks next to Naruto right now. I suppose he was a bit more of a jockester than you at times, but besides that, you two are pretty alike, he says, turning his head and once again laying his eyes on his student. He figures the best way of allowing the boy to be open and honest with him is opening up himself. Naruto looks at his sensei silently and looks away, not knowing at all what to say. I know about Mizuki. The blonde stops in his tracks at the words. He doesn't panic looking down at the ground in thought. He'd been silently awaiting this. He hadn't expected Mizuki to tell the truth. He would have thought the embarrassment of the demon brat taking him down and perhaps being praised isn't something he would have wanted. And even if the rogue Chunin told the truth, if Naruto denied it, he would have hoped there wouldn't be any concrete evidence proving his involvement in the Chunin's arrest. But this is problematic. If Mizuki had told the whole truth, then not coming forward with the knowledge of Orochimaru's involvement in the plot to seize the Forbidden Scroll could and would be interpreted as wrongdoing. I see. Naruto responds after a few moments of silence. He raises his head to look at the Achiha. So I take it the Hokage knows as well. The blonde questions. He knows what he needs to do, including Orochimaru's involvement. But as for who stopped Mizuki? His interrogator unfortunately just couldn't find that out Fugaku says, a small smile gracing his lips as Naruto's eyebrows rise in surprise. Fugaku walks closer to the boy, standing in front of him. Tell me Naruto, why didn't you tell your father the truth? Fugaku asks with a feeling that he's getting closer to what he needs to know. Naruto shrugs inwardly, knowing where this is going. He's not giving up any personal information that could be used against him in this case so he doesn't care. Because I couldn't put it past Lord Hokage and other circles linked to him to assume I was complicit and act on said suspicions. Because I don't trust him he responds plainly. Fugaku's eyes narrow in thought. It seems to him like the boy doesn't trust anyone, not even the comrades he fights alongside. Nevertheless he continues to dig. Why don't you trust your father? Jonin asks. The blonde responds, with Menma, the red and black haired boy skids and rolls before jumping to his feet in a display of agility. The last seven clones rush toward him at once. He runs towards them as well. He lowers his head, dodging a kick from one, sweeping its other leg out from beneath it and punching it. As it explodes into a cloud of smoke, the other six rush and pounce on him, dog piling onto him. Beneath the pile he closes his eyes, staying still for a moment, and they snap open, his once purple eyes having turned red with his pupils having become slits. He rises pushing the clones away, sending them flying in an incredible display of speeds at each of them one by one, scars, bruises and all, dispatching of them with single strikes until they're all gone, and he's standing alone in the training ground under the starlit night sky. He raises his right hand, looking at it in the darkness before balling it into a fist, his eyes having returned to their normal color by now. So you've gotten stronger. Well. I can get stronger too. Much stronger. Just you wait. It'll be you and me. You lay at my feet and finally be forced to acknowledge me. He jumps away landing at the top of the tallest tree in his sight, laying eyes on the Hokage monument, visible even from here. I will be the greatest. He exclaims punching a fist into the air. The Chiha clan compound. That is the truth Sensei Naruto says as Fugaku stares at him blankly. I won't try to prove anything to you. Whether you choose to believe me or not is your choice. I've simply told you because as my sensei as well as someone I've come to respect, I feel the need to answer and be honest to your question, Naruto says to the still silent Achiha clan head. He continues to walk on. Forgive me, but I simply can't join your family for dinner he says while walking away. I won't stand here and claim I understand precisely what you've experienced. 
That would be a lie Higaku says causing his student to stop in his tracks. All the pain that you've endured has taught you to be weary of those around you, hasn't it? The Ichiha patriarch speaks. The blonde stays silent at his sensei's question, needing not speak to answer it. It's clear. In obvious ways like your refusal to give away any information about your skills to subtle ones, like the way your eyes are always moving over your surroundings alertly even in the calmest moments with comrades near you, he continues causing Naruto's eyes to widen at the Ichiha's astute observations. Respect isn't enough for Naruto. Strength isn't enough. Not for me, you or anyone. Sooner or later, you're going to have to start trusting me as your sensei. Trusting your comrades. Trusting those close to you. He says watching the blonde boy whose back is still turned to him. His student stays silent for a few moments before finally speaking. Have a good night Fugaku sensei he utters plainly before disappearing in a blur. Uzumaki Namaka's household but mom Menma pleads with a hand on the chair he's pulled out. But nothing Menma. You're not eating at my table until you're clean. Have you caught a whiff of your own stench? Kishina yells in response, her hair swaying from her head in nine tendril-like bunches, as though having a life of its own. The other four in the room watch on at the scene, sweat dropping. Kakashi looks on at the scene before looking over at his sensei who chuckles as his student shoots him a look that says, you sure know how to pick M sensei, the mask shinobi says inwardly before looking back at the scene, afraid by some magic the redhead had heard his thoughts. All eyes in the living room turn to its entrance as a newcomer walks in. Uncle Fugaku Menma says seeing Satsuki and Sasuke's father. Fugaku. What a pleasant surprise. Have you come to join us? Kishina smiles. Fugaku looks at her for a moment, usual stern expression in place, before looking at Minato. He told me everything. Naruto told me everything he utters. Minato's eyes widen for a second before his head lowers, hanging in shame. Nido does the same as does Kashina, whilst Yeoi feels the sting of tears in her eyes once again. Kakashi, all the while, watches on at this scene with an eyebrow raised and eyes narrowed in confusion and curiosity. HMPH. And just what did that lying loser say to you? Menma scoffs. He yelps in pain as Kashina smacks him over the head, silencing him. Yugaku continues to look directly at the Hokage, as though the boy's words and his received smack haven't registered at all. He sees the shame on the blonde's face and knows the answer, but chooses to ask anyway, still holding out hope for his friend. Is it true? He demands in a calm voice. Minato remains silent giving the Ichiha his answer. The blonde Hokage stands up walking towards Jonan. He spoke to you? Minato asks to come to a stop in front of Fugaku. He spoke to you openly and honestly. How did it go? What exactly did H? Minato asks in a voice laced with desperation, only to be cut off by the man in front of him. Under normal circumstances I would just be letting you know how bitterly disappointed I am in you as a friend, Jonan says, the Hokage's head lowering in shame once again. But that boy is my student. Which means he's one of my own. So telling you I'm disappointed, unfortunately, is not all I'm obliged to do, Fugaku says before cocking his fist back and launching it forwards at his friend's face. Minato sees the punch coming and stays still, not dodging. He deserves this. The fist collides with his cheek, sending him backwards and laying him out onto his back. A shocked silence hangs over the room for a split second. It is quickly broken as Menma lunges at the Achiha, yelling angrily. He doesn't get close though as with a thud he suddenly finds himself on the floor on his stomach, with both his hands pinned behind his back, Kakashi kneeling over him on one knee, holding him down. Bastard. Do you have any idea whose house this is? That's the Hokage. Let me go big bro Kakashi. Lem teach this asshole a lesson. Kick his ass dad. Menma yells angrily, struggling to no avail beneath Kakashi. The masked ninja watches on at the scene calmly, sighing to himself. If anyone would have the audacity to walk into the Hokage's home and punch him right in front of his family, it could only be Fugaku Ichiha. He looks over at his sensei, who deliberately took the punch and stays calm, trusting his teacher to handle himself, but stays ready at a moment's notice to incapacitate the struggling boy beneath him and jump in if things get seriously heated. Fugaku continues looking down at Minato, still not acknowledging the shouting child. Kishina yells Minato's name as he falls, rushing to his side and kneeling to check on him. She grits her teeth and stands up to face her husband's attacker, only to suddenly see Minato suddenly standing in front of her, facing her, hands raised. No. Don't do anything stupid. He says firmly. Minato, he see, it's nothing. I deserve a whole lot more he says, causing his wife to look down again, tears forming in her eyes again. The sight piles further weight on the mountain of guilt already crushing him. Fugaku I he turns only to see his friend is gone. He sighs as the sound of his wife shaking and weeping is clear behind him. It hurts having to turn around and face what he's responsible for. An Anbu shinobi appears in front of him in a burst of smoke, in the standard kneeling position. Lord Hokage. I have some urgent news. I'm Skip. 
six days later, all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable, when using our forces, we must appear inactive, when we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away, when far away, we must make him believe we are near. Naruto shuts the book and places it on his bed. He'll continue reading when he gets back. Like he's done countless times. He stands up, walking towards his bedroom door. He'll be meeting his team today after six full days off, a messenger hawk having dropped off a message to attend for duty as usual on his balcony yesterday morning. During his time off Naruto had done a bit of training, but not much intense work unfortunately. The reason, space. He'd been mostly confined to his apartment during these days. Satsuki's brother, quite annoyingly, had decided not to honor the terms of their deal and come looking for him again. Naruto, not in the mood to deal with him, had left his training ground as soon as he sensed his chakra signature approaching for the first time. It became apparent to him on the second occasion, the day right after, that Sasuke wasn't going to leave him alone, so he chose to steer clear of the training ground for the time being. Thankfully the boy doesn't know where he lives because if that were the case and Sasuke comes knocking on his door, there would be trouble. He closes his bedroom door behind him, locking it, scoffing in a show of frustration at the predicament. It's annoying. The blonde wants to continue training properly and was already in a predicament trying to decide whether to diversify his ninjutsu arsenal further, increase the intensity of his tojutsu regimen, or hone his. He's felt his speed and strength plateauing for a little while now and has also been recently contemplating the acquisition of a special weapon of choice. An annoyance like this is plain unnecessary. Tower. Hokage's office. Minato sits back, the files on all the village's genin teams neatly sorted on his desk. He props his chin on his fist in thought. The exams commence in seven days, and today, each Jonin sensei willing to allow his or her team to participate is to declare so to him as well as notify his or her team and inform them on the exams and give them time to decide if they are willing to participate. He's allowed to deny entry to certain teams, but this year he believes the decision will lay largely in the hands of the Jonin sensei responsible for the teams. The exams will present the opportunity to observe some of the hidden sounds ninja closely for himself. He's already begun arrangements to dispatch Anbu operatives disguised as merchants into the land of rice, soon to gather intel. Having some of the sounds ninja on hand in the village will perhaps give him an idea of what the enemy is made of. Hugaku after his successful interrogation had told him the hidden sound wasn't really a hidden village, but a series of laboratories and hideouts situated throughout the land of rice. That would make gathering intel harder. The original source was out of the question. Even if there was more intel to be retrieved from him that isn't possible anymore. After the debacle that had occurred a few days ago at his home, an Anbu shinobi arrived to notify him that Mizuki had been murdered in his cell, his body burned to a crisp. As of yet, not a single trace of evidence had been found leading to the killer. He or she had vanished into thin air, either infiltrating the prison and leaving later or already being within its walls. The former seems a bit too far-fetched for Minato. No one has ever, breaking in or out, bypassed a hidden leaf strict correctional facility security. None of the prisoners could have done the deed with the chakra suppressors on them, which can only be deactivated by a select few of the guards. He thinks that's where he'll start digging. It was clear to Minato, from the moment he heard, what exactly happened. Arachimaru had moved to protect the information concerning his operations, but the rogue Sanin had moved too late. He'll worry about Fugaku later. They're best friends. They've been through all sorts of turmoil and hell together. Besides, Fugaku isn't really the one he needs to apologize and mend bridges with. He turns in his seat, looking out at the village and sighs out loud to himself. Training ground 12. Fugaku stands in front of his students, the three seated before him. The tune in exams. Ino repeats her sensei's words, still in a bit of shock. That's right. These exams allow all genin, those who participate anyway, the opportunity to have their skills assessed. Those who are evaluated and deemed by the examiners as having the adequate skills to be awarded an ascension in rank, then become Chunin, Shinobi who among other responsibilities, are allowed to lead their own squads on missions Fugaku briefly explains, knowing his students know all about the exams, but simply following procedure by explaining it to them. Now under normal circumstances, Riki Genin teams do not compete, not because of any existing regulation, but because they're commonly seen as not being ready. But the three of you have shown yourselves to me as a unit of being capable of competing against shinobi above the level of genin, so I'm going to allow you the opportunity to enter. He watches as a determined smirk is etched across his daughter's face. He looks next to her to see Naruto try to keep his trademark blank expression, but notes his eyes sharpen. Tsutsuki can't contain her excitement. This is a huge opportunity to test herself against other ninja and get stronger. Becoming a chunin would be a huge step towards her goals. Naruto visibly tries to stay relaxed, but he is excited. Battling against shinobi from different villages in different nations with different arsenals. He almost feels like jumping. 
becoming a chunin would be valued verification of his growth to new levels as a shinobi. It would be a stepping stone towards the heights he aims for, and it would mean he's a step closer to being able to actively pursue that goal. Akasada's parents had taught him much of what he knew, and he had imparted said knowledge to his children. Yet they had all been killed. Whoever was responsible was far more than likely a formidable shinobi. He needs to keep getting stronger to prepare himself to face that threat when he comes face to face with it. Ino watches nervously at her teammates. These two have helped her and held her up all the way. She doesn't think she's ready for this. Hugaku makes eye contact with her, noting her reaction. Participation isn't obligatory. If any one or two of you feels you're not ready, you can refuse entry, and the other two or one will compete. He says lying through his teeth. All three need to compete as a three-man squad, otherwise they do not qualify. His intention is to ensure none of them feel pressured into competing. He proceeds to hand the three of them a series of forms to register for participation. The exams commence in seven days. My responsibility is to notify the Hokage today of whether I have granted you permission to compete or not. Yours is to decide in the time between now and the day before the exams if you wish to participate. Of course it's important you understand what this entails and the implications. The exams permit the use of lethal force and killing, as well as other things standard under normal mission conditions. Competing will mean placing one's life on the line, he says sternly. Satsuki finally takes notice of the expression on her female teammate's face and places a hand on her shoulder. Hey, we're in this together. We fight, fall and win together, she says looking into her comrade's eyes reassuringly. Yamanaka looks over, smiling at her friend. She wants to get stronger so she can fight alongside her teammates, and having the two of them enter without her there just doesn't sound right. She feels as though she would be forsaking them. She turns her head to her jonin sensei. Yugaku sensei, I'd like to enter, she declares determinedly. So I would say Satsuki immediately after. All heads turn to the male genin of the team. I will be competing in the exams. He says. A small smile comes onto Fugaku's face. Okage Tower Hokage's office. Minato sits back watching the sunset, his chair and back turned to his desk. The meeting to decide participation in the Chunin exams had taken place hours ago. In an interesting turn of events almost all the rookie teams would be competing. Almost because the Jonin captain of Team 12 hadn't been present for the meeting. Minato sighs and immediately as he does he hears his door open. He turns to see Fugaku walk in and shut the door behind him. The Achiha walks toward the desk and places three files on them. I hereby grant permission for Gen and Team 12 to in this year's Chunin selection exams he speaks. Minato nods, not surprised Yugaku doesn't feel the need to explain his decision like all the other Jounin sensei. An awkward silence hangs over the room as Yugaku stands with his hands in his pockets and Minato sits back in his chair. Look the blonde speaks I understand th. Don't Yugaku cut him off by raising a hand. Don't explain yourself to me. I don't care about what happened the other night anymore. You and I go way back and I'm not willing to let it come between us. If you feel angry about it, then so be it. I just needed to make you understand as a brother the weight of your actions. And I can't apologize for that. Higaku says. Minato listens, his face blank before sighing once again. He smiles to himself. After all these years, Higaku is still one of the only people he knows who doesn't see him as the fourth Hokage, who doesn't see him as the Yellow Flash. Who still sees him as Minato still sees him as the lonely orphan kid he would give food to back in the academy when he had nothing to eat and let sleep in his room at his clan compound for months when he found himself on the streets. He stands up, reaching his hand out and offering it to the Achea. Higaku takes it and the pair shake hands smiling at one another. One step at a time Minato is determined to make things right. Seven days later, Naruto walks down the street. His destination, the academy, the first venue of the exams, the day of their commencement having finally arrived. He is clad in his usual attire. Black shinobi sandals and black anbu pants tucked into combat tape wrapped around his legs, as well as a black tight jersey top with sleeves that end just below the elbows, the head of a golden lion on display on his upper right sleeve. Over this he wears a black sleeveless hoodie with gold lining and zipper, with said zipper left open. He forgoes his black wristbands this time, choosing from now on to keep his storage seal hidden in his jacket. The element of surprise is vital. Of course with all of this his headband is wrapped around his head. Hey, let me go. He hears a shout coming from around the corner he's about to turn. He raises an eyebrow, keeping at a normal pace. He turns the corner to see six individuals standing together. The first he easily recognizes is Eno. Three are younger than the rest, academy students recognizable by the goggles atop their heads. The last two he doesn't recognize. One is male and one is female, the male gripping one of the three academy students by the scruff of his shirt. Both don headbands of the hidden sand and look relatively young. They must be exam participants, the blonde surmises. 
The male is dressed in a black baggy cat-like suit and has purple paint on his face with a strange bandaged object on his back. The female, who has sandy blonde hair tied into four pigtails and teal eyes, is dressed in a single light purple colored off-the-shoulders garment that extends to halfway down her thighs with a red sash tied around her waist. Her headband, as opposed to her comrade who has his tie around his head, is tied to her neck. Naruto rolls his shoulders and stretches his neck a bit, staying relaxed but ready for confrontation. Then he senses it. An incredibly malevolent and menacing chakra in the tree hanging above the scene. He keeps his eyes on those in front of him in order not to alert the one who is clearly the biggest threat here that he is aware of his presence. All heads turn to him as he comes to a stop in front of the group. Naruto Ino greets with a voice of relief. One moment she's chasing a brat for making a derogatory comment about her outfit, the next he's smashed into and gotten himself in trouble with a foreign shinobi. Then Kuro raises an eyebrow. Who's this guy? Kanohamaru's eyes widen a bit. It's Big Brother's brother. The one everyone hates. Damari's heart skips a beat as she lays eyes on the newcomer. His golden blonde hair. His heart-shaped face. His striking, almost paralyzing cerulean blue eyes. Those naturally red lips. She realizes her mouth is slightly ajar at the sight of this stunning male and closes it. Naruto she repeats the name the other leaf ninja had uttered to herself. Ino Naruto greets nodding at her before looking at the strangely dressed male. You should really let the kid go, he says plainly. Who's gonna make me a kid? Kenkuro scoffs you. He half taunts. I'm sure I'd have no trouble at all handling a professional circus act like you, Naruto says, looking at the boy over again, still intrigued by his strange attire. Kankuro grits his teeth in anger at the kid's insult, while Ino and all the genin present chuckle, even Tamari letting out a giggle much to Kankuro's anger. What did you say you lit? Honestly though I'd be the least of your worries Naruto shrugs, considering the fact that that kid you're manhandling there he continues, pointing at the boy in Kankuro's hand, as the grandson of the late third Hokage, if I'm not mistaken he utters casually. Kankuro's jaw drops and his complexion almost seems to go a shade paler, Tamari also gasping in shock. Not too many people are gonna clap for that trick. Are you trying to cause an international incident? He questions. Still stunned by the revelation, before Kankuro can release the brat himself, a stone strikes his hand. He yells in pain, releasing the boy who runs and hides behind Naruto immediately. Leave now Naruto says sternly, not even glancing at the three children hiding behind him. They comply, running down the path in the direction he came. Kankuro looks up at the tree above in annoyance to see who threw the stone. You're a long way from home to be running around causing trouble, Clown Satsuki says sitting on a branch with another rock in her hand. Ah Kankuro chuckles fights with smart mouth snot nose brats and smoking hot girls. Just what kind of place is this? Kankuro smirks looking up at Satsuki who simply raises an eyebrow at him. Satsuki got down from there. Naruto shouts. The Ichiha's eyes widened, not used to hearing him shout. Their blood smells. A delicious low voice whispers in Satsuki's ear. The Ichiha reacts quickly jumping away, down from the tree and landing next to her teammates, a kunai drawn, looking up at the tree. The two sand shinobi on the ground react in response to the action, the male drawing his own kunai and the female pulling the large war fan on her back off and holding it out in front of her at the ready. Ino pulls out her own kunai as well. The two groups stand off glaring at one another, except for Naruto who stands as calmly as before, hands still in his pockets, his eyes still on the tree, not showing any concern for the shinobi in front of him with weapons drawn. The two sand shinobi, weapons in hand, look on and awe at Naruto. He sensed Gara's presence. Just who is this guy? Kankuro asks inwardly. He sensed Gara. Naruto of the leaf, huh? Tamari stares as the cute blonde, saying the name to herself again to ensure not forgetting it. The figure stands upside down from one of the tree branches, his appearance obscured by its shadow. He jumps down from the tree, landing in front of the two sand shinobi, revealing himself to be a male with fair skin, green eyes and short spiky auburn hair, with seemingly no eyebrows or distinctive pupils. Black rings adorn the spaces around his eyes. The kanji for love is carved into the left side of his forehead in a strange-looking scar. The boy wears a black full bodysuit with an open neck, short sleeves, a white cloth over his right shoulder down to left hip, and wide leather band from his left shoulder to his right hip that tethers a large gore to his back. His headband is tied to said leather band. Hankuro. Why are you being a nuisance? The redeed questions, not even turning to look at his compatriot, rather staring straight at Naruto. You're a disgrace to our village, the redhead speaks, eyes still on Naruto. I am sorry Gara. I was Jay he stutters out only to be cut off, shut up. Or I'll kill you, he says, turning his head to his compatriot, causing him to stiffen in fear, as does Tamari. He looks back at the group, staring directly at Naruto again who looks back at him blankly. His eyes. They look just like them. Gara says inwardly. Those eyes Naruto muses at seeing such cold dark eyes. We've wasted enough time. Let's go, Naruto says to his teammates who nod. 
he starts to walk off, attempting to walk around the three foreign ninja, only to be stopped by the redhead. Wait. Gara speaks, stopping the blonde in his tracks. What is your name? Gara asks. Naruto raises an eyebrow before responding to Naruto. My name is Naruto, he responds. Naruto. I am Gara of the desert. The red-haired boy introduces himself. Mother is afraid of you. She says you're dangerous. That your blood must be spilled. I will enjoy tasting it. The sand shinobi speaks coldly, an eerie smile on his face. The two other sand shinobi's eyes widened in shock at their teammate's words. What? Okay, seriously. Who the hell is this guy? Kenkuro thinks, staring at Naruto in shock. Tamari looks on in shock, whilst Naruto's teammates look on in confusion and slight fear at the strange intimidating red-haired ninja. Naruto shows no outward reaction, but inwardly notes to himself. Mother. What does? This guy. He's dangerous. The blonde walks off without another word, his teammates following behind him. Leave Shinobi Academy. The members of Team 12 stand before the entrance to the academy they left only months ago, ready to take another big step on their paths as Shinobi. The three stand side by side, taking a moment to look one another in the eyes, before nodding and walking in. Somewhere in the land of fire, seven men in black suits sit around a large table in a dimly lit grand looking room, some of the most expensive cuisine the world has to offer laid out before them. They all sit back looking at one another, paying the lavish food no mind. Two more men in black suits of their own stand behind each seated male, each armed with a katana except for one. One set of three men sits on one side of the table, whilst another three sit on the other side with a seventh sitting at the head of the table. At the other end sits an empty seat. All eyes in the room turn to it. Always sad when a friend passes one of the seated men says in quite the nonchalant tone, suggesting the matter isn't at all troubling. Who was it? Another speaks in a tone laced with restrained anger who did this. The elderly man at the head of the table takes a drag of his cigar, inhaling the smoke and releasing it into the air above, before casting a glance at the male clad in black to his right, the only one of those standing, not wielding a blade. He bears a head of blonde hair that obscures his right eye. The man responds by speaking. The investigation Big Boss Mishima had us carry out in the land of waves over the past couple of weeks yielded some info on the culprit of Boss Gato's murder. Not much but some. The suit-clad man speaks, raising his right hand, missing a pinky finger, to pull on his cigarette. Apparently a leaf ninja did the deed. A guy by the name of Naruto. A genin who supposedly never went by any last name during his time in the land of waves the male continues. Silence fills the room once again, all in a taking time to ponder the name. Naruto. Never heard of him. I suppose it's no surprise since he is a mere genin, another of the seated males says. He's gonna pay. My men will make sure this Naruto is found and pays for my brother's life. The suited male who had demanded the identity of Gato's killer vows. That was precisely what I was getting to the elderly man at the head of the table identified as Miss Hema says. With all due respect. Is this some sort of joke? Another of the seated men questions, speaking for the first time and earning the attention of all in the room. For years Gato made a mockery of us. Hiring common low-life dogs who know nothing of our ways and traditions to serve under him, making moves to seize opposition territories without authorization or consultation and sullying our honorable name, and you're suggesting we go out of our way to avenge the bastard? He questions. What did you just say, asshole? Gato's brother says, rising to his feet in a display of rage. The remaining seated men remain seated as those who are standing draw their blades in response. Silence fills the room once again, the tension palpable as Gato's brother stares down the man who has just spoken who looks back nonchalantly, not looking the least bit intimidated. The hey, sit down. Sheath your blades, all of you Miss Hima orders calmly but firmly. The male identified as Kahei hesitates for a moment before taking his seat, all the armed men in the room, placing their blades back in their sheaths once again. Miss Hima looks around the room before speaking once again. This isn't just about Gato. Frankly I don't care about avenging him. The loss of his life means nothing to me. Misima speaks, Kahei gritting his teeth and balling his fist. This is about the integrity and the honor of the organization. If one of those who had a seat at the table is killed so easily and nothing is done about it, it will give the more opportunistic of those beneath us the impression that we've gone soft. That a seat at the table is simply for the taking. That is not acceptable. Misima speaks looking around the room at each of the seated men, cigar in hand much like their attention. My sources tell me that negotiations between the Leaf and the Land of Waves to begin a formal alliance and trading relationship are all but concluded. The Land of Waves is thus now essentially under the Leaf's protection and out of our hands. And as we speak lower tier outsider run gangs, despite being warned not to do anything stupid, are anxiously aying up the other territories Gato left behind. It's paramount, gentlemen, that at a time as uncertain as this, we send the right message to the rest of the underworld that the Yakuza are still the only top dogs and that anyone who crosses us pays. Miss Hima continues. 
So for revenge's sake he says looking over at Kahei or honor's sake, he continues turning to Gato's detractor. Or both, Naruto of the Leaf must die, he declares. He turns his head to the male to his right once again. Find out all there is to know about this Naruto. I want to know exactly what we are dealing with before we strike, he says, the blonde male nodding in response. Many attempts, like many of the men seated in this room, had been made on Gato's life in the past, some by some of these very men in the past. All said attempts had failed. This Naruto of the Leaf succeeded where many others have failed. He wants to know all he can before any action is taken. There's no actual evidence, but he has a gut feeling, honed by years in the streets and in battle, they won't be dealing with anyone ordinary. Hidden Leaf Village. Ninja Academy. Team 12 comes to a stop after entering the building as they come across a large commotion. A large group of genin stands before two chunin, recognizable to Team 12. They let us in. We're here to compete. A female leaf genin dressed in a pink sleeveless kip-out top and navy pants, sporting two buns of hair atop her head, pleads stepping forward. She reels back as one of the chunin backhands her. Denton. Another leaf genin, this one male, with a bowl style haircut and a bushy pair of eyebrows wearing a green jumpsuit, orange leg warmers and plenty of combat tape around his arms, rushes to her side in concern. Ha! Pathetic Katestu scoffs. If you can't even take that then you don't stand a chance in these exams. He declares, the other genin stiffening in discomfort and murmuring nervously. Naruto's eyes are on the sign above the door the two chunin are blocking, paying the commotion no mind. He turns his head to Satsuki who is already looking at him. She nods and he nods back, inwardly impressed. She noticed it quicker than he did. He turns his head to Ino who is looking ahead at the scene. She too turns her head and nods at the two. The three proceed to make their way around the group and towards the stairs, their destination the real exam venue. Hidden Leaf Ninja Academy. Tune in exam venue. So you guys are here too. A voice utters from behind Menla. The boy turns away from his sisters to see his best friend and his partner atop his head with his teammates either side of him. Bro Menma happily greets as the two fist bump one another. Hey Akamaru he says greeting the Inuzuka's partner who barks back in acknowledgement. HH hi am Menma, Mido, Yeoi Hinata greets shyly blushing and looking down, attempting to avoid eye contact with him. Good to see you guys here Yeoi happily greets in return, Mido smiling and nodding in agreement. It's no surprise to see you three here. I suppose Shino says, you are after all the strongest rookie team the village has to offer, the Aburam clan member says. Geez Shino, way to kiss the opposition's ass. Kiba scoffs, shaking his head, she knows only visible response being a twitch of the eyebrow. He's telling the truth isn't he? No doubt about it. We're here to win. Nothing else Menma assures. The pair of friends begin competitively bickering with one another about how much further one will go than the other, whilst two of the three females in the group watch on, shaking their heads. Shino meanwhile looks down at the back of his hand to see one of his insects fly off it and about in a familiar display of excitement and anxiety. There's only one chakra that his insects react to like this. He's here Aburam says to himself. As he lifts his head to look around he hears a high-pitched scream fill the room, all heads turning. A blurred purple-colored figure speeds past him and collides with Menma, enveloping him. Menma, I missed you so much Eno says happily clinging to him. Hey Eno Menma responds casually, returning the hug for only a few seconds before letting go, all the while looking around. If Eno's here then that means. He sees her, standing at the entrance to the room looking as stunning as ever, her brown eyes striking to him even from this distance. He frowns as he sees him standing next to her. Eno opens her eyes and looks at the red and black haired boy after he lets her go, looking to see where he is looking. A jolt of pain hits her as she sees his eyes on her female teammate standing across the room at the door. It's plain to see Menma is as crazy about Satsuki as ever. She doesn't blame him. Satsuki is after all the most beautiful girl in their age group in the whole village. She holds no ill will towards her friend either. But it still hurts to see him look at someone else like that. The way she wants him to look at her. With Naruto and Satsuki. Naruto's eyes scan across the room as many of the other gen in present proceed to glare at the newly arrived Team 12 as the double doors shut behind him and Satsuki, attempting to intimidate the rookies. He meets their stares calmly as does Satsuki, walking a few steps before leaning against the wall, hands in his pockets. He looks to his side to see Satsuki walk and stand near him, raising his eyebrow for a split second in surprise at the girl, choosing to stay with him, instead of going off with Ino to the other rookie genin, who are gathering in a group. Is something wrong? She asks, catching his reaction despite his attempt to keep it masked. No. Nothing he responds. But other leaf rookie genin, what a drag. You guys are here too, Shikamaru says to the group as Team 10 joins them. Gosh you haven't changed one bit Shikamaru. Still a lazy ass as always Ino says, rolling her eyes, arms still wrapped around Menma. Shikamaru looks at the Yamanaka clinging to Menma and then looks at the red and black haired boy his attention seems to be elsewhere, eyes glued to the other side of the room. 
Shikamaru follows the gaze to be met with the sight of the other two members of Team 12 standing together. MHM. Well, by the looks of it, you guys haven't changed much either, he answers. Team L Shikamaru is cut off from finishing his sentence as all heads turn to the door and other team belonging to the leaf enters. Sasuke. Sakura happily exclaims, jumping for joy. Meanwhile Shino's shade-covered eyes are on the blonde leaf ninja clad in black standing across the room. Shino looks back down at his hands to see a few more of his insects crawling along his hands quickly and a few taking flight. He infuses some of his own chakra in an attempt to calm the creatures. It seems your chakra is as intimidating as ever. Naruto of Team 11, Isateru once again chuckles to himself, still not over the ass kicking the Achiha has just taken at the hands of that other weird looking leaf genin. He inwardly sighs to himself. This is the less fun part about being undercover. Not being able to have fun and go all out all the time. He would have loved to take that guy on for himself. Sasuke inwardly curses to himself as Team 11 enters the exam venue. He had been beaten. Humiliated. Again. First Naruto now that weird looking Lee guy. To think there were such incredible fighters in his own village, capable of dispatching even him easily. It makes him wonder how many other ninja like that there are from other villages in this very room. The three spot the rest of the leaf rookie genin as soon as they walk in and walk towards them. But the rookie genin group. Sasuke. Sakura exclaims, walking up to the Achiha boy as Team 7 steps up to the group. I just knew you were gonna be here. There's no way the strongest genin in the village wasn't gonna compete in the exams, she says, looking at him adoringly with the boy saying nothing in response, staring back at her blankly. History chuckles again Sasuke turning and frowning at him in response. Yeah, the strongest genin in the village. Sasuke hears, in a class of his own. History chuckles while Kaori rolls her eyes. Hisateru just loves winding Sasuke up. Is she really gonna have to separate these two in front of all these people? Sasuke is not the strongest billboard brow Ino says to the pink-haired Kinoichi. Oh boy here we go, Shikamaru says shaking his head as all the rookies present heave a collective sigh knowing what's to come. Yes he is an Ino pig. Sakura shouts angrily, turning to the Yamanaka who finally let go of Menla. No, he's not, she denies. Ugh, we get it. Menla and Sasuke are really cool. Can you two pipe down? Kiba interjects. They both turn their heads to Kiba, Sakura ready to bite his head off only for Ino to speak before she can. Menma's not the strongest either, Ino says, finally earning the boy's attention as all the rookie's eyes widen in surprise at the blonde's words. What? Kiba utters confused, surprised to hear these words from the blonde who has always been infatuated with his best friend. Then who is? Yayoi questions. If anyone in our graduating class is the strongest genin in the village it's in. Hey, you know you really shouldn't be attracting so much attention to yourselves, a voice says interrupting the discussion. All heads in the group turn to see a newcomer. His headband identifies him as a citizen of the leaf like them. He bears ash gray hair tied in a ponytail and onyx colored eyes with black rimmed circular glasses over them. He wears a dark purple shirt with a high collar, a white undershirt and dark purple pants with a white cloth waistband. On his hands are fingerless gloves the same color as his pants with armored plates on the back of his hands. And just what's it got to do with you? Eno asks the stranger huffing. Sorry the newcomer chuckles. I meant no offense, just looking out for some fellow leaf ninja. You're the rookies right? fresh out of the academy. Take a look around. You've made quite the impression the gray-haired young male says directing the attention of the genin to their surroundings. The genin finally look around themselves to realize the noise their group has been making has attracted some unwanted attention, most of the genin in the room glaring and staring them down. Hinata Choji, Sakura and Ino shift uncomfortably, growing nervous faced with the glares. Yeoi simply huffs while Mido crosses her arms showing no other outward reaction. Shino displays no outward reaction at all, while Shikamaru's trademark nonchalant expression remains in place. Man, what a drag he says. Nice work Ino and Sakura Kiba grumbles. Sasuke's face remains blank, the Achiha not intimidated by the glares. While well, Hisateru chuckles a bit, Hyuji muses sarcastically. He wonders how many of these guys will be a threat though. Menma turns around and looks around the room, meeting the glares. Anybody here have a problem? The red and black haired boy questions loudly. The room full silent, all eyes on him. He slams his foot on the ground in front of him. If anybody in here has a problem with me or any of the people standing behind me, step right up right now and let's solve it, he shouts. The room remains silent, Menma scoffing. Bunch opposing cowards, he says, turning back to the group of rookies. Gosh Menma you're so cool. Ino exclaims in admiration while Shikamaru's eyebrow twitches. That's your big solution. Making things worse. He says, dragging his palm down his face in a gesture of exasperation. Of team guy. Huh, say isn't that the other rookie of the year? 
asks a boy in his early teens with long dark brown hair and wide eyes with a slight lavender tint to them as he sits with his teammates, the three having arrived discreetly by teleportation so as not to attract attention. Indeed. He is one of the famed Hero 3 of the Leaf. Lee responds to his teammate son of the 4th Hokage. I look forward to testing the limits of my youth against him, Lee says, eyes on the black and red-haired boy, a few foreign shinobi overhearing him and gasping and murmuring in shock. Niji simply grunts, eyes also intently on the boy. Typical Lee, ready as ever for a fight. He recognizes the boy now. He is indeed the fourth son. His father and the boy are friends, but the two themselves have never spent any time together. He seems quite brash. He wonders if the boy has the technique to stand behind his words. So that's Menma Yuzumaki Namikaze, huh? Tenten says. But Gara, Tamari and Kankuro. Tamari simply scoffs at the display, seeing nothing but a loud mouth Brad, eager to get himself killed. Mm, lot of loud mouths and smart asses in this village Kankuro says, looking at the red and black haired boy, after he turns away again. At this point I'm itching to shut one up. He says smirking. The sand shinobi turns to his siblings to see Tamari with her arms crossed, looking unimpressed and Gara looking in another direction completely, showing no interest in the boy. Ankuro follows the redeed's gaze to be met with the sight of two of the leaf shinobi they ran into earlier. Hey, it's that Naruto guy. Kankuro muses, turning his head back to the redeed who continues staring intently, paying him no mind. But Naruto and Satsuki. It's honestly strange remembering sometimes that you and Menma are actually brothers, Satsuki says after the two witness the boy's outburst. Naruto stays silent, choosing not to respond to her words. The two stand in silence once again after having spoken with one another since entering the venue. Naruto closes his eyes for two seconds, infusing his chakra, Satsuki all the while watching on at first in confusion and then realization. His eyelids rise, his head turning to look to the back of the classroom. His cerulean orbs lock with a pair of teal ones. They belong to none other than the red-haired San shinobi he had met earlier in the day. The two stare at each other, Satsuki following his gaze and realizing where he's looking. That guy. Something about him seems like trouble. A different kind of trouble. Satsuki says, eyes narrowing. Naruto breaks eye contact with the sand shinobi, turning to his teammate. Satsuki, if it happens that you come face to face with that sand shinobi, don't fight him, Naruto says firmly. The Ichiha girl frowns slightly in reaction to being told what to do, eyebrow raised while crossing her arms. I can take care of myself, Naruto, the brown eyed girl says in a matter of fact tone. I never questioned that boo, his head turns sharply in the direction of the group of rookies, Satsuki following suit, before Naruto disappears in a black blur. Meanwhile with leaf rookies. Whoa, the guys have been on a beer rank as a gen and never been injured, Shikamaru utters in much the same shock all else present in the group seemed to be in, seeing the information on the San Shinobi Ino had asked about. Ino looks on, eyes wide in shock. No way. This guy is that strong she thinks to herself in slight fear looking down at the info card. She thinks back to his words when they first saw him. I have to tell Naruto to watch out for this guy. Could her teammate, even in all his strength, be a match for someone who has never been injured? Is there anyone else you'd like to know about? I can provide you with intel on Shinobi from pretty much any village, apart from the hidden sound. They're a small, young village from a relatively uninfluential nation, so I can't give you much on them, Kabuto says. Naruto Uzumaki Namika Sasuke says, earning surprised looks from all the rookies present. Right, Kabuto says, shuffling his cards once again. He stops placing his index finger on the top card, spinning it. As he turns it three shinobi spring in front of the group suddenly. Before Ino can react, a hand grabs her by the arm, pulling her away as though she were a mere rag doll. Naruto speeds from across the room as soon as he senses and sees the sound ninja approach the rookies, making a beeline for Ino, grabbing her by the arm and jumping back, throwing her to the ground behind him, standing in front of her in a gesture of protection. Isateru jumps in front of Kaori, pulling out a kunai Sasuke meanwhile flipping out a kunai of his own. Yeoi, Mido and Menma jump into a triangular formation, back to one another. One of the sound ninja throws a punch at Kabuto's face who dodges it. Suddenly the glass of his spectacles cracks into two spider webs of shards. He hunches over clutching at his ears, wincing and crying out in pain, coughing up a bit of bile. The masked sound ninja doesn't get much time to examine his handiwork as a fist to the face from Menma sends him flying back. He lands with an unceremonious thud. His teammates look on in shock for a split second before attempting to retaliate in anger, but before they can do so a burst of smoke fills the front of the class. Alright listen up you baby face degenerates. The smoke clears to reveal several leaf chun in flanking a male with scars stretching across his face, wearing a bandana with a hidden leaf forehead protector on it. I am Ibiki Marino, proctor for the first round of the Chunin selection exams he declares. He casts his glance to the group of leaf and sound ninja only steps away from him. 
any unsanctioned combat will result in immediate disqualification for those partaking in it, as well as their teammates. This is the first and last warning any of you will receive, he says sternly. Apologies Sir Mito apologizes on behalf of the group of Leaf Ninja, bowing her head. Osu, by now having just sat up, frowns, narrowing his eyes at Menma who isn't even looking at him anymore. His teammates help him up by an arm each, the three walking away. That brat's gonna pay his Aku bows. These god is coming. Don't worry. But did you see how fast that blonde guy moved? Keep an eye on him he says looking at both his teammates on either side of him who nod in affirmative. Naruto turns to Ino, tucking the two kunai in each hand back into his weapons pouch, the heads of the group turning to him in shock. Are you alright? He asks the blonde. She nods, taking his hand. As he helps her up, a look of disappointment is etched on her face. Again. She'd found herself in the middle of a confrontation, and once again she'd needed a teammate to help her. Yayoi looks on, a look of awe and sadness etched on her face, as she sees her brother extend his hand and help his teammate, a gesture of kindness being something she's never seen him perform. Big brother was only worried about protecting Ino. He didn't even look at us as she inwardly says sadly. Menma looks on in silent shock. And no way. How did he do that? The red and black haired boy questions inwardly in disbelief. He watches as the boy offers in his hand, his eyebrows rising in confusion. Naruto protecting someone. But Naruto doesn't care about anyone. He never has. Just what is going on here? Naruto turns and begins walking back to Satsuki, walking past the group as though they aren't even present, Ino following. Satsuki blinks, deactivating her Sharingan. She places the kunai she had pulled out back in her weapons pouch, as her teammates step up to her, having pulled it out and moved towards the group seeing the commotion. Are you guys alright? She asks, the two nodding in response. What just happened? She questions turning to Ino. I don't know. That Kabuto guy said something about the hidden sound. All of a sudden they showed up. They must have been offended when Yamanaka responds, turning her head along with her teammates to Kabuto, now being tended to by Mido and Yaoi. Naruto looks at the group to see them all staring at him in wonder and shock. All except for two that is. Sasuke who stares at him knowingly and. He looks to see Menma standing near Mido, Yeoi and Kabuto, a single fist clenched, glaring at him. Naruto meets his gaze calmly before turning and walking away without a word. Are you sure you don't need a medical ninja? Mido asks. I'm fine, really. Thank you the grey-haired young male assures. He glances at the blonde boy garbed in black walking away from the group, seeing him clearly through the holes once occupied by the glass of his rimmed spectacles, narrowing his eyes in thought. But team guy, such incredible speed. Who is that? Lee shouts in disbelief and excitement, slamming a fist onto the desk he is sitting on. Denton watches on speechless. No way. He's just as if not faster than Lee. How did he react that quickly? She thinks in shock. Niji stares at the blonde boy, eyes narrowed in thought. He looks familiar. Isn't that? It is that boy. The one everyone in the village. So then he says outwardly piecing the puzzle in his head together. He's the loud one's brother. The second son of the fourth. Niji says. Come to think of it, isn't the blonde older? Far more disturbingly however, he knows the blonde to be an untalented shinobi, the worst of his generation. Even the most talented genin among a class of graduates aren't anywhere near that level of speed and reactivity. Niji's eyes narrow in thought. His interest has been piqued. But Gara, Tamari and Kankuro. Kankuro's mouth hangs open in disbelief. No way. I had my eyes on him. I didn't even see him move. He speaks eyes still on the blonde clad in black. Tamari looks on with a similar expression, having noticed the blonde from earlier, after realizing her siblings were staring at something. All that had moved before he'd suddenly been on the other side of the room was his head turning sharply in the direction of the skirmish between leaf and sound, before it had even broken out. Ara looks on at Naruto as well, his breathing having visibly picked up. A small smile graces his lips, one that his teammates look at him and slightly tremble at seeing. The red-haired boy licks his lips, his eyes closing for a moment. He can almost taste it. His eyes shoot open and lock onto the blonde once again. But Ibiki, alright. Enough chatter. You will all now draw lots and be assigned random seats which you will occupy for the duration of the first round of the exams. Ibiki announces. But Fugaku. Fugaku stands before the memorial stone in silence as the wind howls. He lays down the bouquet of flowers in his hand against the monument, his eyes remaining glued to it even as a familiar presence appears next to him. Long time no see. A calm voice speaks, earning his attention. He turns his head to the left to see Kakashi standing next to him. Not too long though, Kakashi. The Achiha responds by greeting him before turning his head back down to the monument. Kakashi chooses not to ask his second teacher about his clash with his first sensei. It's none of his concern really. The two, knowing them, are probably back on friendly terms. One thing that is certain however is his own interest in his sensei's eldest child has grown even further. 
He looks down at the monument as well, the two standing together for a few silent moments. Tell me, how's Sasuke coming along? The Achiha head asks, a small smile gracing Kakashi's mask-clad face for a second. He's doing well. He seems even more motivated nowadays in fact. He's training even harder than before, as crazy as that may sound. I think his sister awakening her Sharingan has lit some fire underneath him. He's doing all he can to make sure he doesn't get left behind. There could be more to it though Kakashi says while Fugaku's eyes remain glued to one among the collection of names. I see. So I take it you're confident in your bunch then. Fugaku says, turning his head to the masked Jonin who scratches the back of his head meekly in response, the two chuckling together. I believe Kakashi responds simply. You're a lot like the three of us were back then, Fugaku sensei. It's strange, he says soberly, looking down at the monument again while a small smile graces Fugaku's lips. He can understand Kakashi seeing some of himself in Sasuke. In truth he does too. But to think there's someone on Kakashi's team similar in any way to Ibido. He can't wait to meet whoever that is, as well as see what they're made of in the exams. What about yours? The masked ninja questions. Fugaku looks up at his son's best friend before looking back down at the memorial stone. My team? He says with a knowing smirk gracing his face. Just you wait and see. He responds by piquing the copy ninja's own interest. Leaf Ninja Academy exam venue. Raidabiki addresses the room full of genin who have taken their assigned seating. The first round of the Chunin selection exams he speaks looking around the room at the expressions of anticipation that stare back at him begins now. Naruto sits back, hands in his pockets as a silence of anticipation fills the room. The proctor, in what seems to be enjoyment to the blonde, stands in a torturous silence, soaking every ounce of attention from the cadet ninja, seated in their allocated seats in the room. The genin's eyes stay on the exam proctor, paying no mind to the girl next to him, who keeps turning her head to lay her eyes on him. The Aoi looks to her left for the umpteenth time to glance at her brother, the blonde boy staring ahead, having not spared her so much as a single glance since he first sat down next to her. She sighs. He had always been distant and silent. Just not the same way. Before, there had been a gentleness to his reserved nature that had always intrigued her. She can still remember vividly when that changed. The first time she'd seen the black garments and iron-clad thousand-yard gaze that had come to epitomize him. Flashback. The Aoi jumps in a bit of a fright as the flash of lightning that illuminates the dark hallway that leads to her room is accompanied by a crack of thunder. The bright light and loud sound not only shakes off her drowsiness but brings into view the figure walking down the hallway towards her. A sigh of relief escapes her as she realizes the figure to be her eldest sibling in the flesh for the first time in days. Quite miraculously he'd been to the academy the very first day after waking up from his coma. Since then he's not been seen by anyone for four days. She watches as he walks towards her, a shaft of light from the window on the right of the corridor, shining down onto his drenched figure. She gasps as she notices the amount of weight he's lost, looking more frail than she's ever seen him. His usual orange and blue gear are nowhere to be seen, a black long-sleeved shirt and pants in place of them. She inwardly panics slightly as she mulls over her words to him for a moment. She won't be rude to him this time. Or belittle him in an effort to get his attention or elicit a reaction from him. She just wants to hear his voice and know he's okay. There you are. She says as they come within steps of each other. Where the heck have you been Naruto? Mom and dad have been worried sick. You just got out of the hospital she spews, stopping while the thin blonde boy, eyes shadowed by his wet locks, continues to walk forward, as though her words have not registered. He walks past her as though she isn't even there. Yayoi, beginning to feel frustrated, grabs the boy from behind by his collar. I'm not just gonna let you walk off and ignore me like you always do. She says firmly, where do you get off completely disregarding how we feel about you? Are we ever gonna matter to you again? She pleads, her eyes watering while still gripping his collar. His head turns slowly to meet her desperate gaze. The girl's grip slowly releases as she is met with the blonde's own gaze. Ice cold and chilling. Robbing her of the will to even move. She then notices the lone teardrop trailing down his right cheek. H his eyes. There. Different. Naruto. What's happened to you? The blonde girl inwardly questions. A flash of lightning bathes the corridor once again, and as it does, she swears for a fraction of a second that the cerulean blue and whites of his eyes turn to a bright glowing white, reminiscent in color, of the lightning flashing in the night sky outside. Just as quickly his eyes are back to that deep cold gaze again, Yayoi frozen by it. He turns his head again and continues to walk down the corridor, not uttering a single word. Flashback ends. Yayoi's mouth opens, but no words leave it, the object of her attention still focusing his own elsewhere. The first round of these exams will be a written exam consisting of 10 questions Ibiki speaks, as the Chunin lined up on either side of the room, proceed to hand out papers to the Genin. The rules of this exam are as follows. Rule 1. There are 10 questions with each question worth a point. 
Every question answered incorrectly is a point lost. Rule 2. Every cheating offense will result in a two points deduction. Once the maximum of 10 points has been expended, disqualification is the result. And Rule 3. Any participant found to have scored zero points, by way of disqualification or otherwise, will fail along with their teammates. Ibiki says, an uproar being the result. Silence. He orders, to which the genin complies. You will have one hour to complete the exam. The tenth question will be given verbally 45 minutes into the exam. Your time starts. Now. But Naruto. And a clock on the dot, reads the clock mounted on the wall at the front of the class. Naruto grabs the piece of paper in front of him and turns it over. His eyes scan over it for a few moments. After reading it for a second time he sits forward, resting his chin upon interlocked hands, his eyes closed. This is not genin level theory. In fact, most Chunin level ninja would struggle with some of these questions. A maximum of 5 point deductions for cheating offenses, instead of immediate disqualification. And theory is practically impossible for Genin level ninja to understand Naruto analyses. His eyelids rise, his eyes darting around the room and up at the ceiling. Intelligence gathering, huh? Alright then. But Eno. Eno smirks to herself, inwardly squealing as she memorizes the last bit of Billboard Brown's work. Of course forehead, having the big brain she does, had made relatively short work of the exam paper. And taking control of her body had proven no trouble at all. She smirks slyly to herself again. Sensei only banned her from using it in real combat situations, after all, so this was perfectly fine. Come on guys. We've got this as she inwardly assures, confident her teammates are by now going about getting the answers. But Satsuki. You always did spend so much time trying to master your theory. Satsuki says inwardly, her Sharingan eyes firmly on an exam participant a few rows ahead of her. Maybe that's why you were never able to beat me she muses. Ah uh, no. That's not it. In any case you've turned out to be useful, Mido. She says to herself as her Sharingan effortlessly copies the pen strokes of the red head meters away from her, filling her exam paper with answers. But Naruto. Team 43, fail. Yet another Chunin Proctor's voice calls out. Team 37, failed. Another calls out. Naruto sits still as a projectile darts past him and embeds itself into the desk behind him. He turns his head to see a distraught-looking leaf genin, looking down at the kunai jutting through his paper and desk. Team 21, fail. The blonde turns his head back to the front, cracking his knuckles and patiently awaiting. Ibiki watches on, eyes narrowing in thought, as he notes the blonde's nonchalant reaction, not stiffening or flinching one bit during the display. That kunai could have killed him and yet. He says to himself as he looks at the genin, looking calm and collected, having directed his attention back to his test. But Naruto's shadow clone. Here he says to himself as he senses the chakra signature he's looking for right below him. He reaches in the darkness for his weapon's pouch, producing a kunai. He infuses some wind-style chakra, running it along the blade's length and stabbing it into the bottom section of the vent, cutting a small circle. He infuses chakra into the finger of his other hand, placing it on the piece of surface he's cutting. The blonde pulls his finger away, the circle sticking to it, placing it aside. He reaches into his pouch again, this time pulling out a circular piece of glass, framed by its own circular piece of black steel. He brings it to his eye, leveling it with a hole, looking down into the exam venue, past a head of red hair tied into a ponytail, to see an exam paper with almost all of its questions answered. He gets to work memorizing it. But Naruto, the wave of memories hits him, and as it does he picks his pen up, filling in all the answers he hasn't managed to give. With Menma. Menma taps his pencil a few times, the sound echoing throughout the silent room, no one paying it any mind. Two minutes pass before he hears the responding set of taps come from his sister Rose down. He smirks to himself as he writes the remaining answers down. With Mito on their team and their level of communication, there's no way they could ever fail this exam. He just hopes Yeoi can keep her head in the game, that being put next to him doesn't distract her. Meanwhile with Niji, Niji's eyes sweep across the room, by Akigan active and searching for answers. The Hyuga Genin stops in his proverbial tracks, gasping in awe at what has caught his attention. In the sea of chakra networks of all the exam participants, Niji lays his eyes on one in particular. Unlike all the other individuals in the room, whose chakra shines a blue hue as it flows through their bodies, a snow-white color radiates throughout this individual's chakra network. The shock causes Niji to release his grip on his pencil for a moment, earning a raised eyebrow from the genin seated next to him, as he gazes at the blonde boy in black once again. He flares his chakra, attempting to release any. None seems to have been cast. W what? Just what kind of chakra is that? The Hyuga questions inwardly. Just. What is he exactly? But Naruto. Naruto sits with chin resting upon interlocked hands. The blonde can feel a few pairs of eyes on him now, though not entirely sure where each pair is located in the room. 
his own display earlier on in that skirmish between sound and leaf, must have attracted some attention, contrary to the boy's own liking. He would have much preferred being a complete mystery at this stage in the exams. It was far more advantageous. But as soon as he'd realized Eno was in possible danger, there had been no time to think. His body had reacted on its own in an effort to protect the girl. Why? Why? His own voice echoes the question in his head. Why had he reacted that way? It would have been much more like him to sit back and entertain himself by watching the two groups fight while collecting intel. That's probably what he was going to do anyway after making sure Eno was safe. He attempts to let his mind drift from the question, but it gives him no reprieve. The idea of not being fully aware or understanding of his own actions leaves a bad taste in the blonde's mouth. He frowns to himself at the notion and silently shakes his head, this time attempting more forcefully to rid himself of the thought. Eno is a teammate. Her presence is vital to the team's progression through the exams, thus protecting her was absolutely necessary. If anything had happened to her it would have been detrimental to the team's hopes of success in the exams. In the heat of the moment of that skirmish, his logic had seemed like instinct. But that's all it was, logic. Yes, that was why he had reacted so suddenly to protect her. But the Bicky. All right, the time has come for the tenth question to be given a Bicky announces, the exam participants looking in almost palpable anticipation, the Jonan smirking at this. But first, you will each be given the opportunity to decide whether or not you wish to answer this question. He continues, earning a number of raised eyebrows and confused expressions in reaction. Please note two rules in relation to this question. First. Participants who choose not to attempt the tenth question will automatically forfeit all points and be disqualified along with their teammates, and secondly, those who answer the tenth question incorrectly will also automatically forfeit all points and as well as failing the exam will be barred from ever competing in the Chunin exams again Ibiki announces. Confusion morphs into a mixture of disbelief, shock and outrage. Shouts and protests fill the venue, a number of participants rising from their seats. But Naruto. He stays seated as the room fills with outbursts and protests, sitting back and waiting for the noise to die down so he can take the tenth question. Quitting when failure isn't certain is foolish to him in any circumstance. In any event, the blonde doesn't for a split second believe the proctor's announcement. Silence. I'll fail anyone who refuses to cooperate immediately, Ibiki warns sternly, the protesting Jen and begrudgingly silencing themselves and taking their seats. Those who do not wish to take the tenth question, raise your hands. Silence fills the venue for a few moments. Murmurs are audible as some genin slowly raise their hands and more as the minutes pass. Chunin exam proctors approach the genin, requesting their team numbers and calling out to the teammates of those who forfeit to leave the venue with their squadmates. Many wipe tears from their eyes while others curse one another, looking on the verge of exchanging fists as they leave the room. Naruto watches nonchalantly, arms crossed. He doesn't expect either of his teammates to quit, but can't be certain they'll all find the answer either. He turns his head, and an eyebrow rises as he sees the hand of the girl next to him rise. But Eno, Amnit the Amanaka curses to herself. She glances down to see her own hand shaking and looks around to see other genin leaving the room. She watches on as hands rise, hearts break and friendships end. She swallows the lump in her throat and closes her eyes, almost pleading to whatever supernatural force she can. But Satsuki, Satsuki leans forward, gazing intently at the exam proctor, jaw clenched in anticipation. Her eyes dart occasionally at those that stand up and leave. With Yaoi, Yaoi's hand shakily rises, all participants remaining in the room seated, turning their heads and some gasping, recognizing the hero Kinoichi. Suddenly her hand balls into a fist and swings down, impacting her desk as she stands up. You'll have to try harder than to get me to quit, Yaoi shouts, her voice filling the silent room and earning the attention of all in it. I don't care what you threaten me with. It doesn't mean anything because I'll never quit. She yells. Bring on your question already. She yells, her hair swaying from her head in nine tendril-like bunches. Ibiki's eyebrows rise in surprise for a moment at the outburst before a small smile, accompanied by a chuckle, graces his lips. Seems the apple doesn't fall far from the tree at all he muses. Naruto glances around the room to see expressions of concern and fear shift with hope anew. He looks back up at the blonde girl, scoffing to himself. Does she insist on galvanizing the competition? A few silent moments pass once again before Jonin speaks. Very well. You all pass he utters, to the silent shock of the genin. We. Pass. Yeoi repeats in confusion, but our exams haven't even been marked. The written exams are at decoy Ibiki responds, the first round of the exams was presented as a written exam, but rather than testing knowledge, this was a test of two skills you will require in abundance as ninja. The first, your intelligence gathering skills. The first nine questions were based on ninja theory beyond the level of even Chunin, for the purpose of forcing each of you to use your skills to gather information, all the while maintaining stealth, as you will have two on active duty. 
those who were caught cheating for the maximum number of permitted offenses, prove they're not capable of achieving this to the level required to be a chunin. Ibiki explains. And the second, your resilience. This was tested by the tenth question. As shinobi you will encounter situations in which the circumstances are unfavorably weighed against you. To remain resilient in those situations, never compromising one's comrades while giving all for the mission is a quality essential to being a chunin. Those who forfeited proved they don't possess that quality. He finishes glancing at Yeoi who slowly begins to smile, finally coming to believe the scarred Jonin. That's it then. You're all to wait here until the proctor for the second Vicky isn't allowed to finish as the rumor erupts into Raka celebration, as many Gen and joyfully cheer their advancement into the next round of the exams. The first exam wasn't half bad, the blonde boy muses to himself. He is hoping for some combat in the next one though. He rolls his shoulders in anticipation. Yeoi turns her head to see Mido and Menma making their way towards her. The three gather, embracing one another and laughing. Yeoi turns her head to see him still seated, not sparing them a glance, and the smile leaves her face for a moment. It had been her desperation to make him acknowledge her and see her strength that had fueled her to stand up. A small smile forms on her face again as she gazes at him a bit longer before turning her head back to Mido and Menma. Like she said, she won't give up. Not until she's someone even he has to be proud of. Ibiki stands at the front of the raucous room, a deadpan expression on his face. All the fear he had inspired a few moments ago is suddenly gone. And worse, there are still 84 participants in the exam. Is he losing his touch? He glances among the joyous Jenin and sees three of the fourth's children, embracing one another. He sees the blonde one among the three and smirks. If there is a reason for the high number of participants who passed, it's probably her. He sees her turn her head to lay her eyes on something for a few moments while embracing her siblings. Ibiki follows her line of sight to once again see the blonde boy in black, the fourth's firstborn, sitting not too far away, arms crossed, sporting an expressionless look and paying his siblings as much attention as a stranger would. The scarred Jonin raises an eyebrow and frowns in thought as he notes, once again, the blonde's cold deep gaze. This train of thought grinds to a halt as the sound of the window shattering silences the celebratory noise, while smoke fills the front of the class. Now's no time to celebrate brats, a voice calls out from behind the curtain of smoke, which then lifts to reveal a young woman of slender frame with light brown eyes and violet hair tied in a spiky ponytail. She wears a fitted mesh bodysuit from neck to thigh and a dark orange miniskirt beneath a tan overcoat. The banner tied to two kunai flutters behind her, reading the sexy and single Anko Midarashi. You've still got me to worry about. I'm Anko Midarashi, proctor for the second round of the Chunin exam she introduces herself. Naruto watches the newcomer's entrance, listens to her introduction, reads the banner behind her, and sighs to himself. Another clown, great. She glances around the room before turning her head to Ibiki, who looks back at her, deadpan expression still in place, unimpressed by her grand entrance. Why are there so many? How many brats did you pass? She asks her colleague, eyebrow raised. 84 here responds simply, the purple-haired ninja, placing her hand to her chest in a gesture of mock shock. 84, oh my. You alright there old timer? need a seat. Maybe some water she teases, the Jonin gazing back at her with an unimpressed frown. Don't worry. I'll remind you how it's done. At best, there'll only be 20 of these brats left when I'm through with the Manko smiles deviously, turning to the Genin, some of whom stiffen in fear at her words. Right, the venue for your next exam is Training Ground 44, located nearby, straight in that direction. She says, pointing in the direction of her entrance. We're to rendezvous there at 5. Be prompter you will fail, she declares, before turning to Ibiki, smiling cheekily and disappearing in a burst of smoke. Ibiki shakes his head and leaves, saying no more. Naruto stands as the room begins to empty, turning to see Satsuki approach him, Ino not far behind. They begin to make their way toward the exit as Ino joins them. So how do you do it? Satsuki asks him, the blonde raising an eyebrow at the vague question. Do what? He responds. Your shadow clone. How do you manage to relay the information it got from Mito's paper? She elaborates, Naruto's eyebrows rising slightly in realization. A glimmer of a smirk appears on the boy's face for a second, as he recalls Itsuki activating her Sharingan earlier during the skirmish with O-Sound Ninja. She must have been aware of the clone from back then. We're through, you guys. Ino exclaims, putting an arm around both as they continue to walk. Tsutsuki smiles in acknowledgement at the Amanaka before looking back at her male teammate, awaiting an answer. Convenient that you mention it actually. It'll come in handy if the next exam is anything like what I'm expecting, he says, the two Kinoichi listening intently. Elsewhere in the village. That's pretty much it really. The bit's worth going into detail about anyway, Kakashi says laying his chopsticks to the side, a half-empty plate before him. Fugaku holds his own in hand, busy with his own meal. I do confess a bit of concern. 
Sasuke's desperation to awaken his own Sharingan may lead him to act rashly. Kakashi continues. Yugaku dangles a bit of fish between chopsticks, holding it before his mouth, speaking before swallowing it. Don't worry about Sasuke. He knows who he has to answer to if he does anything stupid Fugaku assures, Kakashi chuckling a bit in response. The two sit in silence for a few moments, Kakashi ruminating for a while, before deciding he's unable to help himself. So tell me sensei, what do you make of Naruto? Kakashi asks, Fugaku looking up from his plate at the masked ninja, chewing his food slower, a thoughtful expression on his face. The Achiha picks another mouthful of food off his plate, speaking before placing it in his mouth. Well, between you and me he says before chewing, swallowing and looking up at the masked ninja of all the shinobi I've ever laid eyes on, fought with and against. He has the most latent potential I've ever seen he says plainly, Kakashi gasping and dropping the chopsticks he's just picked up. The masked ninja gazes at the Achiha who continues eating, eyes wide. He waits for a moment for his mentor to say he's joking and then remembers that the man in front of him, unlike his other teacher, doesn't have a taste for humor. Hey are you sure about what you've just said sensei? Kakashi utters, his tone shifting into a more serious one. You'll see it for yourself, the Achiha clan head says simply, divulging no more, well aware the younger Jonin is fishing. What exactly Naruto did to earn Kakashi's attention is what he'd like to know. Training Ground 44, I see Satsuki say, as the members of Team 12 stand together, all the genin who passed the first exam, present in their numbers. Sharing memories and sensations she speaks slowly. Is that the secret? Is that how you're so strong? Sasuke questions the blonde with a hint of realization to her voice, Ino leaning in to hear his answer as well. Naruto's face remains blank, betraying nothing. No, he responds. The Shadow Clone is an extremely valuable asset. But it's strictly for combat situations or potential combat situations. Abusing it would be counterintuitive. He says simply. Satsuki eyes him up for a moment, catching no sign that he might be lying. That's the troublesome part about his often expressionless demeanor, though she has gotten better at reading him, it is still difficult. It's forbidden and for a reason Naruto continues, knowing well what's going through his teammate's mind. With those eyes of hers, she probably already knows how to perform it and potentially some of his other techniques. That's the downside of teaming up with Sharingan wielders. The amount of chakra it requires is considerable. Even for Jonin level ninja. It can't be used by just any shinobi, especially not casually. There are countless cases of shinobi dying of chakra exhaustion due to using it, he says, his teammates gasping in shock. The reason I'm able to use it more liberally is because my chakra reserves are slightly abnormal, he says, his two teammates sweat dropping at his attempt to be discreet. Slightly abnormal. Seriously? Satsuki muses, an eyebrow twitching. Slightly abnormal, isn't that an understatement? Gosh, does he always have to try to be so mysterious? Ino inwardly responds, mirroring Satsuki with her own eyebrow twitch. With Anko, excuse me Miss Proctor, I think you misplaced this, a voice says in Anko's ear. It sends shivers down her spine somehow. She curses at herself for nearly gasping. She turns her head away from the brat in front of her to be met with the sight of an abnormally long tongue wrapped around a kunai. The tongue belongs to another genin, it would appear. Anko curses once more. How the fuck did a genin manage to sneak up on her? Thanks, she says, a smile in place while taking back the kunai. Don't ever sneak up on me again. I won't be so kind next time she utters in a sickly sweet tone that doesn't seem to intimidate the genin at all, who simply smiles back an eerie smile of her own and walks away. Anko turns back to the loud mouth brat to see him standing there, glancing at the departing grass ninja, along with his teammates. Now where was I? She says, earning his attention, causing him to step back. Quit it lady. Focus on your job and start the exam already Menma huffs, crossing his arms. Anko glances up at the sky to view the position of the sun, noting the brat has a point. As much as she'd love to teach him some manners it's time to get started. I'll see you later brat. You're dreaming if you think I'm finished with you she warns, pointing the kunai at him. The boy responds by sticking out his tongue, Anko frowning before disappearing in a burst of smoke. What a crazy chick. Am I right, guys? Menma says while shaking his head. He turns to be met with a pair of fists impacting his skull. First you try to start a fight with all the other genin. Now you're trying to start a fight with the proctor what's next? Quit being a clown. Nido reprimands, while Menma nurses the two sizable bumps left by his sisters on his head, a deadpan expression etched across his face. Of all the people to be put on a three-man squad with, of Team Eleven, history can barely keep the smirk of his face as the sight of the famed forest of death stands before him. This is gonna be good he says inwardly, practically giddy with excitement. Looks like the next exam is gonna be combat-based Sasuke says, the two boys glancing at each other, Hisateru smirking, while Sasuke's face remains in its usual blank expression, though with an excited glint to his eyes. Well as long as they're not fighting each other Kaori says to herself. 
The two are bickering a lot less, even if they still do at times butt heads. She admires how despite this, they can be formidable when tagging together. Be sure to keep an eye out for those sound ninja from earlier Sasuke warns, glancing at both his teammates, each nodding in response. Of team guy. I'm absolutely certain of what my Byakugan showed me. Niji assured me, arms crossed, gazing at the ground in deep thought. Most youthful. I simply have to face him now. Lee exclaims, bowling a fist, a smile of childish excitement lighting up his face. No way Lee. Are you crazy did you see how fast he moved back before the first exam? Tenton reprimands, turning her head to spot the blonde rookie in question, in the crowd, conversing with his teammates. Even if you can match or even best his speed, we have no idea what else he's capable of. The Kinoichi warns in a harsh whisper. Yes, we do not. But a good way of finding out is to fight him. Th Lee counters only to be interrupted. No. Niji says firmly, lifting his head to lock eyes with his male teammate. We'll try to find out more about him later if we can, but for now, we're to avoid him and his team at all costs. The Achiha and her are one thing, but Niji continues, turning his head to look from afar, into those cold deep cerulean eyes, that could be one of the most dangerous people here. But Anko, Anko emits a shrill whistle that captures the collective attention of all genin gathered before the training ground. It echoes throughout the forest behind the fence, sending birds flying. Right, welcome, all of you, to the venue for the second round of the Chunin exams, Training Ground 44, also known as the Forest of Death. The blonde's hair blends with the tanned grass as he raises his head ever so slightly, laying his cerulean eyes on the object of his attention as it calmly sips from a clear stream. The kunai flies through the air, the boy pushing himself off the grassy ground, releasing the ninja tool, sending it flying towards the antelope. The projectile glides a millimeter under the animal's outstretched neck, embedding itself in the opposite river bank. The animal immediately springs away, splashing water as it springs across the stream to escape its unknown predator. The boy attempts to give chase, but can only take a single step before a kunai sails past his head, over the stream and into the rear of the antelope's head, emerging on the other side to embed itself somewhere amongst the grass, the beast dropping to the ground in a silent heap. The boy turns in a huff to glare daggers at his sensei as he lowers the outstretched hand from which the kunai had flown. Hey. That was my hunt. I had him. He yells angrily, the smile on the man's face as he walks towards Jim only serving to anger him further. I'm sure you did. How long have you been chasing him again? He asks playfully, the boy's cheeks turning red in embarrassment, not answering the man's question. The man's smile spreads further across his face as he ruffles the blonde's hair playfully. You'll get one soon, don't worry he assures you, and since he's your prey, you can carry him back up the mountain. History says turning and walking away. Lousy snowhead the boy insults, turning away in a huff and walking towards the deceased animal, the man chuckling in response at the familiar insults. He turns his head and watches as the boy walks towards the downed antelope. He'll bag his own pretty soon. His rate of progression is astonishing. He brings his hand up to his mouth, heaving a few coughs. He looks down at the hand to see his palm smeared in red. He quickly bends over wiping the blood onto the dirt, glancing over at the boy, whose back is still turned to him, standing over the antelope. The pain in his chest is slowly reaching unfamiliar levels. Can't be too long now. Flashback ends. The deer drops to the ground as the kunai buries itself in the beast's neck, killing it instantly. A figure dressed in black emerges from the shadows from which the projectile came, walking towards the silent creature slowly. The wind blows, pulling back the hood over the figure's head to reveal a head of blonde hair. The rays of the sun cut through the thick canopy above to shine on the figure as he comes to a stop before the silent animal. Flashback, this is the venue for the second round of the Chunin exams, Training Ground 44, also known as the Forest of Death Anko announces, watching on with a gleeful smirk as the cadets stand in silent apprehension. For the second exam you will be required to fight for survival in the forest for a period of five days while attempting to reach the tower in the center. Additionally each team will be given one of a set of two scrolls, marked Heaven and Earth, and will have to acquire the other to qualify for the next round, by any means necessary, as well as reaching the tower with both scrolls, unopened, with all three members of their squad present and accounted for. Failure to meet all of these conditions will mean failure of the exam she finishes. Flashback end, the deer rests atop his shoulders as Naruto makes his way back to the location of his teammates. His expressionless face contorts into a frown as he detects three unfamiliar chakra signatures approaching the same location. He curses inwardly. There's no way he'll make it back in time. Especially since he has to deal with the three who have been watching him first. Come out and let's get it over with, he says nonchalantly. Three shinobi bearing hidden stone headbands immediately appear encircling him. All three are male. Yup, no mistake. That's him, one says with a smirk on his face. Imagine our luck guys. 
forget Chunin, Lord Suchikage will have us promoted to Jonin when he hears about this, another says as the three slowly walk around him, encircling him as though he is their prey, to the blonde silent amusement. So you're the Yellow Flash's firstborn, huh? The first to speak questions. Naruto simply stares back at him. He asked you a question, kid. Talk. A third demands. The kid scared. Lost your tongue, Brad. Another laughs, the other two chuckling in response. If it'll get you to shut up, my father died a long time ago, he responds plainly, dropping his prey from his shoulders. Lying won't save you. We know exactly who you are. Fate's put you right into our hands. Try not to make too much of a mess, guys. We still have to take his head and check his body for a scroll after the stone genin says as the three begin to enclose on him, the blonde's demeanor still nonchalant. But Satsuki and Ino, it's just scary sometimes, Yamanaka says, moving her head to the side, away from the fire that she and her teammate sit on either side of, beneath a darkening sky. Realizing how far ahead you guys are of me she continues in a somber tone, I can't always gonna be the one holding you back her face shifting into a frown. But Chiha responds you're not she stops speaking as the Yamanaka jumps to her feet with a kunai drawn, the two genin turning their heads to see their third teammate emerge from the shadows of the trees, Satsuki all the while remaining seated. Sorry guys I couldn't find anything the blonde doesn't finish his sentence as a fist connects firmly with his face sending him back. He falls back looking up, shocked to see the female genin who had been sitting a split second earlier standing with the fist that had just met him, outstretched. What the hell are you doing? He demands, clutching at his face. Naruto would never allow me to land a punch on him that easily Satsuki utters plainly. He definitely wouldn't go hunting and come back empty handed either, she says. He looks to the other genin who approaches as well, kunai in hand. He smirks in response. Well it was worth a shot. The hard way it is then he speaks, his voice changing completely. A sound akin to a small explosion accompanied by a cloud of smoke is heard. The smoke lifts to reveal three hidden rain shinobi standing side by side. Let's have a look at that scroll shall we? The hidden rain shinobi in the middle says. Satsuki smirks in response, knowing full well that Naruto has the team scroll with him. Come and take it, she dares. The three hidden rain ninja run towards the two, unleashing a flurry of shuriken. The two leaf genin strike the projectiles away with their kunai, running to meet the enemy halfway. Satsuki effortlessly ducks underneath a kunai slash to send a fist into the shinobi's stomach, sending him into his teammate behind him. The two landed in a pile before melting into water. Meanwhile Ino's kunai meets with that of the third rain ninja, sending sparks flying. A solid kick to the knee that buckles it earns a loud cry from him. She slashes her kunai across his chest, the male dissolving into water immediately as well. All clones, huh? Ino muses to herself out loud. Aiki curses to himself, watching from the treetops above as his clones are dispatched in seconds. Damn it. These little bitches can actually fight, huh? A voice cuts through his thoughts, his eyes widening in shock. You know for someone of your level to have the nerve to attack us alone. It's insulting. He turns to be met with a pair of crimson eyes, the left with a single tomo above the pupil, and the right with two tomo on either side of the pupil. He can only watch as two quick right hands meet his face, sending him flying from the trees to a vicious landing below that breaks some of his bones. He lays in an unconscious heap as Satsuki jumps from the tree to land in an upright position above him, Ino walking to stand before her, above him. He can't have been alone surely Yamanaka says, her eyes darting around. Satsuki looks down at him, an offended frown still in place. I'd like to think no the Ichiha sends a kunai flying past Ino's face, over the now doused fire, put out by the Yamanaka to prevent attracting further attention, towards another emerging shadow. The figure flips out a kunai and effortlessly parries the projectile away, despite the large animal atop his shoulders. Yup, that's Naruto she says to herself as Ino turns to see their male teammate yet again walking towards them, a large deer atop his shoulders. Stop right there she commands, pointing her kunai at him. The blonde complies, looking as nonchalant as she would expect. It's him, Ino Satsuki assures. Let him give the code first, she insists. Naruto drops the dead animal from his shoulders and reaches into his pockets, Ino slightly stiffening in apprehension whilst Satsuki remains relaxed. He produces two scrolls in each hand, both marked heaven. The great team is born from members who give everything for each other, instead of for themselves he quotes, Ino lowering her kunai as he approaches, a smile forming on her face. He comes to stand above the unconscious rain shinobi, the three now surrounding him. I see you had no trouble dealing with this one. I happened to run into his teammates on the way back. Actually he informed me, the two rolling their eyes at his way of putting it. Neither of them had the scroll, which means it's on him. Sastuki searches for the ninja, pulling a scroll from his bodysuit marked Earth. We actually got both on the first day. Ino says to herself gleefully. Satsuki glances at the boy's hands again. Where did you get that second heaven scroll? Satsuki questions. I ran into some other candidates while I was hunting. I managed to snag it from them. 
He responds, his teammate sweat dropping again. Ugh, there it is Mr. Mysterious. There's no mistake. It's definitely him Ino says inwardly. That's the real Naruto alright Satsuki says to herself with a similar deadpan expression in place. But if our scroll is a heaven scroll and we already have the earth to accompany it, what's the point in having that? Ino questions. Narrowing the competition Naruto responds plainly, turning and walking away. If we can ensure one less team is able to advance, that'll immediately increase our own chances in the next round, he responds. He'd killed all three of those stone genin, as well as the two hidden rain ninja that had been in the vicinity and were teammates to the unconscious one. This location's been compromised. Let's find somewhere else to camp for the night he says as he grabs the dead animal once again, placing it atop his shoulders with ease. His teammates comply as the three jump into the canopy above and leap away, leaving the unconscious and injured rain ninja alone. Tsutsuki douses the breakfast fire as the members of Team 12 prepare to begin moving once again. Hey, why didn't you wake us up last night? Ichiha questions her blonde male teammate as he stretches himself. The trio had obviously agreed to take shifts to keep guard over the camp. Naruto had taken the first shift and what clearly ended up being the only shift. I forgot. In any case I couldn't sleep anyway he responds, plainly lying as Ino approaches to join the two. That's not going to cut it she says frowning, you can't do everything by yourself. If one of us is exhausted, it puts us all at risk. The blonde resists the urge to roll his eyes. He expects her to know by now that his body is not the same as theirs. Well then thankfully I'm not exhausted he says turning and walking away, Sasuke gritting her teeth in frustration, Ino watching on in concern seeing the Ichiha's expression. Besides the night went by peacefully he says, flashback, the hand goes over the hidden grass Jenin's mouth, his eyes conveying his emotions of horror, as he is pinned back against a tree, his teammates only a few feet away, and laying dead alongside one another. A pair of ice-cold cerulean blue eyes cutting through the darkness to meet him. Hand me the scroll the owner of the eyes orders. The boy complied quickly, pulling it out and handing it over. They'd been taken down by one guy. He didn't even try to call for backup from his sleeping teammates. He wishes they'd never attack this group. A decision he'll regret for the rest of his life, assuming that's long. His pleas for said life are muffled as a firm chop to the neck knocks him unconscious. Flashback end, another earth scroll recovered, another team that won't be advancing, the blonde muses to himself. But team 11, Hayori watches on in horror as Sasuke writhes in agony, clutching at his neck, a black pattern of three tomo having appeared where the freak of a grass ninja had just bitten him. Her own body is bruised and bloodied. She looks back at the devil-like female, the upper left side of her face burnt away by Sasuke's fire style, to reveal a pale layer of skin beneath, a golden eye with a purple pigmentation around its contour. She knows that I. I'll be taking this child with me. Her gifts will be of great service to me the strange man in Jounin attire says as a white snake wraps itself around Kaori's helpless sister, whilst her parents grip her, holding her back, tears flowing from all three. Durin. Tears sting the Kinoichi's eyes. She thought about this moment for that it's here, here she stands helpless. No. Not again. I won't be powerless again. The girl emits a loud cry, the grass shinobi raising an eyebrow, before his eyes widen, as a series of rose-colored crystal shards fly towards him, embedding themselves across his chest and stomach. Hayori watches on in shock, looking down at her own outstretched hands from which the crystals had seemingly materialized. The grass ninja stumbles back in shock before his body suddenly shifts to a brown hue, melting into mud. So it would seem you're not too different from your sister after all. How delectably interesting that vile voice cuts into her ear once again. She tries to whip herself around, but a firm hand to the neck that causes her knees to buckle stops her as she drops against the tree branch she was standing on, unconscious. The grass shinobi stands over her for a few seconds before casting his glance over to the unconscious Achiha only a few feet away, the sight of the tomo pattern on his neck, bringing a smile to his face. The smile remains as he seemingly melts into the wood of the tree branch, leaving the incapacitated Jen in there. But Hisateru. Hisateru stands before the two snake summons that had attacked and separated him from Kaori and Sasuke, both of them laying dead before him. A look of deadly rage mars his face. There are only two people in this world who can summon snakes. This had better be the doing of that damned exam proctor. It has to be, because if it isn't. Only one way to find out he says inwardly as he disappears in a flash of black smoke. With Team 12, Naruto's eyes narrow as his team leaps through the trees, heading for the tower in the center of the forest. Something doesn't feel right. He just hopes his instincts are wrong for once. How common is that though? With Anko, Anko's body refuses to comply with her will as she remains on her hands and knees, desperately trying to force herself up. His chuckle mocks her, adding salt to the wound of her throbbing neck. She shivers as she feels his hand, ice cold to the touch, to her chin, lifting her face to meet those golden eyes. Are you jealous? He questions mockingly. She smirks wryly in response. No, just amused. 
You and I both know that when Lord Forth finds out you set foot back in the village, you're a dead man. The man's face turns blank, Anko silently chuckling at herself, relishing whatever small victory she can have now. Perhaps. Or perhaps not. Itty is unable to finish his sentence as his head turns to see a cloud of black smoke. From it emerges a boy bearing a leaf headband which holds back a shock of brown spiky hair. He is dressed in a black tracksuit. Hey. Get the hell out of here you brat. Go. Anko yells in horror at the foolish Jenin who's unsuspectingly walked in on the scene. The boy stares back at her nonchalantly, not an ounce of fear in his eyes, clearly having no idea just who he is standing in front of. Anko's body suddenly goes limp as a chop to the neck from the pale man sends her forward into an unconscious heap. He turns to face the new arrival with a smile on his face. Well look who it is. He says smirking Danzo's boy in the flesh. You've grown he must be chuckling. History takes a few steps forward to stand closer to the pale man. Snake. He responds plainly just what are you doing back in the village? Did someone tell you the Hokage is dead or are you just suicidal nowadays? He jibes sarcastically, a smirk of his own gracing his lips as the pale man's smirk leaves his once again. Don't answer that actually. I don't actually care if the boy continues raising his hand. I'm just here to let you know that if you come anywhere near my team again, you won't have to worry about the fourth cause I'll kill you myself, the brown-haired boy says, his expression turning serious once again, his voice unwavering, showing genuine belief in his own words. The dark chuckle comes from the pale man, is that so? If you only ever hear the truth once in your life, then that's it he assures. How sweet. The spy cares for his teammates. Do your new little friends know who you really are? The man questions, walking forwards. History remains still, his body completely relaxed, not revealing a shred of fear. The man comes to stand in front of the boy, crouching slightly so that they are face to face, golden eyes meeting brown. The fact that you were even able to track me down he muses. Anko had only been able to do so because of the curse mark. Not a single shred of fear too. You're the real thing boy. A true shinobi killer, aren't you? Made in your master's image. He says, the boy giving no response. You and dear Sasuke will form quite the formidable partnership. Then of course there's that other little one in her he continues. Hisatera's eyes narrow at the man's words, filing the thought away in his mind for later. He turns and walks away, leaving the pale man to continue whatever he was doing with the exam proctor. You've been warned he says simply as a cloud of black smoke surrounds him. He pulls a black object out of his jacket as he leaves the scene. A black mask bearing the design of a human skull. Time to send a message. A few rays of sunshine pierce through the treetops to shine down on the pale man as the last bits of black smoke lift to reveal the boy is gone. He turns to take one last look at the unconscious Anko before turning away. He walks towards the trunk of the tree branch he stands on, seemingly melting into it, sinking away into the depths of the forest for his next prey. With Team Eleven, the female sound shinobi hurriedly grabs both her injured teammates fleeing the scene quickly before it's too late, leaving the large group of leaf ninja. Kaori continues to hold on to Sasuke, the dark chakra that had ensnared him and possessed him now seemingly having receded. Sasuke. Sasuke. Are you okay? Look at me. She pleads with concern. The Ichiha attempts to force himself up, the Kanoichi trying to keep him down, the other leaf genin watching on. No, damn it. You're still injured stupid. She berates. That doesn't matter. He snaps back lifting his head, the female genin only seeing genuine fear in his eyes for the second time now. We have to find Team 12. We have to find my sister now, Kaori. Sasuke shouts, desperation etched across his face. With Team 12. Naruto, Sasuke and Ino continue barreling through the forest towards their destination, leaping from tree branch to tree branch. Suddenly Naruto's eyes widen, the boy whipping out two kunai, just as a devastating gust of wind collides with them out of nowhere. Naruto, having faced wind style far far more devastating in comparison, withstands its force, directing his chakra to his feet and attaching himself to a tree branch. His teammates however are caught off guard and unprepared, blown away completely by the wind and separated from him. The blonde looks up to see two gargantuan snakes rise from the forest below, to tower above him. They both spring towards him, his kunai in hand. Naruto backflips away as one of the gigantic serpent smashes through the tree branch he was just standing on. The other lunges for him, its mouth open. He weaves a single sign, a clone appearing in front of him. The blonde places his feet on its back, using it to jump and force himself away from the creature as it swallows the clone whole. Just as he lands, a release hand sign in place, the creature is reduced to smithereens flying in every direction as an enormous explosion comes from within it, leaving it in pieces. The other hisses in pain and confusion, writhing as the force of the blast burns the left side of its head, leaving it blind in one eye. 
Naruto emerges from the small pillar of smoke that is formed, somersaulting in mid-air above the creature that is unable to react as he swings his arms down, releasing two demon windmill shuriken that embed themselves on either side of its head, sending it down to the forest floor where it meets with the ground in a dead sheep, before seemingly disappearing into thin air under a cloud of smoke that quickly disperses. The boy lands on yet another tree branch taking a moment to survey the scene. Snake summons. He wants to believe the loud exam proctor is responsible for this, but she isn't allowed to interfere in the exam surly and thus wouldn't have attacked them with that wind style. There's only one other person he's ever heard of who possesses a snake summoning contract. He just hopes his suspicions are wrong and that some genin had somehow managed to get their hands on it. He stares off into the depths of the forest from which the gust of wind came and then turns his head in the direction his teammates were blown in, a dark frown on his face, slightly shadowing his cold blue eyes. But Satsuki and Ino. The two genin tremble and shake like leaves in the wind before the sheer presence of the pale man before them. His tongue leaves his mouth for a moment, extending to inhumane lengths as he licks his lips in a fashion eerily similar to that of the humongous serpent whose head he stands atop. I suppose since dear Sasuke burned my cover away, there's no point in trying to play pretend anymore the man muses to himself, the grass headband still wrapped around his head as he steps off of the creature's head onto a tree branch. Well this is rather disappointing, he says, speaking again, sighing to himself in an almost playful manner, brushing the side of the snake's head, the serpent rising in response and moving towards the paralyzed genin. I'll have you know that your brother put up a much better fight than this dear Satsuki the two genin finally emitting a sound, both gasping in response. Suddenly as the snake closes in on them, a huge fireball seemingly materializes from nowhere, colliding head-on with the snake's head. It hisses in agony as it falls to the forest floor below, Satsuki having thrown her head back and released the projectile of flames from her mouth. Ino turns her head in shock to see her teammate standing next to her, the look of fear that had been on her face a moment ago, now completely gone and replaced by one of dark rage, her sharingan glowing in both eyes. The pale man smiles with dark glee as he bears witness to the sight. Ooh. It seems she awakened hers before him. Interesting. Without any hand signs as well. Yes, that's what I came to see. What did you just say about my brother? The Ichiha questions, staring straight into those golden colored eyes. Dear Sasuke proved quite a decent challenge, all things considered. I'm intrigued to see how you compare to him. The man responds as the Ichiha begins to walk towards him. You dare touch my brother, she says in a low voice, her eyes hidden in shadow for a moment. He's quite the young shinobi. Well it will be quite agonizing, I'm confident he'll survive his injuries. Now of course we have to see how fair the man continues, chuckling darkly to himself. You touched my brother she speaks again, her head rising to reveal her left eye bearing two tomo, instead of the one it bore before, both eyes now having two tomo, the man inwardly chuckling with dark glee at the sight. If you touched my brother then this damned exam can wait until you're dead. She declares coldly, the pale man continuing to smirk. The smirk disappears as the girl shifts into an apparition before him, the man twisting to stop a kunai aimed for his back with a single hand. An impressive child. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, indeed he says, gripping her wrist in one hand, looking into the young Kinoichi's eyes to see that indeed every shred of fear has melted from her eyes, rage burning in the red of her sharingan as she glares darkly at him. The male ducks under a kunai slash, sending the girl back with a punch to the gut. She lunges back at him straight away, throwing the kunai at his face. He tilts his head to the side dodging it before blocking a punch to the face. Ino watches on as Hitsuki, seemingly out of nowhere, shrugs off the palpable fear that had gripped the both of them to face this man head on. The kunai Hitsuki throws itself into the wood right next to her foot as the two exchange a flurry of attacks, engaging one another into jutsu. Damn it, here you are again, frozen like a frightened rabbit she scolds herself, forcing herself to pick the kunai up. She raises it, piercing the flesh of her own thigh. Move damn it. She reprimands herself running towards the two as they move about at speeds above her own. The man pushes Hitsuki back with a kick. Her more matured eyes are allowing her to read my movements better than Sasuke. How fun. He turns to smack away the wrist that holds Ino's kunai with ease before punching her square in the face. The Yamanaka grabs the man's arm, effectively shrugging the punch off to his silent surprise and amusement, pulling him towards her while crouched low to aim a fist at his stomach. He grabs it, elbowing her in the back of the neck and sending her down onto the ground. He turns to be met with the side of the fireball, barreling towards him as he feels wire binding his ankles together. Ino grits her teeth as the heat of the fireball grazes her back, sending the enemy over her as he wails in agony. He collides with a tree in the other direction in a ball of flames. Ino jumps to her feet just as Hitsuki whips around to barely block a punch aimed at her face, but just as she prepares to punch back. The pale man reels in shock as a vicious kick meets the side of his face and sends him flying. A real kick that actually hurt. He catches a glimpse of blonde hair as he is sent flying. Shit. It can't be. 
Tatsuki stands dazed for a moment as Naruto stands before her, leg outstretched. She turns her head to see the pale man collide with another tree, before using his chakra to stand upright against it, all the while weaving a series of hand signs. She tenses while Naruto remains relaxed, recognizing their type only for the man to stop halfway through. The man weaves through the signs, preparing his escape only to look up and realize he's mistaken for his attacker. He smirks as he sees the almost spitting image of a young Minato, standing before him, save for a few differences. These include the completely dark clothing the newcomer bears, the whisker marks on either side of his face, his dark colored eyebrows, and one of if not the coldest pair of eyes he's ever seen. The male shinobi smirks as he jumps from one tree branch to another to stand in an upright position, the two kanoichi tensing whilst the boy remains still. Well, well, one of Minato's litter, huh? You actually hit me. The old saying is proving to be true indeed he speaks smirking as he recognizes the boy. It's that boy. The one who. Who knows why Lord Forth keeps him around, don't worry about him. He has no place here. Surely he's bound to be banished sooner or later. The man's tongue leaves his mouth again, dangling from it as his golden eyes narrow on the boy in black. His chakra. It's making my neck hairs stand on end. What's this? The ninja muses looking down at his hand to see it trembling, chuckling to himself as he looks back at the boy, who stares back at him coldly, not showing a shred of fear. But chakra you have there boy. Dare I say it doesn't feel human, he says, his teammate's eyes darting slightly at the comment. I came for one prize, but why not take a good look at another he muses. Listen to Naruto to see his teammates, his eyes still glued to the enemy. I can buy some time, but the both of you need to get out of here now he says, Satsuki scoffing in derision. There you go again, mister arrive and save the damsels in distress. I'm not going anywhere. This bastard said he hurt my brother. I've got nowhere to be until he's dead. To hell with this exam. The Achiha responds, keeping her own eyes glued to the pale ninja. Well there's no way I'm running away while the two of you stay here. Forget it, Yamanaka adds. Naruto's frown of concentration deepens for a moment. Listen. I said I'd only buy time, didn't I? Three on one or one on one, this isn't a fight we're going to win. He used snake summons to attack us, Naruto says, glancing down at the forest floor to another snake summon, still slowly burning away, at this point mostly ash. That contract once belonged to the leaf, and only one shinobi in recent history possessed it, he speaks looking ahead as the pale man smirks again hearing him speak. One of the three legendary Sanin, one who betrayed and left the leaf. Naruto reveals as his teammates gasp in shock. Orochimaru, but Sasuke and Kaori, you're sure he's after Satsuki. Kaori questions the Ichiha showing slight irritation at her question. I'm certain and I'm going after him, he says, Kaori looking deep into his eyes, seeing the stone-hard certainty in them. Well then I guess I'm coming with you she says to the Ichiha's surprise, grabbing him by the arm and helping him up. You'll have to toughen up and forget about those injuries for a moment, she says in a playful yet serious tone. The members of Team Guy and Team 8 who stand around listening to the conversation look to one another. Chikamaru Choji speaks up for Satsuki in our graduating class. If someone wants to hurt her, we have to do something he says. Nara sighs in exasperation. What a drag this is. Their involvement in whatever this is will effectively mean shelving and potentially failing the exam. But they can't just do nothing either. Niji. Lee speaks up, eyes burning with determination, our devastatingly gorgeous Achiha comrade is in danger. We must intervene. He adds. No Niji says plainly, earning shock gasps from the group, except for Sasuke whatever this is, we can't allow ourselves to get dragged into it. We have a mission to complete and that's the exam he says simply, turning and walking away. You would allow harm to come to a comrade knowing it can be prevented, Lee shouts in disbelief and anger. As long as the exam is underway, she's competition. If she's in danger that's her teammate's problem he says, Lee balling his fists as he sees Tenten following behind the Hyuga. I don't care if all of you help or none of you do, Sasuke says plainly, I will protect my sister. This stupid exam can go to hell for Ali the first care, he says as his eyes flash a crimson red color, the mark on his neck glowing for a moment, Kaori shivering at the sight. He turns to the Kanoichi. I know where he is. He says to her touching the mark on his neck once again I can feel him. Hopefully we can find him before he gets to her. And kill him. Sasuke utters coldly, Kaori noting the change in his onyx eyes. He turns and leaps away, his teammate following, the members of teammate doing the same. Lee, let's go. Niji orders turning to see the boy in green staring at him defiantly. I'm sorry Niji, but the life of a comrade is in danger. Duty calls he defies, turning and walking away. Lee. Stop messing around. Niji scolds, getting angry. You won't pass without all three of us present in any case. Once I'm done saving Satsuki, I'll be right back. If you're not coming you can wait for me here he says simply, smiling his trademark smile before leaping away, following the departed group, leaving a torn looking Tenten and a seething Niji. You damned fool. 
the Hyuga shouts, begrudgingly following after the group, Tintin right behind him, with Kin, Dosu and Zaku. Kin leaps from one tree branch to the next Dosu and Zaku in either arm. She just wants to make sure that they get far away enough before stopping, Zaku all the while groaning at the pain in his arms. Damn it, just what the hell was that? Dosu speaks. Kin curses to herself. She won't admit out loud, but they were lucky to escape with their lives. Now they have to tell Lord Orochimaru they failed. Her train of thought comes to a grinding halt as a kunai embeds itself in a tree branch ahead of her. She quickly spots the explosive tag tied to it and tries to evade it. Wood splinters and flame fly in every direction as the force of the blast sends her and her teammates flying down to the forest floor, greeted by a harsh landing, Zaku yelling in pain as the injuries to his arms are re-aggravated. Kin quickly gets to her feet, her teammates struggling up, Dosu faring better than Zaku. She watches as a tendril of fire appears out of nowhere, creeping along the ground, forming a large ring of fire around them, climbing up some of the trees to form a tall well of flames. She clutches her kunai in her hand, Dosu doing the same, Zaku still nursing his arms. A silhouette becomes visible in the ring of flames walking towards the group, two standing ready, whilst the third finally gets to his feet. The figure walks through the flames to reveal itself. It appears to be a male dressed in black anbu gear. A black mask carved in the shape of a human skull conceals his face, a head of brown spiky hair atop his head. He appears to be around the same age as them. You picked the wrong team, little boy. I'm in a bad mood, Zaku growls at the newcomer. The newcomer doesn't respond, continuing to walk towards the three, unsheathing a tanto. The three sound ninja need no further invitation, running towards the newcomer all at once. Dosu swings a punch at the male's face which he evades effortlessly, his tanto clashing with the boy's kunai. Dosu's smirk from beneath his own mask disappears, replaced by a surprised expression. My melodic arm. What? His train of thought can't continue as a fist to the face sends him back. The buto hunches over clutching at his ears, wincing and coughing as the glass of his rimmed spectacles shatters. The masked attacker proceeds to sidestep a kunai slash from Kin, sending a quick right hand into her face, before sending her flying with a firm kick to the gut. Dosu glances at his male teammate and needs no warning as he jumps out of the way, Zaku raising his arm and emitting a loud cry, forcing himself to endure the pain as a jet of compressed air leaves his hand, barreling towards the attacker. The masked male simply cartwheels out of the way of the attack as it smashes into the ground. Zaku continues blasting the attacker who continues to easily evade before stepping back behind the curtain of flames. The eyes of the sound ninja dart around as they become aware of a series of tall shadows darting about in the trees above the circle of flames. This bastard is toying with us Dosu notes with rage. Perceptive of you a voice responds. He whips around to see what he thought to be his own shadow, actually the masked ninja, pounce on him, burying the tanto in his chest before he's able to react. Dosu? The sound shinobi's teammates cry in horrified unison. Zaku's horror shifts to rage as he raises both his arms, shooting twin jets of compressed air at the attacker. The masked male simply pulls his tanto from the still stunned Dosu before tossing him towards the incoming attack. The result is an explosion that reduces the sound shinobi to pieces, both his teammates crying out in horror. Zaku emits a bloodlusted cry attempting to attack again. He clutches at his arms as they reject his attempt. He groans and attempts to yell in pain, but is robbed of his voice as his head rolls from his shoulders, the tanto separating it from his body. Kin watches on in horror as both her teammates die right in front of her, a matter of seconds apart. The masked attacker turns and begins to calmly walk towards her. She weaves through a series of hand signs, her form seemingly multiplying upon the last hand sign. The male stops in his tracks for a moment as suddenly over 40 identical versions of the girl stand before him. He stands still for a few seconds before bursting forward with pace, weaving through the copies. Kin can only look horrified as before she can react, the tanto is buried in her own chest, the masked attacker standing before her calmly. H. How? She questions in horror, a small trail of blood leaking from her mouth. A hopeless tactic. Deception might be a mere tool for you, but it's my religion he responds, speaking only for the second time. He pulls the tanto from her body, watching as the girl falls to the ground in a silent heap. He turns his head, pulling an earplug from it, surveying the scene for a moment before grabbing the sound Kinoichi's body and dragging her towards the other one and what's left of the third. With Team 12, are you absolutely certain of that? Satsuki questions, her death stare still in place. He's clearly not a genin. Naruto responds staring ahead at the man as well who begins to chuckle once again. The fact that the ninja was able to mask his presence from Naruto's sensory input is indication enough of his level for the boy. Now that he feels it up close as well, his chakra is undoubtedly cage level. So you were able to deduce my identity. And it didn't take you any time at all dealing with my two other friends. You're becoming more and more intriguing by the second boy. I'm interested to see just how similar you are to your father, he says, the blonde's frown deepening for a moment. 
If you guys aren't leaving I'm not either Ino reaffirms. Naruto glances at her and then at Satsuki who still hasn't moved, gritting his teeth. Damn it. These two. His train of thought halts as he sees the rogue shinobi walking towards them slowly, giving him his cue to spring. He sprints towards the male, producing two kunai, the kunoichi following behind him. Arachimaru produces his own single kunai, the weapons clashing in a flurry of sparks. He sidesteps a kunai slash from the Achiha and another from the Yamanaka, sending her flying with a kick. The boy continues to drive at him, aiming a kunai for his throat. He parries this away, opening his mouth. A snake springs from it to wrap around the leg of an incoming Satsuki swinging and tossing her into the air. She weaves through a series of hand signs as she twists in midair. Fire style. Fireball Jutsu the Ichiha's signature technique emerges from her mouth, falling from above towards the two male shinobi as they engage one another in a clash. Naruto grabs the wrist of the man to stop a kunai thrust towards his chest, the rogue ninja raising an eyebrow in slight amusement at the boy's impressive strength. Naruto maintains his grip, not letting go as Orochimaru's eyes widen slightly as he hears another name called out. Wind style. Wind orb an identical version of the boy calls out from not far away, releasing a volley of wind style orb shaped projectiles. But the fireball from above and wind style projectiles collide with the snake like ninja and the clone simultaneously, creating a brilliant eruption of blue flame, just as Naruto weaves a single handed sign. Clone explosion jutsu the explosion exponentiates as the blue mixes with the white color of the clone exploding, Satsuki landing next to Naruto as the three members of Team 12 jump back from the combustion, watching on in slight awe of the sight. Satsuki smirks slightly, turning her head to Naruto. Suddenly her eyes widen as they warn her, whipping around to stop an attack. Her body is not fast enough however to prevent it, a chop to the neck buckling her knees and sending her onto the floor. Ino turns to gasp in shock, seeing a clone of Naruto stand over an unconscious Atsuki. She turns to lock eyes with him, and as she does he pounces towards her, her body nowhere near fast enough to react, swiftly swinging a stiff hand to the neck that leaves in an unconscious heap on the floor as well. The clone grabs one Kanoichi then the other, tossing them both over his shoulders and turning and springing away without a word. As expected, the rogue shinobi emerges from the shadows of the canopy above, seemingly unscathed, to block his path. He is only able to do so momentarily as he is forced to block a roundhouse kick from the original, giving the clone time to leap away. The male opens his mouth, another snake springing from it, after the clone and his prey. It doesn't get far as a kunai embeds itself in the creature's head, pinning it to a tree branch and killing it immediately. The man frowns for a moment before smirking. While his prey escaping isn't ideal, he supposes this isn't bad either. He can have a close look at this boy, all alone without any interruptions. In any event, he's already marked Sasuke with his curse mark. He watches as the boy lowers his outstretched arm from which the kunai flew, ice-cold cerulean blue eyes meeting dark golden ones. This child. Something tells me I'm going to enjoy this as attempting to save your teammates at your expense. How noble of you. Since you know who I am, how confident are you that you stand even a shred of a chance? Arachimaru asks, amusement dancing in his golden eyes. The boy simply stares back blankly, sighing inwardly to himself. He's probably about to die now. But if he can hold out for a decent amount of time, he can make sure Satsuki and Ino are out of sight. He almost chuckles to himself at the thought. A matter of months ago he didn't care about anyone. He had continued to convince himself of that fact too. Now here he is about to give his life for other people. It looks like he doesn't know himself as well as he thought after all. It looks like he won't be able to do his sensei justice after all. But at least he can finally join him. Not without a fight however. This is perfect actually. Now that nobody's watching, I can stop holding back the blonde declares, the snake san and smirking in response. You don't say. Well then, let's see just what you're made of. Naruto bursts towards the older shinobi who crosses his arms to block a kick. He pushes the boy back who ducks under a kick and swings a right hand that the older shinobi catches. He opens his hand to lock hands with the older shinobi, pulling him towards him while swinging his left fist for his stomach. This fist is also caught, the two locking eyes with another once again before Rachimaru's eyes widen as a burst of wind style chakra sends him back. That technique of wind style. Where have I seen that before? The shinobi says to himself. He collides with a tree behind him, a flurry of kunai following him. His body seems to take on a sort of elasticity as he evades the kunai, slithering up and around the tree in a manner very much akin to a snake. Naruto isn't far behind, running up the tree as the man reshapes into his original shape. The two engage in another tojutsu clash, dodging punches and kicks from one another, moving from one tree to another. Their fists collide with one another before they jump back from each other standing on opposite trees and staring one another down. The Asurachimaru muses to himself with glee he's definitely stronger than Sasuke and Satsuki. Tell me boy, the older shinobi speak up. 
Your fighting style undoubtedly looks familiar, but it's absolutely nothing like your father's or mother's. Who exactly trained you? The rogue ninja questions, Naruto simply staring back. I'm sure you're smart enough to figure that out yourself, he responds. He didn't think he'd be doing this, but if there's any hope at all he gets out of this alive, he has to go all out. He leaps from the tree, weaving a snake hand sign, Orochimaru watching on from above as he plummets. As he hits the ground his hand slams against it, his words registering genuine shock on Orochimaru's face for the first time. Wood-style summoning, burrowing carnivorous Buddha. The ground rumbles before a gigantic four-sided Venus flytrap rises from the ground, Naruto standing atop its head, rising until both tower over the snake Sanin who watches on in awe as rays of sunlight pierce through the canopy to shine on the blonde. Impossible he utters aloud. How can it be? Minato. No. That boy is far too weak-minded to consider such measures. Which means. Orochimaru chuckles to himself in a low voice before bursting out into full-on dark laughter, Naruto narrowing his eyes at this. He's found him. The second coming of the god of shinobi and of all people, Orochimaru has found him. Here he is in the flesh. He weaves through his own series of hand signs as the gargantuan plant pounces on him, biting his thumbs and slamming his hands onto the wood he stands on. Summoning a burst of smoke immerses him before he jumps away as the plant creatures collide with one snake summon whilst the other attempts to attack it. The creature is considerably larger than both summons, giving them a hard time. Naruto meanwhile leaps off if its head gives chase to the older shinobi. I came for the Sharingan he says to himself, a dark grin etched across his face but I may have found something even better. The heavens are smiling down upon me he says to himself. Naruto closes in on the snake summoner, two clones in tow, the three pouncing on him at once. One thrusts a kunai at the Sanin's face but is stopped by a firm hand to the wrist and dispatched with a fist to the face. The second clone is upon him as this happens glowing a white color before him as a massive explosion engulfs the ninja, pieces of flesh and cloth flying in every direction. The burned serpent falls from the wreckage landing on a tree branch. Its mouth stretches to unnatural lengths as the snake summoner climbs out unscathed. He looks up to see the boy springing towards him, kunai in hand. He opens his mouth with a blade emerging from his throat to block the boy's kunai and push him back. He lands on his feet as the blade fully emerges from the enemy's mouth, revealed to be a sword, which he places in his right hand as Naruto runs towards him. Orochimaru, in the back of his mind, becomes aware of a whirring sound and a wind seemingly gathering. The boy swings his kunai attempting to decapitate the Sanin, who ducks under the weapon and cleaves his blade through the boy's midsection, jumping away as the clone, in now familiar fashion, combusts in a flash of white. The left side of his body, seemingly incinerated, falls away like a snakeskin shed, the man emerging from the shell once again, unharmed. He looks up and there he sees it. Naruto stands atop a tree above, his technique primed and ready in his hands, the enemy in mid-air and unable to dodge. He thrusts his hands forward releasing it, but Team Guy, 8 and Team 11, when this is over it's you and I Lee. I promise you Niji bows menacingly, threatening the boy in green for the hundredth time. Aori rolls her eyes, at this point sick to her stomach with the Hyuga's moaning. Ugh, is he ever going to shut up? She groans to herself as they leap through the trees. She turns to see Sasuke touching the mark on his neck again and just about hears him grunt. We're getting CL he cannot finish his sentence as the group all simultaneously jump down to the forest floor below, dodging a torrent of kunai. They stand in a circle, backs to one another as several cloud shinobi emerge from the shadows surrounding them, attacking in groups based on village affiliation. Pathetic Niji scoffs. We'll see how pathetic you reckon we are after we take your scrolls and supplies. One of them responds. Are you serious? What a drag. Shikamaru says, a kunai drawn and at the ready. We do not have time for this. The longer we are here, the more peril the gorgeous Atsuki could be facing, Lee adds in his trademark to Jutsu stance. Aori's eyes darted to see Sasuke's head down, eyes shadowed and the mark pulsing between glowing red and black. His eyes snap open, head lifting to reveal two Tomo in each eye now. Now another member of the large group of Cloud Shinobi adds walking forward, a blade in hand, why don't we he is cut short as a fist connects with his stomach out of nowhere, sending him into a nearby tree, which he slumps against in an unconscious heap. Sasuke proceeds to dart towards the direction he was originally heading in as chaos breaks out, another Cloud Shinobi attempting to block his path. He produces a kunai slashing across the male ninja's chest before he is even able to react with his own. Get out of my way. He yells in a menacingly enraged tone as the mark on his neck continues to pulse, oscillating between spreading and retreating to its source on his neck as the violet aura from before faintly glows about him, the Achiha leaping away, leaving the groups to clash with one another. Sasuke. Kaori calls out in concern as she sees that chakra threaten to re-emerge. She then turns her attention to the cloud shinobi, assisting the rest of the group in combating them. She just hopes he can make it in time. 
the bloodlusted cry rings out from the Achiha as he tears through the forest at new speeds towards his destination. But Naruto, blind style. Godly wind from the mountain he cries, releasing the ball of wind style chakra, cannoning it towards Orochimaru who watches on in shock as it bullets towards him. I know that jutsu, flashed back, the grey sky above emits cracks of thunder as the wind sings and howls a haunting symphony. Orochimaru gasps for air on his knees with his kusanagi blade in hand, using it to support himself, his strength almost completely gone. Hang in there Jiraiya boy the male toad sage half pleads and orders next to his female counterpart as Sanadi kneels over him, green chakra emerging from her hands onto the huge wound in his chest, her 100 healings mark spread across her body. The blood continues to flow from his mouth, his sage mode by now almost completely receded and his eyes threatening to roll back into his head every so often. Orochimaru grits his teeth as his head lifts to see the giant funnel cloud by now, so close it towers over them, its winds compressed within with otherworldly control to prevent blowing them away. In a single second, the tornado dissipates leaving behind a figure who falls from it landing on the ground just some meters away from them, taking a few steps to stand closer. He is topless, revealing a scarred body that looks as though it is carved out of stone, a pair of black pants on his lower half, with the right pant leg missing. A head of completely white hair, tied into a bun, is atop his head with a hidden cloud headband wrapped around it. Despite his hair color, his stubbled face does not look old by any means. Damn it. Sanadi curses, seeing him with her peripheral vision, but unable to take her attention away from Jiraiya. Orochimaru tries to force himself up, but his legs reject his wishes, bringing him back down to his knees, the male shinobi almost cursing out loud. How is this possible? How could one man do this? A three legendary San and he speaks, Jiraiya seemingly somewhat regaining consciousness at the sound of his voice. It's been an honor, truly he speaks as the grey sky is illuminated by flashes of lightning that bathe the surrounding area. But now I'm afraid your time has come to die he says raising his right hand towards them in the name of the hidden cloud. The Sanin bites his thumbs as the deadly cannonball of wind style chakra barrels towards him, extending his hands out towards it as it closes in. Summoning Jutsu. Single Rashomon. He utters as a sealing formula accompanied by a cloud of smoke appears from his hands. The smoke is immediately blown away by the incoming attack, revealing a large thick and shut gate with a demonic looking face upon it. The projectile smashes into the gate, immediately denting it, though encountering resistance. Naruto watches from above as his attack spins against the shield for a few seconds before bursting through, ripping through all in its path before it impacts with the forest floor, creating a massive dome-shaped explosion, dust and debris rising up past a canopy of trees into the sky, the punctured gate falling to the ground to add to the dust and debris forming. Naruto stands in the same spot, eyes narrowed and awaiting the scene to clear. He can still sense the enemy's chakra. Now to see how much and or if he's injured. He produces two kunai as he hears coughing. Of teammate, Gai Kaori. No wonder they're moving in groups. Niji scoffs once again as the group of Cloud Shinobi lay strewn about before the leaf cadets. He turns to see the object of his ire examining one of the pink crystals the blue-haired rookie girl had produced. Incredible. I never would have guessed you were a wielder. Tell me, when did you wake up? Lee questions Kaori in fascinated interest. She opens her mouth to answer whilst sheepishly rubbing her head when all heads turn as the sound of an explosion is heard in the distance. That's the direction Sasuke headed in her voice in heavy concern. Then that is where we should be heading right now as well. Lee responds, beginning to step away, Kaori not far behind. That's not a good idea, Niji warns, by Akigen active, having not bothered to waste it on the cloud weaklings. We don't have time for more of this. Kaori turns, retorting, having had her fill of the Hyuga's naysaying. That sounded like a fight, and right now I see two mammoth chakras opposite one another. At first glance neither of them are anywhere near Jen and the lavender-eyed boy elaborates, earning gasps from the group just as they spot the cloud of debris and dust rising in the distance. The Ichiha is heading towards both of them, and the closer he gets, the more visible that sinister chakra from before seems to become. If you go over there, you'll be walking into the middle of a bear fight. He warns. Silence ensues for a few moments before Lee clenches his fist raising it in the air. So Satsuki is not among them? Lee questions. No Niji responds, narrowing his eyes having recognized one of the chakra signatures from its no-white color, her teammate is, the loud one's brother he reveals earning shocked gasps from the group. No way. Naruto. Choji asks, earning a nod from the Hyuga. Shikamaru's eyes narrow at the revelation. It had never been hard to tell back in the academy that Naruto was never even trying. But to think he had been hiding this all along. First a speedy display to protect Ino before the written exam, and now this. Aori grits her teeth in frustration. This whole damned exam has been a disaster. Hisa has completely disappeared, Sasuke's about to walk into a hornet's nest and is barely keeping a grip on himself, and here she is standing around doing nothing. No. She defies inwardly. 
she turns and springs off without a word, all the Jenin present, apart from Niji and Tenten calling out her name. Lee tries to spring after her only for an open palm to the chest to stop him, which he blocks with his forearm, Niji standing in his way. What the hell are you doing? The boy in green demands angrily. The rest of you can do whatever you want he says glancing at the rookies before turning his head back to Lee, but if you want to throw your life away on a whim, you'll have to go through me first Niji firmly states, shifting into his clan's famed trademark to jutsu stance, Lee frowning and responding by doing the same with his own. You guys, stop it. Tenton shouts, coming between them. Step out of the way Tenton, this has been a long time coming, the thick-browed boy utters in a serious tone. No. You two are acting stupid. We're on the same team damn it. She scolds, only for Lee to swiftly move past her so fast she can't react, making a beeline for Niji, aiming a fist to the face which is parried and countered with an attempted open palm to the chest, also blocked, the two exchanging a flurry of tojutsu blows. Hey, cut it out. Shikamari yells, weaving the rat sign as his shadow extends forward, meeting with the shadows of the two males to stop them, Lee frozen with a fist cocked back, and Niji an open palm. You're an imbecile. Niji insults. I would rather be a loyal imbecile than disloyal and anything else Lee retorts, Tenten watching on dejectedly. I don't deserve this, but Naruto. Naruto watches on, the debris now lifting, awaiting to see the damage to his opponent. Slowly a silhouette becomes visible, hunched over and clutching its side. Orochimaru spits out a mouthful of blood, putting a hand to his side, looking down and seeing a sizable wound. He looks ahead as the debris and dust lift to see his single rashomon gate on the ground, a hole torn through it, the demon face that adorned it now only having the edges left of it. Naruto can now see his opponent hunched over. His ears perk up slightly as he hears what he thinks he's mistaken for chuckling. Then he realizes he isn't mistaken as it shifts to full-on laughter, the enemy lifting his head, golden eyes meeting blue as Orochimaru bursts into a fit of deranged laughter, Naruto frowning at the sight. This guy, is he not human or is he just crazy? The blonde questions himself, watching on in disbelief. It could be a combination of both. The sand and bursts into malevolent joyous laughter, as soon as he lays eyes on the side of his destroyed Rashomon gate. A feat never achieved before. His tongue leaves, his mouth, dangling from it again as he crouches low, Naruto stiffening in readiness as he sees the warning. There's no question. He's the one. The snake summoner says to himself as his body changes shape, springing forwards and slithering at new speeds, evading a torrent of shuriken and kunai from above, and slithering up the tree towards the blonde, sword in hand, Naruto running down, said tree to meet him halfway, kunai and sword clashing, sparks flying as the Sanin's lower half takes its original shape. The ninja tools clash a few more times as the shinobi exchange blows before the older of the two smacks one of the younger kunai out of his hand, slamming a fist into his stomach, Naruto coughing up spit. He keeps a hold of the kunai in his other hand however, sending it right into the wound in his enemy's side who yells in pain, more blood flowing from his mouth. The two stare into one another's eyes once again Naruto glaring daggers, whilst Orochimaru smiles wryly once again, the inside of his mouth red with his own blood, as he digs his fist deeper into the boy's midsection, who responds by pushing his kunai deeper into the male's side. Suddenly the man releases his sword from his left hand, tossing it up and swinging his fist into the side of the boy's face who stumbles back, a right fist sending him stumbling back again, before a spin kick sends him flying down to the forest floor, landing on his hands and knees. The sand and meanwhile pulls the kunai from his side, catching his sword in his hand once again before disappearing and reappearing on the ground as well, meters away as Naruto gets back on his feet, turning with a look of defiance still cemented on his now bleeding face, which the older shinobi smirks at. He held back and played with the boy a bit and ended up getting wounded for it. He's impressed. The lion fist to jutsu style as well as the godly mountain wind. Those are two hallmarks of the arsenal of the legendary Akasada Takahashi, the typhoon of the hidden cloud Orochimaru speaks, Naruto's expression remaining the same. He single-handedly dominated entire battlefields during the Third Shinobi War, conquering armies on his own with his otherworldly wind-style affinity, he continues neither an or the rakage, he was still considered the Hidden Cloud's ultimate weapon and believed to be their only hope of winning the war. In the build-up to the climax of the war however he vanished from the face of the earth, never to be seen or heard from again, taking all his ninjutsu with him, the Sanin says before allowing a short silence, interrupted only by the humming wind. Tell me, boy. How is it that you of all people possess that shinobis, so coveted by the rest of the shinobi world and even his own village he questions, Naruto's frown of concentration still in place, another moment of silence passing before he speaks again. You said earlier you wanted to know how similar I was to my father right? Now you have an idea he simply answers, saying no more. Orochimaru smirks, needing no further explanation. The concept of masters acting as adopted fathers is a fairly common one in the shinobi world. Once upon a time the third Hokage was essentially his father. 
The concept usually applies to orphan children however, which the Sanin can't help but chuckle at, as the puzzle that lay scattered before him starts to piece itself together, though not entirely. The boy's cold eyes, his words just now and the fact that the shadow clone seems to be the only technique he shares with his parents. Not to mention the treatment he's been subjected to since the day of his birth which Orochimaru had witnessed some of with his own eyes, exclusively reserved for him and not his siblings, the pseudo Jinchuriki. The glint dances in his eyes as the rogue ninja sees the perfect combination of circumstances laid out before him. That headband around your head. Does it mean anything to you? He questions the question, taking Naruto by surprise, though the boy in typical fashion allows his face to betray no emotion, simply remaining silent to the rogue ninja's slight glee. What meaning does it hold for you? What meaning does a life of servanthood in this village, where even your own flesh and blood see nothing in you, truly hold? He continues, Naruto's face remaining blank. Scorned, despised, hated, feared by all, accepted by none. This is a path that only a select and chosen few in this world are worthy of walking. He continues as a reminiscent image of a dark-haired young boy wearing a scarred leaf headband with a similarly expressionless demeanor, appears for a moment in the blonde's place. This is our first time truly meeting one another, but I can already tell. Your latent potential may be greater than anything I've seen him speak, Naruto slightly impressed at how the older ninja seems to be ignoring the injury to his side, save for a hand to it, while talking. He doesn't react to the comment however. He's heard it a few times before. With the right guidance I dare to say you could become not only the finest shinobi to walk this earth in his lifetime, but also the finest it's seen in this era at least. And that's just a start he adds to himself, blood now leaving his mouth to contrast his stainless white fangs. It would take a good bit of work, but I could shape you into a shinobi who the leaf themselves would kneel helplessly before, one who even the fourth himself and his three chosen ones would fall to the snake sand and utters lowly, eyes locked on the boy to catch even a glimpse of a reaction. All you have to do is remove that meaningless accessory from your head, place it on the ground behind you, and follow me to your destiny. Naruto stares back expressionless as the older ninja gazes silently awaiting an answer. He produces two more kunai slipping back into a battle-ready stance. Sorry, not interested he responds plainly sprinting toward the man, sparks flying once again as the two exchange a flurry of swings, sword and kunai in hand before Rachimaru kicks the boy back, glancing at his side and grunting lowly, while weaving through a series of hand signs. Naruto recognizes them, weaving a single sign, the resultant clone grabbing him by the arm and tossing him high into the air to avoid the attack. Wind style. Great breakthrough. The gust of wind bursts, the clone disappearing. Naruto twists in the air frowning as he notes a chakra signature approaching himself and the enemy's location. sasuke -cha. Now of all times. This guy is getting annoying. His brow furrows slightly more as he notes the change in the Ichiha's chakra. It's recognizable, but there's a darker and more malevolent undertone to it. But Satsuki and Ino. Satsuki's eyes flutter, the lids heavy. They lift and fall repeatedly as the blur beneath her slowly shifts into a clearer picture, that picture being the forest floor moving below her as she watches from the trees. She realizes that she's moving at high speed and that she's draped over someone's shoulder. Instinctively her elbow swings, meeting the stranger's face, a cloud of smoke engulfing her vision, but not enough to stop her from reaching out her arms, one above to grab hold of a tree branch and one below to grab her unconscious teammate's hand as she falls, the stranger now gone into thin air along with the smoke. Sastuki grunts in frustration at her own limbs, still partially asleep and numb. She swings her right arm a couple of times, swinging her teammate and draping her over a tree branch, earning a grunt from the Yamanaka who begins to move as Satsuki pulls herself onto the thick branch. Ino, are you okay? Do you have any injuries? She questions, the blonde groaning, a hand to her neck. No. I'm fine she groans out. We were being transported by a clone. I destroyed it before I even got a look. Satsuki utters before a gasp escapes her as realization finally comes crashing into her, head swiveling. Wait, where's N? Naruto. Ino cuts her off. Satsuki, he knocked us both out. That clone was his. He stayed back to fight that man alone, her exclamation trailing into a horrified whisper, hands to her mouth, almost as if to stop the words that had already left it. Satsuki launches a fist into the tree branch they are both kneeling on, teeth gritted in rage. You idiot. You stupid idiot. She jumps to her feet, Sharingan active, eyes darting everywhere. She has no idea how long she was unconscious. They could be and probably are, miles away from him and that freak. Naruto. The Kanoichi shout in unison. But Naruto. Naruto's ear rests against the trunk of the tree he is crouched behind. Suddenly he springs from behind it as it explodes into pieces as another gigantic snake summon smashes through it. His opponent has resorted to medium to long range combat to compensate for his injury. Orochimaru watches on as the boy springs away from behind a tree as his summon barrels through it. 
A burst of smoke emerges from his sleeveless jacket before he swings a few shuriken, the weapon sailing through the air and into the animal's open mouth as it closes in on him, ripping through the roof of its maw and emerging through its head to continue and bury itself in a nearby tree trunk. As it writes about the life fading from it, he produces two more fumashuriken, one in each hand, swinging and tossing them at his opponent, their trajectories intersecting as they sail towards him. The Sandin's body bends and contorts at inhumane angles to dodge the projectiles. He backflips as a large fireball crashes into the position he was standing in. That smile once again graces his lips as the smoke lifts to reveal Sasuke standing ahead of him and a few steps in front of Naruto. A callous frown adorns his face, the mark on his neck pulsing. What the Sanin takes notice of before anything else however is the evolved Sharingan in the boy's eyes, both now bearing two Tamo. The sight fills him with glee, and that of Naruto walking forwards to stand next to Sasuke does so even more. Sasuke, how kind of you to join the rogue ninja says. Shut up bastard. Where's my sister? The Achiha demands, Orochimaru simply chuckling to himself, serving to further enrage the young Achiha. Answer me now, so I can finish you, he adds coldly as the mark begins to glow less statically, spread across the left side of his face, down his neck and arm, Naruto watching on with narrowed eyes. What the hell is that? He muses to himself, as he senses that same malevolent undertone become more prominent, eyes glued to the mark on the Achiha's neck as his chakra exponentiates. It seems to be a three tomo pattern. Unfortunately I have no idea, he sighs. The one standing next to you knows the answer to that question he answers, Sasuke turning his head to see the blonde gazing ahead at the enemy. Tsutsuki is safe. And you shouldn't have come here, Naruto plainly says. Sasuke turns his head from the blonde, who is sporting a few bruises and scars, back to the freak and gasps loudly as he finally takes notice of the sizable wound in the ninja's side, eyes darting back to Naruto. This is quite convenient actually. I'm almost out of time so why don't we make this last act a worthy one? Why don't the two of you show me why you're so different one more time he utters, flying through hand signs, the two weaving through their own set in response. Pyre style. Dragon flame. Pyre style. Fireball. Water style. Tidal wave. The three techniques collide with one another, a huge burst of steam the result, Naruto grabbing Sasuke and leaping back until they stand outside the huge cloud of steam, Naruto holding up a single-handed sign to infuse chakra, his eyes shut while on one knee. What or why? S S S S H H H H H Naruto silences we're not going to beat this guy. Your teammate is heading in our direction. Go back the way you came and you and her get as far away from here as you can. If this doesn't work, nothing will. If what doesn't work? What are you talking about? I'm not going anywhere until I see Satsuki with my own eyes Sasuke doesn't finish his sentence as a low gasp escapes him. The blonde's eyelids rise to reveal his eyes are now white glowing color, the ur eyes and whites now completely gone and replaced by this glowing white. His left eye returns to its normal state, but his right retains the ominous no white glow. His chakra. It's insane Sasuke says inwardly in disbelief, curse mark still in place. Inhale, exhale, inhale, control. With Arachimaru, the sand and stands still as the cloud of steam rushes toward him and immerses him. Sasuke's fire style is stronger than earlier which he is impressed by, but that use of water style such volume from simply his own chakra. He'd only expect something like that from Kissim. This boy is truly a diamond. It's a shame I can't give him a gift like Sasuke. His chakra would surely overpower it he muses to himself. Nevertheless he will be mine. His body wielded at its full potential will have no equal in this world. With him even the combined force of Minato and the Akatsuki wouldn't be enough to stop me. If I wanted the Sharingan I would be able to simply take it. The tailed beasts themselves would be rendered by puppets he analyses beginning to chuckle. He grunts, reaching for his bloody side once again. He's starting to feel the effects of that. A dark laugh escapes him once again as the thought remains in his mind. The god of shinobi. I like the sound of it. Both teammate and guy. Look how about you two stop acting like knuckleheads so I can let you go. This is really a drag Shikamaru sighs in exasperation, the two older genins still restrained by him. Lee glares daggers at Niji, while the Hyuga simply stares blankly back, by Akigan still active. What are you seeing? Tenton questions knowingly, before head's turn as another boom is heard, this one a bit less thunderous than the last. Shikamaru, Sasuke's gone over there Sakura utters in horror staring in the direction of the sound, we have to go stop him she pleads, the Nara heaving another sigh. Hi Uga, what exactly is happening over there right now? Shikamaru questions. Niji frowns. I can't see them anymore, they're out of my range. He grunts, responding to the group's disappointment. But Satsuki and Ino. Satsuki Ino calls for the second time as the two leap through the trees. Tsutsuki. The Yamanaka repeats before reaching for the Ichiha's arm and grabbing her to stop. But damn it. Tsutsuki whips around angrily. We have no idea how long we were out for or the direction we were taken in. We could be moving away from him. Or he could. 
The blonde says, trailing off not wanting to finish the sentence. Tsutsuki raises a fist, smashing it against the trunk of the tree branch they stand on, splinters flying. Ino watches on as her teammate shakes with rage, head bowed and eyes shadowed. The Yamanaka feels the sting of tears in her eyes. That damned idiot Tsutsuki utters through clenched teeth and tightly shut eyes, desperate not to show the tears behind them to the world. Sasuke. Naruto. Butharachimaru. He ducks down as the large carnivorous plant, having emerged from the ground a few seconds ago, swings a tendril over his head. It changes direction smacking him through the air, a long snake emerging from his sleeve to stop another tendril as he lands. It's annoyingly fast for its eyes. The creature, mouth wide, tries to pull him towards itself, the man swinging his sword and slicing through his own snake to stop his motion, the creature tossing it into its mouth. It attempts to beeline for him again, but as he readies himself for its attack, the creature suddenly freezes before twisting and burrowing into the ground, leaving Orochimaru alone with his sword, the steam from earlier still not having fully lifted. An expression of confusion shifts to a frown as the Sanin stands in still anticipation. Something's coming. So what exactly do you have up your sleeves now? He wonders out loud. But Naruto. He rises to both feet, Sasuke watching on in shocked silence. This guy. Itachi, is this why you? His train of thought is interrupted as the ground begins to rumble and shake. He looks down, his eyes allowing him to see into the earth, and the side earns another gasp from him. The carnivorous Buddha explodes from the earth to tower over both boys, Sasuke sporting a shocked look, whilst Naruto retains the same stern expression. The creature swings back before swinging towards them, Sasuke attempting to weave through a set of hand signs, while Naruto simply stares ahead, eyes not even on the creature. It descends on them, mouth open, to swallow the Achiha hole, burrowing into the ground, leaving Naruto standing next to a large hole. Alright here we go. If this doesn't work then I guess that's the end of that. He says to himself casually, eyes still glowing as he lifts his hands up and brings them together. Tiger, ram, snake, the steam finally lifts, Orochimaru locking eyes with the blonde once again, hands locked in the snake sign. He notes his glowing right eye, smirking slightly in anticipation, as his body tingles at the sensation of that chakra, the air itself shifting. Then he realizes Sasuke is gone and so is the carnivorous plant. What exactly are these boys you? Orochimaru's train of thought grinds to a halt as the words that emerge from the boy's mouth earn a gasp from him. Wood style. Deep forest emergence. Silence. The ground begins to rumble and shake once again more so than before. The sand and watches on in disbelief as the earth before the boy cracks open, large limbs of wood rising and unraveling, growing and stretching out. The wooden limbs tower over the boy, erasing him from Orochimaru's side as the limbs towards him. The sand and simply watches on with wide eyes as spoken of in legends and war tales, one said to have shaped the very landscape around them, barrels towards him. With Kaori. Kaori continues leaping through the trees, desperately trying to reach her destination. Amnit, Sasuke's faster than before she notes, thinking back to the Achiha's display against the Cloud Shinobi, albeit briefly. She stops in her proverbial tracks as the tree she stands on shakes with the rest of the ones around her, as the earth emits a mighty rumble. The rumble grows stronger, the Kanoichi looking down to see a sizable spider web of cracks in the ground below. The cracks explode outwards in enormous four-sided Venus flight traps springing from the ground, Kaori falling back off the tree branch she stood on with a yell, landing on the ground below with a thud. An expression of shock and fear shifts to one of confrontation, as she produces multiple kunai with explosive tags strapped to them. The creature brings its head back and hurls a projectile out of its mouth towards the girl, Kaori releasing two of the kunai towards it, before her face contorts with horror, as she realizes what the projectile actually is. Sasuke's eyes allow him to see the two kunai rigged with explosives, coming towards him in slow motion. He produces four of his own, throwing two that disrupt the trajectory of the oncoming ninja tools by colliding with them, and another two that fly into the holes at the end of each handle, sending the kunai flying away into the depths of the forest behind Kaori. Two explosions simultaneously ring out as Sasuke hits the ground in front of Kaori with a thud. The girl's head darts behind her to see the trees bathed in smoke and fire, and turns back just in time to see the plant creature disappear back into the ground, the only remaining evidence of its presence being a hole in the ground. Sasuke. She falls to her knees, helping the Achiha into a sitting position. Are you alright? What the hell was that? She frets. I'm fine, calm down Ka he pauses as the ground rumbles once again, the source seemingly further away. The two take no chances, jumping to their feet with kunai drawn. They look up into the sky to see another large cloud of debris and dust rising. Naruto Sasuke voices internally, watching the dust rise. With teammate and guy. The group stood tensely having just heard what sounded like another two simultaneous explosions and then felt something akin to an earthquake moments later, the forest shaking around them. Smoke rising from one part of the forest their fellow cadets ventured into and a large amount of dust and debris rising in another. 
It sounds pretty hot over there Choji notes with a nervous laugh and a gulp. Shikamaru, P. Sakura attempts to plead only to be cut off. Sakura, we can't just walk into a situation where we're certain to get ourselves killed, he states frankly, the girl looking down dejectedly. Did you hear that Lee? Niji questions his teammate mockingly, the two now freed from their restraints, the boy in green's eyes lighting up with fury in response. The group all stand in silence once again, watching on as the cloud of dust and debris continues to ominously rise in the distance, all wondering just what kind of shinobi, what kind of monsters they've been locked in the same den with. With Minato, they've not been dead for long, sir the Anbu says as Minato looks on at the domestic security branch Anbu, strewn about on the floor, dead, more of the ninja collecting evidence from the scene. Another black operative appears before the blonde in a cloud of smoke. Lord Hokage he addresses before getting closer to the village leader whispering in his ear. His face shifts into a cold expression of silent fury. The Anbu standing next to Minato and in front of him aren't in the least bit shocked when their leader suddenly disappears into thin air, without so much as a hair left behind. With Anko. The Kinoichi groans for the umpteenth time, hand to her neck, as she sits on the grass, in front of one of many entrances to the forest, Anbu shinobi all over the place, a medical shinobi kneeling to her right, penning away on a clipboard. Her head lifts to see a dust cloud rising in the distance, a low rumble audible. The Kinoichi gasps slowly as she turns her head to her left to see the Hokage standing over her. El Lord Hokage she addressed as he crouches onto his haunches in front of her. Usually she would crack a joke, but then she sees the look on his face, cold and stern. She hasn't seen that look in years. With Team Guy and Eight. The heads of the group turn to see Kaori and Sasuke walk out from behind the trees, the mark on the Ichiha's neck still and silent again. Sasuke. Sakura exclaims, sprinting towards the Ichiha only for his dark blue-haired female teammate to stand in front of him, an open hand up to stop her in her tracks. He's an injured sweetheart. Getting your autograph later she snidely remarks, Sakura growling angrily as the other genin approaches, all except for Niji, who stays back, arms crossed. Hey Ori, are the two of you alright? Lee asks. Yeah, are you guys okay? It sounded like a warzone over there Choji adds chuckling. We're fine you guys, thankfully the Kinoichi responds smiling at the group. Were you successful in locating Satsuki? Where is she? How is she? He asks, Kaori's own head turning to Sasuke who didn't speak a word to her on their way back. Satsuki's. Safe the Ichiha says, Lee heaving a sigh of relief. I just knew you were gonna save her Sasuke. Cha. Sakura exclaims with eyes full of admiration. It wasn't me who responded plainly to the girl's apparent surprise. Why you didn't? She questions so who then who did it? Satsuki's teammate was the one who protected her, he says. Naruto Shikamaru says, the group looking around at one another, their expressions conveying their emotions of surprise. Sasuke Kaori speaks earning the Ichiha's attention we need to go fi. Looks like I wasn't invited to the party. All in the group turn to see history emerge from the shadows of the trees, Niji frowning slightly in thought. Um, impressive stealth, Issa. His female teammate happily exclaims, running towards him and giving him a playful shove. You're okay. You're not injured are you? What happened? She questions, the boy chuckling in response. I guess I got a little lost. That's all he chuckles, scratching the back of his head sheepishly as Sasuke approaches the two. Hey jerk, Hisateru greets you with a long face. Were you hoping I was dead? He questions smirking. Hey, Sasuke Shikamaru calls out before referring to Sasuke's exact thoughts at the moment. So if you're here, where's Naruto? Silence ensues, Sasuke's thoughtful expression remaining in place. The carnivorous Buddha explodes from the earth to tower over both boys, Sasuke sporting a shocked look, whilst Naruto retains the same stern, expression. The creature swings back before swinging towards them, Sasuke attempting to weave through a set of hand signs, while Naruto simply stares ahead, eyes not even on the creature. It descends on them, mouth open, to swallow the Ichiha hole. That creature was summoned by him. Sasuke had his doubts at first, but there aren't any now. There's no way he would have reacted so calmly if he hadn't. He had chosen to stay back and take that free con all alone. And now one question plagues the Ichiha's mind. Is the blonde still alive? But Arachimaru. His right eye is closed to prevent the blood flowing from his temple from going into it. He emerges from the shadows of the trees into the small, shaded clearing. His demeanor is calm, contrasting his physical appearance. The sizable wound on his side is still present, with a few other notable injuries. Most apparent of these is his right arm, gone from the shoulder. He comes to stand in the center of the clearing, taking a close look at the sight before him. Three human skulls, each with a hidden sound headband in front of them. Kanji have been carved into the front of the skulls to spell out a message. You've been warned, you've been warned he says simply as a cloud of black smoke surrounds him. The low chuckle emerges from the man as he licks his bloodied lips. This next generation of leaf shinobi is going to be something else. He begins to sink into the ground, leaving the scene as it is. In a matter of seconds, he's gone without a trace. 
Seconds later, Bonato stands over the scene, one of his trademark kunai in hand, reading the message to himself a second time before frowning. Warned. Hirachimaru's clearly forgotten who he's dealing with. He'll remember soon enough. He turns and walks away, off to find Sasuke, vanishing into thin air as the wind blows. But Naruto. He trudges onward, sleeveless jacket off his shoulders and in one hand and headband in the other. The wind blows through his golden mane, embracing his bruised and battered body as he trudges on and on. The wind sings once again, embracing the young shinobi's bruised body. Headband and jacket in hand, he trudged on, an arm rising every so often to wipe sweat and blood from his brow. His third trump card had worked, just about. Orochimaru is still alive, but his deep forest emergence has injured the man to the extent of forcing his retreat. The godly mountain wind had been effective in at least subtly restricting his opponent's range of motion and leaving a window open. The Achiha had nearly ruined everything, but thankfully his first trump card had been on hand. A deep breath is exhaled as he rolls his shoulders. He's pleased by the control he exerted over his own chakra. To control the amount he infused to perform the deep forest emergence. Not an easy feat. The only other time he's gone this far was against Haku, though he'll admit perhaps this was even more extreme. The chances of losing control were higher. He shakes his head as his walk continues. He doesn't want to allow himself to contemplate how his chances against the Sanin might have been impacted by such an outcome. It would have been another disaster entirely. He tucks the leaf headband away rather than around his head, placing his sleeveless jacket back onto his shoulders as he senses them approach him. But Satsuki and Ino. Ino gasps for air as she watches on at Satsuki tear away once again through the trees. Her speed's marginally gone up since her eyes evolved. Ino notes. Without increased rigorous training yet her body is already attempting to adapt to the increased perception it's been granted. Satsuki's genes are insane Yamanaka notes in almost awe. Suddenly she sees the Achiha jump down from the canopy to fall to the forest floor, below another figure coming into view as Ino tries to catch up. Satsuki bursts forward as her feet meet the ground, bolting towards him. Naruto watches as the Kanoichi speeds towards him, eyes glowing red, two Tomo in each. He sees the fist that she raises and cocks back as she nears him, easily able to react, but choosing not to, watching it rush towards him. Ino gasps for a moment before yelling in protest as she sees her female teammate swing a fist that connects with their other comrade's face, sending him onto his back against the ground. Naruto forces his body to stiffen as it instinctively attempts to react, the fist colliding against his already bruised face, sending him to the ground. Satsuki, no. Ino shouts, sprinting towards the two as Satsuki swings one fist after another against the downed boy's face, who lays still as the punches come one after another. The reckless bastard. Who do you think you are pulling something like th? She continues to yell bloody murder as Ino pulls her off the blonde who proceeds to sit up casually. Where do you get off making decisions for us? Are you crazy? Satsuki, calm down. Ino commands, still holding the girl back, making herself heard now. Ichiha clenches her teeth, eyes still crimson, begrudgingly complying as Ino turns to face Naruto's still seated Kami. Naruto. You're alright. Are you carrying any injuries? No he says plainly, Satsuki further clenching her jaw at his demeanor. Naruto, why would you blindside us like that? Ino asks, her voice and expression becoming serious. I chose the most logical outcome and he responds simply. And why would you call it that? She questions. The enemy was in a completely different class to us. Even if we'd faced him, three against one, we wouldn't have won. If anything the chances of one, if not all three, of us dying or being taken hostage were much higher he states. If that's the case then how are you here? She asks, glancing at her other teammate, clearly still seething. He's still very much alive, but I was able to force him into retreat, Naruto says, the Kanoichi gasping in unison. Why you did what? Ino stutters out. Tsutsuki simply watches on in silence. There it is. Like she'd expected. Just when you think you know how strong he is, you're wrong. What do you mean you forced him to retreat? The Yamanaka questions. I mean I injured him to the extent of no longer being able to fight Naruto. But, ho. Oh. She doesn't finish that sentence as the question echoes itself to her once again. How much do they actually know about Naruto? So you're saying all three of us together wouldn't have survived, but you did alone. She says, Satsuki is still silent, eyes overshadowed by her hair. Naruto gives no response this time, the female blonde looking down, a slight frown adorning her face. The reason you did what you did is because you don't trust us Satsuki says, speaking up this time, a low gasp from Ino at the blunt accusation. Naruto's demeanor retains the same casual hue. Well she challenges Ino to move to stand between the two to prevent any further physical violence. Guys, this is not the time or the place she attempts to reason as the boy rises back to his feet. I've told you the truth he utters believe what you want. You didn't answer my question, the Achiha retorts in a challenging tone. Ino's eyes dart between the two as a moment of silence passes. Then the boy speaks. 
No, that's not the reason. And no, I don't. I don't trust anyone. He says. The wind blows as there is silence again. Yeah. And who says we want to risk our lives alongside someone who doesn't trust us? The Achiha challenges while Lino looks on with concern. That's your choice, he responds indifferently. But seeing as we now have both scrolls and should be heading for the tower, if you don't want to continue alongside me, now would be the moment to make the clear so we can forfeit, he adds as there is silence briefly once again. Well? He questions as the Achiha stares him down, fists still clenched, teeth gritted. But Team 11, you have an Earth scroll. Kaori questions an almost disbelieving brown-haired teammate. This Atera digs into his jacket producing a scroll with a kanji inscribed on it, Earth, where did you get it? She asks as her Achiha teammate remains silent, looking on at the scroll. I managed to snag it, he says with a cheeky smirk, Sasuke narrowing his eyes for a moment. The loser is annoying, but he definitely has his own substance to him. So we have one heaven scroll and two earth scrolls Kaori notes, glancing at Sasuke. You guys have an earth scroll as well. Where did you, there you three are, the three genin jump at the fourth voice, producing kunai and jumping back whilst turning. They are met with the sight of the leader of their village. Pretty odd choice of disguise for a Kaori says with an eyebrow raised. It's not Sasuke correcting, Sharingan active, Kaori gasping slowly. History isn't surprising. To get so close to them unnoticed. That's definitely the Hokage. If he were an enemy shinobi he'd have been able to kill all three of them before they even knew what was happening. Astonishing. The Lord Hokage Kaori greets with uncertainty as the man shows a small smile for a moment. Good to see you three. Minato greets before his face shifts into a more stern expression. Listen. I'm not going to beat about the bush. Sasuke speaks, addressing his best friend son, his teammates glancing at him. I have strong information that your life may be in danger. I'm afraid in light of the circumstances, I'm going to have to withdraw you from the exam he says, earning gasps from the other two genin and a frown from the Acha. The three of you can only qualify for the next round as a complete unit, so unfortunately this does mean your team will not be able to progress any further in the exams. It's unfortunate, but it would be gross negligence on my part to allow you to continue at this point. He says only for the Achiha to respond immediately. I know exactly what you're talking about, the boy says, Minato's eyebrows rising for a moment before his eyes narrow. Do you? With Team 12. Team 12 continue to walk in silence as the entrance to their destination comes into view. Ino glances uneasily at either of her teammates, not a word having been spoken since the blonde male had posed his question. She inwardly sighs to herself as Hitsuki pushes the double doors open, Naruto following behind as she steps through as well. She can't remember things ever being this tense since the team was formed. She can only hope the team isn't too badly damaged by. Her train of thought is interrupted as her eyes are caught by a broken message on the far wall of the open room they find themselves in. Without. Heaven. She reads aloud. Guys, I think we have to open the scrolls she surmises, glancing at both teammates who still haven't spoken a word to one another. Naruto produces both scrolls, unraveling both and tossing them before himself, smoke emerging from the scrolls to form a cloud that lifts quickly to reveal a familiar figure. Aruka sensei Ino greets the Chunin smiling back. Great to see you guys. He greets back happily. What are you doing here sensei? Only here to congratulate you on passing the second exam he reveals, Ino beaming while Satsuki retains the same frown that's been on her face for a while now, Naruto expressionless as always. On the second day, you three got here pretty early. Naruka takes note that of the three, Naruto seems to be the most injured, unsurprising considering he's probably the least skilled. The Kinoichi both glance at Naruto. They hadn't taken into account how far that clone had transported them. Allow me to explain the significance of the second exam. Naruka says clearing his throat, Ino sweat dropping, Satsuki retaining her cold expression, and Naruto his nonchalant one. But Team 11, I see. So Naruto was left behind alone with that man Minato asks with his eyes shadowed by his blonde locks. Yes Sasuke responds, his teammates looking on intently, the Achiha having fully explained what had transpired in the past day, including when he wasn't with them. History remains silent, listening intently. So Orochimaru is after the Sharingan and the fourth's eldest fought him. Talk about bombshells. Naruto Uzumaki Namikas, huh? He muses to himself. The three of you will have to come with me so I can remove you from the forest. Uncle Minato the Achiha interrupts, referring to the village leader by an old familiar term. It would bring a smile to his face on any other day. Please let us complete the exam first. I'll do whatever you need after, but my teammates need to advance the Achiha says, Kaori and history gazing at the Achiha in surprise. The village leader sighs before producing one of his trademark kunai and throwing it at the Achiha who catches it in his left hand. Infuse chakra and line it along the kunai if you run into any problems out of the ordinary he says, emphasizing the last part of the sentence, earning a nod from the boy. I'll still need to speak to all three of you later. 
Until then, you're not to say a word to anyone about what you've seen today. He orders. In the blink of an eye, the man is gone without a trace again, Kaori casting a nervous glance at the Ichiha. He hadn't mentioned the mark on his neck once to the village leader. That might be a problem later. But Naruto, clone, a figure emerges from the monstrous wooden entanglement to jump down and stand right before him, revealed to be an identical copy of himself. The clone hands him an object wrapped in black, recovered from the giant jigsaw of wood that has completely rearranged this part of the forest. He partially unwraps it, taking a look at the object, before concealing it again, the two sharing a nod before the one holding the object leaps away, the other disappearing in a cloud of smoke. The clone glances back to see a white glow emerge from the depths of the entanglement and bursts away increasing its speed. But Naruto. It looks like you had quite the two days Tsunade says, turning to tend to Kashina's eldest again, dragged in by his teammates. He sits on a bed topless, sporting a good few bruises and cuts. He remains silent. Shizun fiddles about in another quarter of the room, stealing a glance every so often. Tsunade notices the crimson blush on the Kinoichi's face and chuckles to herself. You're actually the third team to make it here. Your brother and sisters came in earlier today. Another team came in yesterday she says as she treats a cut on the side of his head. Naruto remains unresponsive. He's willing to bet it's the San Shinobi. He wonders how the woman in front of him would react if she knew the one responsible for these injuries was her old teammate. The room suddenly trembles as several explosions forming one seismic one seem to ring out in the distance. That sounds like more from earlier. Shizun says. Such chaos from only Jen and Sanadi says shaking her head while the room continues to shake, items falling off shelves. Just what kind of kids are these? Naruto feels the memories rushing back, receiving the go-ahead from one of the many clones at the scene, subtly weaving the release sign to detonate the others. He heaves a low sigh of exhaustion. It cost a lot of chakra, but at least his secret is safe. The boy suddenly feels a pair of arms embrace him from behind. If he weren't as tired as he is he would have reacted violently. He turns his head to see the Hokage clutching onto him. You're alright he says, his voice filled with relief. Are you alright? You're not seriously injured are you? I'm fine, Lord Hokage Naruto responds plainly. Tsunade watches on at the two with a somber smile. A stranger could tell their relatives with a single glance. You had to have had more faith in the boy than that Minato Tsunade playfully says, rolling her eyes while concluding her treatment of the blonde. It's not that. I knew Naruto would pass. It's something else he says, the Sanin noting the stern expression on his face. Please allow me a moment alone with him he asks, Sanadi nodding and making her way toward the exit with Shizun not far behind. As the sound of the door shutting echoes throughout the room lined with beds, Minato comes to occupy the seat Sanadi had only moments ago. A few moments of silence pass before the older of the two speaks up again. I've already spoken with Sasuke. Now I'm going to need your account of everything that's happened today, Naruto, but Satsuki, Satsuki. Ino calls out at the Achiha, struggling to hear her own voice over the seismic explosion echoing in the distance. As the noise dies down, Satsuki still marching down the corridor, Ino rushes to hurriedly walk alongside the girl. Hey, why are you so angry? Listen Naruto shouldn't have blindsided us like that boo, don't you get it? The Achiha questions coming to a stop. This proves we know nothing about him. One of the legendary three, Ino. A shinobi we couldn't dream of defeating. He fought someone like that alone and survived. That means everything we've seen up until now has been a facade. The bell test, the land of waves. Even this exam. They've all been games to him. But he's protected us. He knocked us out because he didn't want us to see his real power, Eno. He said himself he doesn't trust us, she retorts. But he still put his life on the line for us, Satsuki the Yamanaka argues, Satsuki resuming her march in a huff while she follows. Look, Naruto has trust issues, clearly. But so did you. I fancy seeing you guys here. The two Kanoichi turn to see Menma leaning against the wall. Menma Ino greets. So you made it as well. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. You have got Satsuki on your team after all he says smirking at the Ichiha who simply turns and continues to walk away in a huff. What's up with her? He asks, genuine concern on his face, Ino sighing inwardly at this. Your brother is what's up with her Ino replies before heading after her teammate. She can talk to Menma later. His face shifts into a frown as the Yamanaka hurries off. The loser is messing with his girl. Not while he has something to say about it, but Minato, you. Fought him? He questions in disbelief. Yes Naruto responds, although I do strongly suspect he held back to some extent. Even so Naruto, t he is interrupted as the sound of the door opening turns both their heads. In walks a hooded figure clad in black, an outfit identical to the one Naruto wears, apart from his removed top. It closes the door, approaching the two and handing Naruto an object wrapped in a black cloth. The boy holds the object out towards the village leader who takes it with a quizzical expression. He unwraps the cloth, gasping lowly at the pale severed human arm in his hands. He recognizes it clearly. 
He raises his head to look into his son's eyes, who gazes back nonchalantly. Naruto. How? But team guy. Will the two of you stop it? I'll beat both of you senseless. Tenton reprimands as the two boys grip one another's collars, staring each other down. Risking our chances of progression over a crush. You ever do anything stupid like that again and I promise you, I won't show any mercy the Hayuga bows with narrowed eyes. I look forward to that hour, Niji responds brazenly. The sooner you start using your brain and listening the better for all three of us the Hayuga replies, shoving the boy in green back. This isn't a game. We still don't know what kind of monsters we're in here with. I was right about the blonde one he says, glancing at Tenten. He's only a rookie genin by name. He's far more dangerous. And to think you wanted to fight him he scoffs looking back at his male teammate who stares back. Enough sideshows. Let's find the other scroll and head for the tower already. But Naruto. He walks down the corridor, his top half clothed once again, heading for his temporary quarters. He had told the Hokage mostly everything, leaving a few things out of course, including how exactly he had taken the Sanin's arm off him or caused the other injury the Achiha had mentioned. He turns left at an intersection of passageways, a familiarly annoying voice calling out to him. Hey. He turns his head to see the son of the man he had been speaking to only a few moments ago. What's your problem with Satsuki, loser? Cause it's a problem with me now. He declares. Are you bored again or something? Get lost he responds plainly, continuing with his walk, Menma gritting his teeth in anger at the dismissal. He darts towards the blonde, fist cocked back, intent on teaching him a well-deserved lesson. Suddenly the black and red-haired boy finds himself flying through the air as his fist is caught before he's swung by the arm and ragdolled through the air. He loudly grunts as his back meets the ground, jumping to his feet to swing another fist, this one also being caught. The flurry of tojutsu blows cancelling one another out is exchanged before Menma gasps for air as the wind is knocked out of him, Naruto's first meeting his stomach. He heaves a cough, clutching at his midsection as the blonde walks past him to continue on his way. What the hell's going on? This isn't Naruto such speed and strength. He outstretches his hand to grab the blonde's shoulder, only for his wrist to be grabbed, the boy turning his head to make eye contact. Don't use Satsuki as an excuse to chase your little dream of getting under my skin, he utters calmly. He feels his own wrist suddenly gripped as Menma pulls him toward himself, seething. As Menma reels him in for a fist to the nose he suddenly finds himself on the ground again, the air missing from his lungs once more, Naruto standing over him. Said blonde looks down at him for a few seconds before walking away without a word. What just happened? With Minato and Tsunade. Minato, if there's even a chance you aren't certain of what you've just said Tsunade utters in a harsh whisper, not trusting even the walls. Instead of responding the village leader, seated on one of the beds, simply casts his gaze to an object wrapped in black on one of the examination tables in the infirmary. Tsunade catches his silent gesture and approaches the table unwrapping the mysterious object. A loud gasp escapes her, hands moving to her mouth. She turns away from the arm, reeling from the shock. B but. Why? Why is he here? And how could a mere child? Minato struggles to form a full sentence, the words escaping her. The younger shinobi sighs to himself. He doesn't consider himself arrogant, but he is by the majority of accounts, the most dangerous man in the world right now, so Orochimaru's willingness to set foot back in the leaf, it's quite brazen he must admit. All Anbu personnel are on high alert. I've already sent for Jureya-sensei. Now I have to tell Fugaku everything he says while heaving a sigh. That should be fun. But Naruto. The blonde lays on his bed in his temporary personal quarters, happy to be away from any and all annoyances. The day's done a good job of reminding him why he prefers to be alone. The warmth of the covers has his eyelids heavy. They lower and rise repeatedly until his ceiling melts and shifts into a darkened passageway. His bed seemingly disappears into thin air as he finds himself ankle deep in water. He glances behind himself, a large steel door there, before stepping forward, down the darkened corridor. The amount of light seems to diminish as he continues before it returns as he finds himself stepping into another room. A humongous pair of steel gates with wooden vines and tendrils wrapping around the bars tower over him as he approaches them. In the pitch black of the apparent cage, a large pair of crimson eyes with slitted pupils snap open, casting a fiery gaze upon the boy. A low growl that echoes throughout the room leaves the cage as Naruto meets the mysterious crimson gaze. Well, well. It's been a while, boy. How nice of you to come and see me, an ominously deep and thunderous voice says lowly. Naruto remains silent. He didn't come here on purpose. His subconscious seems to have pulled him here for whatever reason. Fatigue perhaps. He can't say. I witnessed your little exchange from earlier with that shinobi. Had you called upon my power, you would have been able to destroy him, since when have I ever needed your power? The blonde questions, a dark rumble of a chuckle leaving the cage. He'd known for a good few years now the beast had been regenerating its chakra. 
He isn't certain if the one who made this seal is aware, but if he isn't, he certainly won't be the one to let him know. You seem intent on simply keeping me suppressed here for as long as you can. What do you plan on doing when your father learns I've regained my former strength? If you're talking about the Hokage, frankly I don't care. And as far as I'm concerned, you may as well not even be here, he says plainly. Just cross your fingers and hope someone might manage to kill me. Cause until then this is as good as it gets he adds. How disappointing. I was certain you weren't like the others, but as it turns out you're just as pitiful. Risking your life to save your new little friends. And they don't even care. You're better than that aren't you Naruto? The beast questions in a half-mocking tone, bringing a frown to the boy's face. Before he can retort however, the boy's head darts to the dark passageway that brought him here. He glances back at the giant creature whose face twists into a grimace. Sand spills underneath the doorway into the room, coating the floor, moving across the room towards the foot of the bed. The sand crawls slowly up the foot of the bed. Naruto crouches on his haunches upside down on the ceiling, watching as the sand encroaches on the clone in his bed. A kunai in one hand and a release sign at the ready from the other, he watches on, glancing at the shadow cast by the pair of feet on the other side of the door, ready to detonate the clone and pounce. Suddenly the sand pulls away from the bed at a rapid pace, rushing across the floor, through the underside of the door, until it's all gone without a trace. The pair of feet on the other side are still for a few moments before the sound of receding footsteps accompanies their departure. Naruto remains upright on the ceiling, glancing at the window to see the daytime sky had turned to night, since he'd closed his eyes. He jumps down from it, walking over to look out at the forest underneath the light of the waxing moon, the remnants of the forest fire he'd caused earlier still rumbling in the distance. Elsewhere in the tower, temporary Hokage office, a chair flies through the air and collides with the wall, breaking into pieces as Fugaku swings a kick into it. Minato sits behind a desk while Sasuke stands a few steps away from him, having arrived with his team only minutes ago. Sasuke, you should have told me Minato reprimands sternly, the boy reaching a hand to touch the back of his neck. As soon as he'd arrived he'd been taken straight to the infirmary for an examination. There was obviously no hiding the mark then. The boy glances at his father, a murderous expression of rage on his face. The nerve. The audacity. To touch his son. His daughter. His team. Minato. He needs to die, Fugaku utters in a low cold tone. The Hokage sighs to himself. It would appear indeed that Orochimaru's goal is the Sharingan. Interestingly, Naruto had made him aware that the man had tried to recruit him as well. The thought had made his blood run cold in his own veins. I'll get to work immediately on a way to try and get rid of that mark. For now the best I can do is apply a seal to restrict it. Personally I don't think it would be wise for Sasuke to continue with the exams, but I'll leave that between you and Kakashi to decide. The blonde says as Fugaku steps forward, unwrapping the black object on the desk and effortlessly slicing a piece of it away with his tanto. Seal it. Right now. And those sound ninja do not leave this village before I've gotten my hands on them. The Achiha Patriarch firmly says before turning and swiftly exiting the room, slamming the door on his way out. With Menma, his fist swings into the wall of the room he's currently occupying. That bastard. This whole time, he hasn't even been trying. He brings the fist down, a spiderweb of cracks having formed from it, his eyes shadowed by his black and red locks, breathing heavy. His head lifts, set eyes glowing crimson red with slitted pupils. But Kakashi. I'm telling you Kakashi. Those three are as certain to get promoted as Guy boisterously declares, as the two make their way through the crowded square under the night sky. MHMH Kakashi nonchalantly replies, eyes glued to his book. Dust you wait until you see them in action. The guy doesn't finish his sentence as he sees Kakashi come to a stop, turning his head. Kakashi feels a hand on his shoulder, turning to see his teacher standing before him. Minato sensei Kakashi greets the elder shinobi showing a small smile. He's still amazed by how little the man has aged. Lord Fourth. Guy greets, beaming, excited murmurs spreading through the crowded square as more people take notice of their leader. I, I'm gonna need to borrow Kakashi for the rest of the night, he says before the small smile on his face is replaced by a more stern expression as he turns his head to his student. We have a problem Minato says before his head turns as howls echo in the distance, clearly audible even in the crowded square. Fugaku. Old Ichiha clan compound, abandoned. Fugaku steps over another old stretch of police tape, emitting another shrill whistle that echoes out through the woods before him, the howls growing closer. A pair of eyes glows dimly in the shadows as growls become audible. He spots the glint of fangs in the dark as a large wolf, slightly taller than even the man himself, emerges from the darkness, more of them following. The animal comes to stand right in front of him. He produces the piece of flesh he'd taken earlier, allowing the canine in front of him a few sniffs before tossing it to the rest of the pack, who proceed to jostle and wrestle one another for it. The Ichiha male looks the creature in the eye, Onyx eyes meeting golden. Behind him, he simply says. The wolf emits a growl, nodding his head in acknowledgement. 
he raises his head emitting a loud howl, his peers, immediately ceasing their jostling, joining in to form a symphony of howls, more emerging from deeper within the forest behind them, and even from outside the village walls. The creature bolts away back into the forest, its pack following, barks ringing out. Gugaku is left standing alone. Suddenly a cacophony of screeches bursts out as the male seemingly disintegrates into a horde of bats who take flight into the night sky, following the pack of hunters just dispatched. Three days later, Naruto's temporary quarters. Naruto stands up from his sitting position on the windowsill, headband in hand. He looks down at the object for a moment. What meaning does it hold for you? You're better than that aren't you Naruto? But the momentary frown, he tucks it away and makes his way toward the door. The second exam has officially ended and now he's to find out about the next round. He hasn't seen his teammate since they dragged him to the infirmary. Battle arena. That is the true purpose of the exams Minato concludes explaining, Anko to his right, the remaining participants, save for one, before him and their respective Jonin senseis also present, except for one as well. Now, with that out of he is interrupted by the sound of the double door entrance to the room opening. All heads turn to see the blonde from the written exam walk in. He watches his son walk in, not having seen him since they spoke in the infirmary days ago. He'd wanted the chance to ask him for more details, but the boy had been nowhere to be found as usual. A feeling of pride fills him as he watches him walk in. Sasuke lays eyes on Naruto for the first time since that day. Not a single visible injury. Naruto walks into the large room, raised platforms connected to steel staircases on either side, a large pair of concrete hands, performing the ram seal on the far side of the room, and a large electronic screen not far from it. The genin stand gathered in the center of the room, the Hokage and exam proctor before them. Their jonin sensei are also present, though he takes note his own is missing. He ignores the looks of apprehension and few glares he receives, coming to stand next to his own teammates. Ino smiles and nods in acknowledgement, and he nods back while Satsuki doesn't make eye contact. He turns his head to the Hokage who shows a smile before continuing to speak. Now in light of the fact that more participants have advanced from the second exam than anticipated, there will be a preliminary round of one-on-one -on -one battles, the winners of which will advance to the third and final round of the exams. Matchups are selected at random, presenting the possibility of facing your teammates. From this moment onwards your progression will be solely dependent on your own efforts the blonde shinobi speaks, the eyes of many of the cadets darting. Let's not waste any more time. Silence hangs over the room as the participants stand on the raised platforms, along with the present jonin sensei, eyes glued to the large and darkened electronic screen. Naruto's teammates stand to his left. Official business, that's all your dad told us Ino had said to him when he'd asked why their sensei isn't present. There's no doubt in his mind Fugaku's endeavored to go hunting for Orochimaru himself. Potentially, and unsurprisingly, against the Hokage's wishes as well. Tsutsuki stares ahead, Ino every so often glancing at her and their blonde teammate. Flashback, Sasuke is still as sister clutches onto him, his arms around her as well, her body shaking with sobs. It's okay, Tsutsuki, I'm alright. He reassures as she continues to sob. She lifts her head to look him in the eyes. I was so scared. She confides, the boy's eyebrows rising slightly at the uncharacteristic expression of vulnerability. I was too. He confesses, an expression of surprise coming on Satsuki's own face now. If anything had happened to her, he doesn't know what he would have done. Your teammate. The one who saved your life, he may have saved mine too, Sasuke reveals, the Kanoichi gasping lowly at the revelation. Then Naruto. The male Ichiha nods his head in confirmation. He continues to gaze at her as she seemingly takes the information in. He won't mention a word about this thing on his neck to her, and if his mother finds out, it won't be from him either. Naruto Satsuki voices internally to herself. The blonde had done exactly what he'd endeavored to do again. Saved both her and Ino and her brother as well. In truth her fear had not just been for Sasuke if she's honest with herself. She had been terrified for him as well. The thought of something happening to both him and her brother. Flashback ends. Sasuke Ichiha v Yoroi Akado the exam proctor calls out as the flashing screen of names, freezes to reveal the first two combatants, eyes darting in the room to the two leaf genin in question. You're up, jerk, make it quick history jibes to an unresponsive Sasuke as he makes his way down. He never would have refused to fight, but at least he knows he isn't against Naruto. As much as it annoys him to admit, that's probably the one participant in the room he isn't ready for yet. Unless absolutely necessary, don't use your Sharingan in the next round Kakashi's warning echoes in his mind as he makes his way down the steps. Minato watches on from his seat as Hugaku's son makes his way down to the arena floor. I just hope Kakashi's sure about this. He'd applied a restrictive seal to the curse mark and the boy had about three days to rest and replenish his strength. Hopefully it'll be enough to avoid any major problems. 
the gentleman dressed in the standard attire of his rank with short brown hair and dark colored eyes with bags beneath them, stands between the two shinobi as they come to stand across from one another. He heaves a few hoarse coughs before speaking. I am Hei Jeko, proctor for the preliminary round of these Chunin exams he utters before coughing once more. The two of you will be the first combatants of this round. Are there any objections? He questions. He is met with silence as the two stare one another down. Very well, then. Begin. He announces jumping back as Yoroi springs towards Sasuke, swinging a kunai in his left hand. He lashes, swinging the ninja tool at the rookie who evades repeatedly. Naruto watches on at Satsuki's brother, evading the swings from the elder leaf ninja. He expects the Ichiha to win. Now to see how long it takes him. He ducks under another chop, swinging a fist into the older Genin's stomach, sending him back, aiming a kick to the chest that sends him onto his back, Sasuke sprinting towards him to finish the job. The older Genin suddenly jumps back up, right hand glowing a blue hue as the Ichiha's face comes within inches. Sasuke's eyes widen, flashing a crimson color as his face comes inches away from the older Genin's hand. Ugg Yorway calls out as the boy sidesteps his hand by inches, swinging a fist into his face. How the hell did he dodge that? A kick meets his chin sending him flying into the air. As he twists helplessly, he gasps as suddenly the Ichiha is behind him. Hey that's it. Lee exclaims as he sees the Ichiha behind his opponent in midair, Guy narrowing his eyes and glancing at Kakashi who watches on. Yoroi tries to swing an elbow, Sasuke evading this too, and swinging a barrage of fists into the older Genin's body, before swinging a roundhouse kick into the boy's stomach, sending him crashing into the ground. He lands on his feet, the proctor approaching his downed opponent and checking on him. Winner. Sasuke Ichiha he declares as the boy lays unconscious. Way to go Sasuke. Sakura exclaims while Shikamaru rolls his eyes. Barely used his Sharingan either. What a cocky one, that Ichiha he inwardly voices nonchalantly, as the fellow Leaf Rookie makes his way back to his team. The dancing Leaf Shadow, Kakashi Guy says, turning his head to his old comrade, eyes narrowed. Don't look at me. I didn't teach him that the mask Jonin responds plainly. He's gotten faster he observes. You've advanced to the finals, then Hei congratulates him. Elsewhere, oh yeah, that's the stuff. Giggles. The white-haired male adjusts his binoculars once more, attempting to get a better view of the sight below him, which he indulges himself with from a tree branch. The screeching sound turns his head to the side of a bird flying towards him, and as he catches the scroll it releases, he tries to keep hold of his binoculars, but loses his balance as a result, tumbling into the fog and water below, emitting a loud splash. Feminine screams ring out as he lifts his head above the water, a fist meeting him square in the face. Perfect. Elsewhere, screeches fill the small cave, on the side of a mountain that towers over the forest below, stretching well into the horizon in every direction. The bats emitting the cacophony fly about circling one another as a shadowy figure materializes from seemingly nowhere between them, the sky above having darkened with rumbling clouds that every so often are bathed in white light. Crimson eyes with a tomo pattern overlook the forest as howls emerge from below. Forest of Death, Central Tower. Fang over Fang Menma's best friend calls out again as he and his partner activate their signature in tandem, twin drills twisting in the air, barreling towards him. Menma weaves through three hand signs, ending with Ram. Lightning style. Lightning beast tracking Fang. Lightning forms in the boy's right hand as his opponents close in on him. He releases, pouncing back, as it shapes into the form of a hound, staying connected to his hand in the form of a cord of the lightning nature chakra. One of the two evades the hound while the other makes direct contact, being struck by it, emitting a howl of pain. Akamaru. Kiba yells, stopping in his tracks, seeing his partner fall to the ground in a twitching unconscious heap. His lapse in concentration however buys his friend more time as he swings the hound of lightning to the right. Kiba tries to evade but is unsuccessful as the current meets his body as well, earning a yell of pain as it stuns his body before releasing it as it dissipates, allowing him to fall to the ground unconscious as well. Menma is already running towards the Inuzuka as his body hits the ground, sliding onto his knees to examine him while the proctor approaches. Sorry old pal, looks like this one's mine he chuckles as medical ninja rush over, following. When her cough Menma Yuzumaki Namaka's head announces before coughing once again, Menma's sisters and mother cheering from above. Minato smiles proudly as he watches his son follow behind the medical ninja as they carry Kiba and Akamaru to the infirmary. Well done Menma, that's Asuke Ichiha, Shikamaru Nara, Shino Aburam, Niji Hayuga, Tamari, as well as Kankuro of the Desert, and now Menma Yuzumaki Namakas who have advanced. Not a bad showing at all for the Leaf. Let the next contest be decided by Hayate orders, like clockwork, the screen flashing the remaining names. The screen freezes. Isateru Hajiwara v Kabuto Yakushi. A small chuckle escapes history, a smirk on his face as he looks across to the other leaf shinobi, his teammates glancing at his reaction as he places a hand on the railing in front of him. Proctor, I forfeit. 
Kabuto shouts while maintaining eye contact with his would-be opponent, earning gasps from a few of those present, Hisateru smirks still in place. Wait what? You're quitting just like that? Why? Ino questions confused. I've seen enough to know the competition here is pretty stiff. On top of that I've already seen one of my teammates fall to a member of his squad. I'll be frank. I just don't feel confident going up against him Kabuto states frankly, Sasuke frowning at the reasoning. This is the same guy who admitted to failing the exam several times and he's quitting just like that. Just what is up here exactly? Very well then. The winner by forfeit is Hisateru Hajiwara Hei declares, raising his hand and gesturing to the boy who scoffs lightly. Well that's just boring he snorts. He looks to his side to see the jerk with an expression of suspicion on his face and Kaori still looking dejected. She'd lost to the shadow wielding Nara and not because she was weaker either. The screen begins to flash names again before freezing. Toji Akimichi v Satsuki Acha. Oh no Shikamaru groans internally as he turns his head to see his old friend gulp nervously. Sakura has already been eliminated and had lost quite badly at that to the guy with the makeup on. Granted he'd somewhat expected that but one of the Acha twins. Not good. You've got this Choji Asuma encourages with a slap on the back as the Akimichi makes his way down. It's all yours, Satsuki Ino says with a smile as Satsuki takes a look at both her teammates this time, giving them a nod before leaping down to the arena floor. Do you think Choji can win this one? Kurinai asks his teacher. Before he can respond however, Kakashi does so for him. It's a terrible mismatch frankly. If Satsuki is anything like Sasuke and she happens to be pretty similar to my knowledge, then Choji doesn't stand a chance the mask Jonin interjects earning a frown from the Siratobi. Why don't we watch the fight and let them decide? He retorts with the slightest bit of venom to his tone. The two leaf rookies stand across from one another, hey not far from either. Begin. He orders. Choji outstretches his right arm as Satsuki dashes toward him, eyes turning crimson and revealing two tomo that circle and come to a stop on either end of the pupil. Their Sharingans mature to two tomo as well. Yep, this fight is already square Kakashi observes. Even if Choji can match the Ichiha Kinoichi speed, which he can't, her reaction time is another matter altogether. Partial expansion jutsu. Akimichi calls out as his hand, having expanded to be exponentially larger than his own body, swings down to smack the Achiha against the ground, only for her to easily evade. A flying kick to the chest sends him sailing back, the boy quickly using his hand to regain his balance by digging it into the earth. She's fast. He takes another swing, followed by two more, Satsuki effortlessly avoiding all three while weaving through a set of hand signs. Higher style. Phoenix Flower she exclaims, launching several fist-sized projectiles of flame at the Akimichi who holds his hand up to block them, grunting at the pain of the burns on the palm of his hand. He lowers his hand to see more projectiles incoming, these being made of steel however. He swats the shuriken away easily, but grunts as he suddenly feels himself being rooted to the spot, unable to maneuver freely. Only now does he spot the glint of ninja wire all over his arm, the girl pulling. You're gonna tug a war with me? Big mistake. He shouts with a smile. With one tremendous pull, he sends the Achiha flying through the air with a pull of his giant hand, as his own body exponentiates in size, ballooning as he seemingly cannonballs toward her. Human boulder. Tsutsuki weaves the last hand sign of her signature technique, which has worked perfectly. Fire style. Fireball she says, sending a similarly large if not larger cannonball of fire, careening towards the incoming genin. The two collide, a blood-curdling yell, coming from the boy as he goes flying back, parts of his clothing alight. As he hits the ground in a still heap, medical shinobi sprint over, weaving hand signs, quickly dousing the flames with C-rank water and examining the boy. Eight comes to stand over him, glancing over for a few seconds before gesturing to the Acheha. Winner Satsuki Acheha he declares. Shikamaru sighs, pinching the bridge of his nose. He went flying straight into that one. As soon as Joji had made eye contact with the Acheha, he'd already made a big mistake. He steps off to make his way down to the arena floor to follow his friend to the infirmary. She is impressive. Kurinai notes trying not to smile and be a little more sympathetic towards Asuma who has a frown on his face. I could have told you that was gonna happen. Oh wait. Kakashi says jokingly, the Saratobi gritting his teeth in frustration and walking off in a huff, following after Shikamaru to check on Choji. All of his students have already fraud anyway, so there isn't much else to see. The screen flashes the remaining six names once again before freezing on two. Mido Yuzumaki Namak is Vyeo Yuzumaki Namak is the proctor calls, gasps ringing across the room. The two combatants, who happen to be standing side by side, turn their heads to one another, faces etched in disbelief. Naruto watches on nonchalantly. He doesn't like how this is unfolding. He couldn't care less about the two who are about to fight, but the way this is going either he or Ino could end up against a retied San Shinobi. Frankly he'd much rather it be him if it comes to it. 
R watches from the platform on the other side of the room with a small smile on his face, chills running down to Mari's spine when she sees it. With just a bit more luck, he'll get exactly who he wants. If every drop of yourself down there. I won't accept any less Mito says, a smirk forming on her face. The uncertainty on her sister's face shifts to a determined smile as she responds. The same goes for you, tomato head she gripes with the old nickname before the two leap down to the arena floor to stand across from one another. Your sisters got drawn together, Naruto. Who do you think is gonna win? Ino asks turning her head to the blonde who watches on, showing no emotional investment whatsoever. It doesn't matter. He responds, resisting the urge to correct her wording. That's the least of my concerns right now he speaks, eyes narrowed, Ino frowning in thought at his response. Let the contest. Begin. Hey coughs, signaling. A cloud of smoke bursts from Mito's hands, revealing a katana as Yeoi sprints toward her with a kunai in hand. Sparks fly as a flurry of blows is exchanged, the two shifting and moving across the arena floor in a dance of combat. Lenato watches on from above intently. Infirmary, you got lucky, Chum Kiba snorts with derision at his friend, Akamara now in his lap. Next time, you won't be, I'm telling ya, he gripes with his partner barking in agreement, his red and dark-haired comrade smiling at him. I'm looking forward to it, he replies. Lucky you, Menma, you get to fight in the final round, a heavily bandaged Choji laying in the bed next to Kiba's moans, his sensei and teammates with him. Don't get me started, Choji. This guy's got a big enough head already. Can you imagine how unbearable he'll be if he makes Shunin? Kiba moans as Menma's smirk grows. So who do you want to fight anyway Kiba asks, Menma's face shifting grin. You know exactly who I want. He better win his fight too Menma replies cracking his knuckles. I'll have to ask you to give those two some time to rest now voice says, heads turning to see Shizun standing in the doorway. Sure thing doc, come on kids. We'll see these two later Asuma orders, Shikamaru and Sakura making their way towards the door, Menma exchanging a fist bump with Kiba before standing and following alongside Asuma. Battle arena. Water style. Water bullet jutsu. The two call out simultaneously, projectiles colliding and cancelling one another out, as the two sprint towards each other, Mido swinging her katana at her opponent who blocks it with a kunai, the two attempting to push and overpower one another. Yeoi takes advantage of the moment, swinging the duel to the side, releasing her kunai, Mido losing grip of her katana, the weapon flying to the side. She attempts to give chase only for her opponent to grab her by the ponytail, tossing her back, following up with an uppercut and stomach shot that sends her into the ground. As she tries to deal the finishing blow from above however, she reels back in pain, clutching her chest as her opponent swings a set of claws across her chest. She looks down at the marks on her chest to see four slashes running across it, looking back up to see her sister's eyes now crimson red with slits for pupils. She knows she can't match my physical strength and base, so she's taken it up a notch. Well two can play that game. Aoi's own eye color shifts, a set of claws emerging as the two sprint towards each other, exchanging more blows as a red aura begins to emerge with each blow, the onlookers observing, some anxiously. Is that chakra? Visible to the naked eye. Is it not supposed to be blue? Lee questions, Niji narrowing his eyes. Their chakra. Ino marvels the only thing I've ever felt that could compare to this is. Glancing at the blonde male by her side. Mito. Is this how strong you really are? Satsuki ponders, clenching her fists. So that's the Nine Tails chakra, huh? Gonna wanna get a good close look at this as history says to himself. With Menma, Menma's eyes are wide as he walks back into the battle arena alongside Asuma Sensei to see his sisters engaged in a brutal tojutsu exchange, air visibly shifting, cracks forming in parts of the floor as red colored chakra boils to the surface. Mito, Yaoi. You got drawn against each other. Damn it. He curses. He'd known it was possible for one of them to get drawn against the other, but didn't think or hope it would actually happen. With Mido and Yeoi. Mido backflips as Yeoi swings a fist into the spot she stood on that leaves a crater-shaped spider web of cracks. She swings again, leaving another one, Mido now on the back foot. The Nine Tails Chakra helps me move faster, but it's multiplying that strength of hers too. And she won't let me get to my sword either Mido notes glancing to the blade on the far side of the room. She smirks, not being able to help being proud of her sister. Turning this into a fist fight benefits her. I only have one chance of winning this. She bolts towards the sword, Yeoi deducting her intentions quickly. No, you don't. She yells, swinging another almighty fist that Mito jumps back from, right hand out. Ikoi successful. A single chain of glowing golden color springs from the Kanoichi's palm to wrap around Yeoi, pinning her arms against her sides, eyes wide in shock. No way. Impossible. This is. With Menma, that's mom's technique. Mito. Menma exclaims in disbelief himself. Lady Kashina's adamantine ceiling chains. Well what did you know? I never would have guessed one of you had them, Asuma adds. What a fight this is. Some genin these are. With Kakashi, Lady Kashina. 
Nido inherited your Kakashi speaks, turning his head to the older Jonin. I'd suspected it might be the case for a while, but my suspicions were only confirmed much more recently. Her Yuzumaki blood runs strong Kashina responds with a small smile that only holds for a second before the firm look of concentration on the fight is back in place. But Mido and Yeoi. Your Nine Tails chakra is useless against these restraints. Forfeit now, Yeoi Mido commands. You'll catch up to Mido in no time, you'll be as good as your sister someday, you'll be better someday Yeoi, I know it. Yeoi struggles against the chain wrapped around from her upper arms down to her wrists, infusing more of the red chakra, cracks forming in the ground beneath her, as she releases an almighty yell that reverberates against the walls, shaking them, desperately trying to break the restraints, to no avail. Don't insult me. Finish the fight like a real Kinoichi. Yeoi fires back. Mido takes a glance at the proctor who says nothing before looking back at her opponent and taking a deep breath before pulling on the chain, sending her sister flying towards her, fist cocked back. She swings it forward, making contact square in the face, sending the blonde genin onto her back in an incapacitated heap. The chain releases as it winds around Yeoi's body to retract back in Mido's hand who falls onto one knee above her sister. That was intense. Winner. Mido Yuzumaki Namaka's hey declares as Mido looks up to see her mother standing over her with her brother running towards them from the other end of the room, medical ninja following. Look at you learning fast she teases with a smile while bending over to tend to an unconscious yaoi. Lady Kashina, please allow us one medical ninja says, Kashina complying but following closely behind as they stretcher her off, Menma helping along Mido as they follow. Minato remains in his seat, despite wanting to follow, having to be present for the remaining two battles. There are four combatants remaining, meaning the next fight will automatically decide the one that follows Hayde announces as the screen flashes between the remaining four names. Ara of the Desert, Rock Lee, Ino Yamanaka, Naruto Yuzumaki Namikas, Lee watches on intently, Naruto nonchalantly, Gar retains a coldly blank demeanor, while Ino looks on nervously. The screen continues to flash. And then freezes. Naruto Yuzumaki Namikas v Rock Lee. Hayde calls out. Shit. Naruto curses, not for his opponent but his teammate. This is bad. He'll have to talk to her immediately after his fight. We need to talk after I'm done with this, he says turning his head to her, earning a quizzical look from her before she nods. Good luck, she assures smiling, Satsuki giving him a nod as well. Both of them would be shocked if any of the genin in this room could beat Naruto. Fortune may exist after all. Lee shouts, fire burning in his eyes precisely the battle I've been begging and waiting for. He shouts. Let's rock and roll. The time has finally come for the young youthful hurricane of the leaf to showcase himself. Guy exclaims, chest out as Lee begins stretching and striking to jutsu stances. Alrighty Lee, your moment has come. Save the very best for second last is how the saying goes after all he exclaims, as Jonin peers sweat dropping. He places his arm around his student's neck. Now Lee, that's the son of the Hokage. From what I've heard, he isn't as gifted as his siblings, but he is still a child of the fourth himself, so don't dare underestimate him. Go out there and show them all why you're gonna be a chunin. He exclaims. Yes, Guy sensei. I will not fail you. He exclaims with as much fervor, saluting his teacher, a starry eyed look of admiration written in said eyes. I know you want my boy. Guy responds, tears leaving his eyes, as they do Lee's, the two clutching on to each other, all present watching sweat dropping at the scene, including Naruto who is watching from below, having already jumped off the platform. Lee Niji says sternly, earning the attention of both who turn their heads to him. I already told you, didn't I? The Hayuga speaks, eyes glued to the blonde in black below. He's only a rookie genin by name. He's far more dangerous than that. Don't you dare underestimate him. Even for a second he orders, earning an expression of intrigue from Guy, while Tenten looks on nervously. Don't worry Niji, I have no intention of doing so he responds, flashing a big smile and holding a thumb up, I will give it my all. So that you and I can meet in the finals like we are supposed to. He declares, earning no response from the Hayuga. Naruto watches on as his opponent finally jumps down from the opposite platform to stand across from him. Naruto Yuzumaki Namikas. The pleasure is all mine. I've been hoping for this since I first saw you. The boy in green acknowledges with passion burning in his eyes, Naruto nonchalantly staring back. But Team 7, except Yaoi, Ashina, Menma and Mido return to the room just in time to see Lee standing across from Naruto, waiting for the fight to commence. Oh Naruto. You've got this sweetie Kashina cheers on an unresponsive Naruto, while Menma frowns and Mido watches on intently, eager to see her brother finally in action. Minato sits in anticipation. Finally, he'll get to see Naruto fight in person. Let's see what you've been telling me about Fugaku. Let the battle. Begin. Hey, it orders. Lee sprints towards Naruto, swinging a roundhouse kick that he blocks before grabbing him by the ankle and tossing him away like a rag doll. The boy skids and rolls, springing back to his feet and charging again. 
He swings a flurry of fists and kicks that Naruto parries away before swinging a fist of his own into the boy's stomach that catches him off guard, his eyes wide at the strength and a right hand to the side of the face that sends him stumbling back. But Sasuke. Sasuke watches, through clenched teeth and bald fists, as Naruto effortlessly swats away the same opponent who had ragdolled him earlier. This guy. Is on a different level entirely. Hayori watches on with intrigue, history alongside her doing the same. Well, what did you know? I may have found somebody interesting. But Naruto and Lee. Your Tujutsu is impressive. I've never seen that style before Lee notes. Of course not. It isn't of the leaf like yours. I would highly recommend taking those weights of yours offer at the very least using some ninjutsu Naruto says plainly earning a gasp from the boy. I can't be certain of how long it'll be before I start getting bored. H how did why he stutters. Your movements are clearly too labored for someone of your tujutsu proficiency. It looks abnormal, Naruto explains. Lee grunts, the boy in green backwards cartwheeling several times before taking a giant leap to stand atop the two hands that form the ram seal at the far end of the room. Lee. His teacher calls him to earn the boy's attention. It's okay. Take him off the jonin commands with a thumb up. But Guy sensei, you said only to take them off if the lives of important people were in danger. It's alright. I'll allow it. Now do it, Guy commands with a smile. The boy complies, tucking his hands beneath his orange leg warmers and pulling an identical set of weights from beneath them, holding them out on either side of himself. He releases his grip allowing them to fall from the height of the statue to the floor below. How is dropping a couple of pounds supposed to help him match and Satsuki's train of thought is brought to a grinding halt as the weights hit the ground, shooting twin plumes of debris that tower to the ceiling of the room as they impact the ground to form crater-sized spider web cracks, gasps echoing throughout the room. Naruto's eyebrows rise slightly at the display, a small smirk forming on his face as excitement dances in his eyes. Now we're talking. A genin clad in green springs from atop the ram seal locked hands, bolting back down to the ground. He bolts back and forth around his opponent, almost a blur to the naked eye, onlookers watching in disbelief at the display of speed. This is how fast he really is. Insane Sasuke marvels. Lee swings a fist from behind the blonde, intent on launching him forwards, only for him to spin around, catching it in his right hand. A collective gasp fills the room. I am possible Lee utters in disbelief. A genin who can react to him with his weights off. W what? How guy marvels. I said it in a matter of fact tone. Lee swings another fist that Naruto parries as the two begin a fierce exchange, Naruto swinging a punch that Lee himself parries before swinging a kick at Naruto's side steps. The two move about the room, at moments looking like blurs, cancelling each other's strikes out, one after the other. How is he even with Lee's tojutsu? That doesn't make any sense. Tenten exclaims is he the same? She questions. No, Satsuki answers Naruto's holding back by quite a bit. He hasn't used any of his ninjutsu at all so far. Why? She questions turning ahead. Because, Naruto grabs the boy's arm and swings a right and left fist into his face. A kick to the face sends him stumbling back only for him to launch himself forward with a vicious headbutt that sends the boy in green onto his back. He's enjoying himself, enjoying attendant questions in confusion. Combat of any kind, even mortal combat. Naruto considers it a sport Satsuki response to the other gen in exchanging looks of shock, Kakashi's lone eye narrowing. Lee sits up to see the blonde standing, sporting a good few bruises like himself, a smirk in place with blood leaking from his mouth. Don't get me wrong, this is fun, but I meant what I said. If you don't start using your ninjutsu, you will lose, he says in a matter-of-fact tone. Lenato sits back, watching on in shock. This is what his son has been hiding for so long. Why? How? Naruto's tojutsu is levels above that of even his siblings. And he's not used any ninjutsu yet. Well? Naruto questions as the boy in green rises to his feet. He begins to unwrap the tape on one of his hands. Then all of a sudden he springs forward, Naruto at the ready only for the opponent to begin sprinting in circles around him. Just what are you planning? Naruto questions himself. Suddenly he finds himself flying into the air as a kick to the chin launches him. His speed exponentiated all of a sudden. What was that? He muses, shocked. A fist comes, followed by another, a flurry of blows meeting Naruto's body, sending him further into the air. The boy in green grabs him, and the combat tape hanging from his arm finds itself around Naruto's body restraining him as his opponent flips him upside down, the two twisting and turning in the air, barreling towards the ground. Primary Lotus. He yells. As they approach the ground however Naruto infuses wind-style chakra, releasing it in a burst from his body, shredding the combat tape and sending his opponent flying, with a yell, as the wind-style chakra inflicts several cuts. The force of the wind cushions Naruto's landing while Lee hits the ground with an unceremonious thud. The lotus failed. What was that? Guy exclaims in disbelief. A wind-style change in chakra nature, coupled with a change in chakra form like that. I haven't seen that kind of control before. 
this kid Kakashi notes watching on. That was a wind style change in chakra nature. Tamari examines. He's a wind style user. Aki narrows his eyes in intrigue. He knows how rare that affinity is, even in his own land. So he's a wind style user, huh? Let's see what else he can do. Lee groans, clutching at his arms, covered in cuts along with his torso. He rolls onto his stomach, getting onto his knees, the pain of the lotus weighing on his body as well. My primary lotus failed. How? Well Naruto speaks weaving through hand signs I did warn you he says as the boy drags himself back on his feet. Wind style. Wind orb barrage. He yells, firing several fist-sized projectiles of wind at the boy, colliding with his body, earning several yells of pain as he is sent flying again. Unfortunately, you can't hope to beat someone like Naruto with just Tejutsu. Satsuki notes, Guy is simply smirking to himself. And to think Sasuke says to himself thinking back to the scene from the forest days ago that he's still holding back. Lee groans in pain, his clothes now covered in large orb-shaped holes from which he is bleeding as he attempts once again to drag himself to his feet, his body screaming against him. Naruto takes a few steps forward, watching on. His respect for this guy is growing by the minute. I think I understand now he says as the boy lifts his head on his knees. You can't use ninjutsu or at all can you? He surmises as Lee slowly lifts himself off of his knees. Naruto watches as he rises to stare him down defiantly. Well, I've gotta say, you deserve your respect he says, earning a low gasp and wide eyes from the boy. You're a real shinobi, but if what I've gathered really is the case, then unfortunately you're definitely not winning this, he says with finality weaving through the same set of hand signs from before. Wind style. Wind orb barrage. He exclaims again, releasing a flurry of projectiles that barrel towards his opponent. Just as they close in however, the older genin once again moves at blurred motion to dodge them all, the projectiles colliding with the far wall, leaving small craters in them. Naruto's eyebrows rise. He can still move at that speed. The older genin comes to a stop, a few feet closer to the blonde. I thank you for your acknowledgement Lee responds, but I will not lose. He declares, lowering his head, arms crossed in an X gesture. To hone your tojutsu to this level and still be able to wield ninjutsu, elemental ninjutsu at that, you are truly a genius, Naruto. And that Lee speaks as the air about him begins to visibly shift. Is precisely why we are not the same. He roars as an explosion of chakra leaves his body, visible around his body. Their gate. Gate of life open. He roars, his chakra visibly swirling around him as a green aura glows as well, Naruto watching on with intrigue as debris rises around the boy. So there's more huh? He quizzes. Fourth gate. Gate of pain open. More debris rises, cracks forming in the ground as the boy's skin begins to turn a red hue, veins bulging against his skin as if threatening to burst. The arena floor is split, debris rising as the boy suddenly disappears and Naruto finds himself flying into the air, a kick to the chin launching him. The force generated by the older genin speed is sufficient enough to generate wind and debris that momentarily blinds all in the room, except those deploying visuals. Naruto finds himself flying back down to the ground, struck by an almighty fist, followed by another and another, as the boy moves about him as a blur, launching him back and forth with fist and kick after fist and kick. I've no time to weave even a single sign. How is he moving this fast? I should have pounced on him when I had the chance Naruto says to himself, smirking as he is knocked back and forth. Naruto. Satsuki, Ino, Kishina and Mito all cry in unison. Minato looks on in clear concern and fear as well, every fiber of his being screaming at him to jump in and stop the fight, but knowing Naruto could hate his guts for it. He may very well be a skilled ninjutsu user, but that doesn't matter against someone he can't weave signs against, Guy says smiling. Menma watches on and on disbelief, fists clenched. This is insane. No way is he even near this level yet. Naruto's body impacts with the ground, a spiderweb-shaped crater of cracks forming from the collision, as he stares up to see his opponent descending upon him, a more concentrated blue aura beginning to surround him. Now to end it, fifth gate. Gate of closing open. He exclaims cocking a last fist back, seeing the smirk on Naruto's face. Inhale, exhale, I said I wouldn't do this but. I guess I lied. Lee swings his fist down on the boy, an explosion ringing throughout the room, dust and debris filling every corner now, coughs audible. Silence hangs as the debris continues to rise and spread, a few moments passing before it begins to dissipate. It's over, it's gotta be Shikamaru says, from the corners of the arena the dust begins to settle. Niji emits a shocked gasp, Kakashi following suit not long after. Three silhouettes, one clearly belonging to the proctor become visible, and soon the dust lifts to reveal the two male genin in the center of the room, the floor beneath them decimated. Lee stands with his fist outstretched, in Naruto's hand, who stands holding it with a wide aura glowing about him, pieces of debris floating around himself now. His one cerulean blue eyes are now a blinding white, the whites and pupils replaced completely by it. And no. T that's not possible guy breathes in disbelief, the hidden lotus have failed. 
The Kashi looks in on similar shock, headband still raised and both eyes wide. There's no way. This chakra. I've never felt anything like it. Fugaku sensei, this is what you spoke about. This child is. Minato's gazes at the scene in disbelief as well. He reacted to the hidden lotus. Naruto. Just what is that chakra? Hashina practically trembles as she watches the scene. When that boy had opened the fifth gate, she'd needed no confirmation it was over. She had just been waiting for the dust to settle to jump in. This chakra. What is this? She questions herself as Mito shakes beside her as well, her daughter having inherited her sensory as well. Benma's mouth hangs open as he looks on. But at the speed Lee was moving at that is impossible. No. Naruto he inwardly utters, clutching his fist so hard his knuckles turn white this is what you're truly capable of. There it is. That ominous chakra that suppressed all the time. This is what it feels like when allowed to surface Shino notes to himself as his insects fly around him. He he's not human Shikamaru whispers hoarsely. Lee's body screams at him, muscles torn, as his opponent stands before him, bloodied and bruised, some of his injuries and wounds visibly healing already. It can't be. No one can defend against a hidden lotus. How? You fraud incredibly, but it's like I said, you were never going to beat me with only Tejutsu he answers in an ominously deep voice. But the nine tails. He defended himself against five of the eight inner gates. And with his own chakra too. Minato, Kashina. You've created quite the monster. And his full potential is far from realized the beast stutters as the flow of the boy's unsurpassed chakra reacts to the seal, wooden tendrils wrapping around him from behind the bars, as he emits a low chuckle that turns into full-on roaring laughter, even as he feels himself restrained further. But Naruto. Naruto's left eye returns to its original color, right still glowing as he wrestles to keep control of himself. Lee's knees buckle as the aura around him finally dissipates, his opponent tossing him away. He skids and rolls before coming to a stop, clearly desperately still trying to muster the strength to get himself back up. It's time to end this. The godly mountain wind. No. That would kill anyone with a direct hit, and he's in no shape to try and dodge. The wind orb barrage again it is then Naruto says to himself weaving through the same signs as the boy drags himself to his knees. He brings his head back as the genin slowly turns himself, throwing it forward and releasing the projectiles once more. Lee releases one cry after another as the compressed bullets of wind chakra strike him, first, second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth, sending him through the air again, onto the concrete with an unceremonious thud. Naruto's right eye returns to its original color as Lee hits the ground, the white aura around him dissipating as the other boy sensei finally jumps down onto the arena floor, Lee still and unmoving. He runs over to the boy examining him. It's over. It's done. Li Yu he doesn't continue as the boy starts moving again, Naruto this time showing genuine shock, as for the umpteenth time, the boy in green drags himself to his feet, bloodied and bruised, holes all over his clothing, the top half hanging on by a few strings, in tatters. Ai begins to shake, tears leaving his eyes as he sees the boy's face, Naruto emitting a low gasp as he sees it too. He's not even conscious. His willpower is the only thing holding him up. What have I done? Forgive me Li. It's okay, you've already proven yourself. You did it, he affirms, wrapping his arms around the boy. This match is over, and the winner is Naruto Uzumaki Namaka's Hei, declares. The words almost don't register to Naruto as he watches on at the scene. You already did it, Naruto. You're already the greatest. Because you're my student, son Akasada assures ruffling the blonde's head. Naruto's blonde locks shadow his eyes as medical ninja rush over to stretcher the boy away. He turns and begins to walk away, back to his team only to see them running towards him. Naruto. They shout in unison, embracing him. I'm fine he assures as they examine him. I knew you couldn't lose. Ino exclaims, Satsuki nodding in agreement. The time has come for the final preliminary battle to take place. The proctor interjects. Ino clenches a fist and takes a look up at the redhead sand ninja, who disappears in a cloud of sand and reappears on the arena floor. Ino Naruto says earning her attention, ignoring the irritating medics trying to get his attention you have to forfeit, what? She questions in shock. I said you have to forfeit the fight, right now, you're not gonna beat him he says, the Yamanaka's head lowering. You don't believe in me huh? No, that's not it, he responded. I told Satsuki the same thing before the first exam. That guy is dangerous. He's not just a ninja. You're not going to beat him. Your life will be in danger. He warns firmly. Maybe it will. But I won't be the only one out of the three of us who quit. It's not happening. It's about time I showed you too, you know, he tries to sternly interject only to be cut off himself. Sir, please allow us to treat why one of the medical ninja interrupts with a hand on the shoulder only for Naruto to turn, eyes flashing blinding white, the male lifting his hand shivering. Don't touch me again. He warns in a low and venomously deep tone before turning back. Listen to me for once damn it. You're not just fighting him. Don't do this. Naruto shouts, visibly becoming angry in a rare sight. 
I've already made my decision, she says firmly. Naruto turns his head to Satsuki who looks on, not knowing at all what to say. Naruto swiftly turns and marches his way toward the exit, medical ninja following. He'll be damned if he sticks around to watch this. Elsewhere, the horde of bats converge to form a silhouette once again that shapes itself into a man. Fugaku steps forward, the pack standing in a semicircle at what appears to be the entrance to a cave. He steps into the semicircle turning his head to the alpha who gives him a nod. He seemingly disintegrates into the horde again, who fly into the cave, the pack following. The masked ninja bows on one knee before the large glass cylinder of green liquid, wires connected to it from above and below, a myriad of buttons and levers not far from the cylinder. Inside it, a pale man with long black hair, apparently missing a right arm with a huge wound in his side floats. A visor rests over his face, connected to an oxygen tank. Are you certain? He questions. Yes, my lord. The intruder is dressed in standard leaf jonin attire with the Achiha clan crest on his back. He clearly came with no intention of disguising himself the masked ninja responds. The man emits a dark chuckle at the words. Well, well. Good old wicked Fugaku. I expected you to come for me but not this soon. Not wasting any time huh? Send him a welcoming party. Make sure his body gets to me in good condition. He orders. Yes Lord Orochimaru the shinobi bows for a final time before standing and leaving. He knows they won't stop him, not a chance. But Ino Vigara, Ino stands across from her opponent, awaiting the proctor commencement. Let the final battle of the preliminary rounds begin. Hayate orders. She sprints toward her opponent who stands still, arms crossed, serving to only enrage her. She swings a fist at his face only for something to block her strike. Sand. She observes as it spills from the gourd on his back. She swings more punches and kicks, none making contact. Suddenly a tendril wraps around her wrist, swinging her into the air and ragdolling her away. She skids and rolls across the ground jumping to her feet while producing kunai wriggled with explosives. She tosses them all simultaneously, the projectiles embedding themselves in the sand before shaking the room as they detonate. She stands back awaiting the dust to settle, and as it does, it lifts to reveal the sand shield still intact, its owner standing still, unscathed. So it's that durable. She runs a few steps closer before weaving through a set of hand signs. Water style. Water bullet jutsu she launches the projectiles, sending them crashing into the shield. Her opponent still hasn't moved. What a shame. You're just hopeless, aren't you? They should have given me the other one Gara says nonchalantly, arms still crossed. Ino grits her teeth at the dig. She produces a scroll, unwrapping it, a cloud of smoke bursting as large amounts of water spill from the scroll, covering the floor. Water style. Wild water wave she calls as the water rises and collides with the sand shield. She repeats the technique, two times more. What is she doing? Tamari laughs to herself that's not gonna work, Ino, having used them about five times now, is breathing heavily, but she resists the urge to smirk as she sees the sand shield now a brown color. She sprints forward weaving through hand signs before a cloud of smoke produces a fume shuriken. She tosses it towards the opponent, the shield blocking it and forcing it aside again as she swings a punch of her own. Enough of this nonsense, Gara says with finality as the sand grabs the girl and smacks her against a water submerged ground with a thud, only for her to explode into water. A burst of smoke comes from the shuriken, the blonde emerging from it and smacking both hands down onto the ground before her. Too bad you didn't get to see this one yourself Higaku sensei earth style. Stone javelin she shouts. A spear of rock explodes out the ground at odd angles, shooting towards the redhead. The sand rises up to block, but the moisture that has robbed it of its compactness allows the stone projectile to burst through, penetrating the opponent's shoulder as he turns. Ino watches as the boy's top turns red, pieces of sand seemingly crumbling from the point of entry. Is that some kind of armor? She sees the look of horror on his face before he emits a blood-curdling scream. But Naruto. Naruto stands in front of a conscious and heavily bandaged Lee with Guy, Niji and Tenten on the other side of the bed. He stares at him, clearly still having a hard time processing the outcome of their battle. Tears are visible in the boy's eyes. I cannot claim to be happy with the outcome of our battle, but. I am happy to have had the chance to face you. You are a truly splendid shinobi, a genius. I would love the opportunity to face you again, Lee says, extending his hand. Naruto looks at the hand for a moment before accepting and shaking to Lee's surprise. Sure, why not? I don't know many people who can get me sweating the way you did. Naruto responds, Lee smiling at him while Guy chuckles a bit. See you around then Naruto says plainly, not sparing the other three a glance as he attempts to leave the room. Wait, Naruto he calls bringing the boy to a standstill I have a question. He turns his head waiting to hear what the older genin has to say. What makes you strong? By that I mean what is it that drives you to fight? To become stronger? Why do you do it? Silence hangs over the room for a moment. I fight to become stronger because. It's the only sense of self I have left. Everything and everyone I ever knew forsook me. 
Strength is the only identity I have, he responds, earning surprised looks from Lee and Tenton, while Niji and Guy narrow their eyes in thought. But is that truly ever enough? I was taught one can only truly become strong when he fights for those important to him. So is that enough? It's enough for me, he responds plainly. Back in the forest. Sasuke told us how you fought a perilous enemy to protect Satsuki with your life. So is it really enough? Lee questions further, Naruto's eyebrows rising slightly as he's left speechless for a few moments. I don't know he concedes. You know. She's still down there against that. See you around he says marching out of the room without another word. Unbeknownst to all in the room, Yeoi lays awake a few beds away, having overheard the entire conversation, tears stinging her eyes from Naruto's words. Big brother, elsewhere, cries out ring as the dozens of shinobi flail desperately and helplessly, hordes of bats filling the passageways, assaulting their ears with a cacophony of screeches. Yugaku walks through the passageways his companions follow him as the sound ninja stumble about screaming, rendering them helpless as he walks right past them as though invisible. But Garabi Ino, Ino yells in pain as a tendril of sand smacks her into the ground repeatedly, while the opponent still screams, the javelin still jutting through his shoulder. She thought his sand, now wet, could be evaded, only to find he could turn his gourd into the substance as well. Up, slam, up, slam, up, slam, she lays against the ground, now bleeding heavily as the boy's screams still ring out. Ara clutches at the object embedded in his shoulder as some of the sand that compassed his gourd crushes it, though a sizable portion remains in him. He clutches at his head as one of his eyes flashes a golden color. Damn it. She made him angry, this is bad. Kankuro fearfully speaks, Tenten bearing a similar expression, Baki now also visibly concerned. Ah the sand genin roars as the tendrils of sand creep onto Ino's left leg and arm. He extends his right arm, hand open before balling it in a swift motion. Sand coffin. A blood-curdling scream fills the room with horror as Ino's right arm and leg are crushed. Satsuki swings a fist against the metal railing in front of her, Sharingan eyes tearing up as she watches on. The sand withdraws to reveal the Amanaka's mangled leg and arm. Call it off for fuck's sake. Shikamaru curses furiously. Ara continues to clutch at his head as the voice commands him. No. More. More blood. Yes, mother he grumbles as the sand moves to submerge Ino completely. Shino says to himself, thinking back to what his insects showed him in the forest. Tsutsuki steps over the railing to jump down to the arena floor, having seen enough. Before she hits the ground however the sand is blown away. As her feet hit the ground Naruto stands in front of Ino, eyes flashing white for a moment, as he walks forward to stand a few meters closer to the sand genin. Tsutsuki tends to their teammate meanwhile. E but wy. She failed her questions with confusion. Naruto simply spits a mouthful of blood, left over from his fight, on the ground, the sight sending tingles down Gara's spine, the voice screaming at him, but some unknown force pinning and rooting him to his spot. Just say the word. I'll put you out of your misery in front of all these people Naruto states, eyes cold as ice. Gara looks on at him, confusion mixed with fear in his expression before he begins to chuckle. You can fool the ones behind you. You can fool all these people. But there's no fooling me. I see it in your eyes. You're just like me. Baki, Tamari and Kankuro gasping at his words. You and I are the same. You're the only one here who knows. You're all alone just like I am. Gara chuckles, his chuckle shifting to deranged laughter. Enough. The proctor interjects stepping between the two. The match is over as a result of disqualification, and the winner is Gara of the Desert. The preliminary round is concluded, he announces. Naruto simply gazes at the boy before turning his back and walking towards his teammate, already being lifted onto a stretcher by a medical ninja. Elsewhere, the double steel doors go flying as fire crashes into them, smoke filling the room as canine-like figures trudge in, a man-like silhouette with glowing red eyes, following. Yugaku marches in to be met with the sight of a setup akin to laboratory, machinery and equipment strewn about, with a large empty glass cylinder at the end of the room, large enough to fit a grown man, connected to an oxygen tank. Three large electronic screens line the far wall. The wolves go about searching the room as Yugaku allows himself a good look around. Suddenly static is visible and audible on the screens before three identical clear pictures are visible. A pale man in a cylinder identical to the one a few feet away, wearing an oxygen mask, eyes closed. Arachimaru, Yugaku, it is a pleasure to hear your voice again after so many years. How long has it been? Don't know and don't care he responds pointedly would you leave before we got to speak in person. Are you afraid? Yugaku questions, Arachimaru chuckling in response. Forgive me, but I'm not feeling too well at the moment, as you can see, I can tell. Fugaku says, noting the man's injuries who did the job. He didn't finish it but not too bad if I say so myself. It'll be better when I'm done with you. Another laugh leaves Arachimaru. Believe it or not, a child did this. One of Minato's litter. He's the eldest if I'm not mistaken. 
the one you all revile in that pit you call home he reveals, Fugaku's eyebrows rising before a smirk is on his face. That a boy Naruto he says to himself proudly. Well that's actually partly the reason why I'm here. That child is one of my students. You put your hands on him, my son, my daughter and my other student. Meaning you've signed your own death warrant. You don't need to lose any more sleep about Minato because I'm going to kill you myself, Hugaku says coldly, Orochimaru chuckling for a third time. Deja vu. Is that right? Whatever plans you have for the Sharingan, you won't live to see them. Running after babies because Itachi and I were too much for you to handle. And even now you can't stand to be in the same room with me. How pathetic. One of the so-called legendary three it must be embarrassing the Ichiha leader scoffs. The Sharingan is valuable, dear Fugaku, but I'll have you know I may have found something even better. You take good care of Naruto for me. That boy is going to be very important to the future. You probably already know that though with those eyes of yours. He'll be unlike anything this shinobi world has seen. Until next time Orochimaru says before the screens go dark, leaving Fugaku standing with his growling companions. So Orochimaru's seen it too. Minato won't be happy about this, he sighs, turning to the pack. The lowly vermin knew I was coming. Thanks for all your help. Now get some distance. I'm burning this place to the ground, the Achiha says, eyes still glowing crimson red in the darkness. Preliminary round battle arena. Minato stands before the advanced genin, save for one, and their sensei with Hei by his side. So the finals are set and decided he speaks. Then Kuro of the desert v Shino Aburam, Shikamaru Nara v Tamari of the desert, Niji Hayuga v Hisateru Hajiwara, Mido Yuzumaki Namikaze v Satsuki Achiha, Ara of the desert v Sasuke Achiha, and Menmi Yuzumaki Namikaze v Naruto Yuzumaki Namikaze. All the participants share glances, the tension palpable. The finals will be held in a month's time. You are advised to use this time wisely for training. The preliminaries are concluded. The only sound in the room is Inoichi sobbing. Satsuki is silent, though her eyes are red indicating the same. Minato, Naruto, Menma and Sanadi watch on, all others somberly, Naruto showing no emotion. Ino lays in the bed, sedated and unconscious. She'll be fine, Inoichi. It will take time, but I'm perfectly capable of healing these injuries, Sanadi assures. The Yamanaka's head is down for a moment before he turns, grabbing the Hokage by his coat to everyone's shock. How could you let this happen, Minato? He demands. What do you mean let it happen? It was sanctioned combat. These are the Chunin exams, Minato responds calmly. Don't give me that crap, Minato. She could have been killed. He fires back. That was a risk she was informed of by her sensei before accepting to compete in the exams. And you know I never would have allowed that to happen. Even if Naruto and Satsuki didn't intervene, a fraction of a second would have been more than enough time for me to stop that. You know who I am Minato answers coolly, Inoichi still gripping his coat while Menma steps towards the two, Tsunade doing the same. Where is he anyway? Mr. I'll protect with my life he questions angrily releasing Minato. Where was he when this happened? He demands. Yugaku has been out of the village for the last three days on an S-class assignment. He wasn't present for the preliminaries Minato replies, Satsuki's eyebrows rising for a moment. S-class. Inoichi turns around to face Naruto. Thank you for protecting my daughter, he says. There's no need to thank me. Frankly, even if I hadn't intervened, the Hokage would have been more than fast enough to stop anything more from happening. Naruto responds plainly, Menma balling a fist, a frown marring his face. Ino needs time to rest. For now I'm going to need all of you to leave Tsunade asks. Jonin Lounge, Hokage Tower. I, Kakashi, Asuma and Kurenai are all seated on couches around a coffee table, Kakashi next to Guy. I still can't quite fathom what we saw, Kakashi. Did it really happen? Guy glances at his friend. You mean a genin opening five of the eight inner gates? Kakashi questions Guy, shaking his head at the dig. Not that part, jerk. I mean the other part. Guy responds, the masked Jonin staring into his cup. That boy. To think Lord Forth has a son like that. There's nothing Lee could have done to win that fight. Nothing at all. That speed and strength. The elemental mastery. And that chakra. Just what kind of training has Lord Forth put that boy through? Minato sensei didn't train Naruto Kakashi answers, earning a look of surprise from Guy and others present. What? He didn't. But how? Where else could the boy have seen such development from? Guy questions. I've known Minato sensei since I was six years old, Guy. He did not train that boy. Neither did Lady Kashina. Their fighting styles are nothing alike. They're to jutsu. Even the wind style manipulation he showed is completely different to Minato sensei's. It looked to me like whoever trained him isn't from the hidden leaf, Kakashi says. That's quite the claim, Kakashi Asuma adds. But it still makes the most sense. He responds. That chakra of his Kurinai adds, I've never felt anything like it. It was as if he wasn't even H. Kurinai didn't finish her sentence, not knowing how to phrase what she was about to say differently. 
hour, Minato's office, I'm sure you can understand my position. The fact that I wasn't informed that the hidden sand would be sending a Jinchuriki to compete is very disappointing. Minato voices Gara's Jonin sensei standing before him. Of course, apologies again Lord Fourth Baki apologizes. I've already reached out to the fourth Kazakiage. As Gara's Jonin instructor, can you assure me that Gara is stable? Aki opens his mouth but doesn't speak, glancing away, Minato sighing at the response. Look, I won't take any drastic measures for now, but if at any point between now and the conclusion of the exams, I get the impression that Gara is a real security risk, I will act and bar him from the exam at the drop of a hat. I also want to make it clear to you, while you're here, that if I feel like having him under surveillance while he's within the village walls, I'm going to do that, Minato explains calmly. Aki nods in agreement. He's not about to argue with the most powerful shinobi in the world in his own territory. Very well then, thank you Baki. The pleasure is mine Lord Hokage the sand shinobi respectfully utters before departing, shutting the door behind himself and leaving Minato alone who peels a piece of paper with a seal on it out of one of his desk drawers. The heaven curse mark. It'll take a couple of weeks maybe. He won't be able to get rid of the mark completely unfortunately, as he doesn't have whatever original sealing formula Rachimaru used to create it, but he feels confident of engineering a way to safely assimilate it with Sasuke's own chakra network and allow him to at least activate it safely. He made the same offer to Anko years ago, after applying the same restrictive seal, but she'd refused vehemently. But Hisateru, the night sky, littered with stars, hangs over as history sits on the bench, the old man dressed in overalls, his face greased up, a paper in his hand seemingly occupying. My, my, quite a lot you've brought to me today. The old man muses, speaking in code. MHMH. He responds, taking a mouthful of the cup of noodles in his hand to the mouth. And Fugaku isn't in the village at the moment you say. That loose cannon's probably gone on a self-assigned assassination mission, the old man says. Snake's boy got drawn against me in the exam and forfeited. Do you think he knew who I was? Hisateru chuckles. No, I doubt that. He was likely planted by Orochimaru to keep tabs on Sasuke and his reaction to the curse mark. The outcome of the exam was inconsequential, the old man surmises. We should snatch him, the boy suggests. Oh no, I know that one from a long time ago. He's cut from the same cloth we deal in. He'd very likely take measures to delete himself and any useful information completely before we could retrieve anything the old man responds to. This Ateru inwardly grumbles. He might know something about Kaori's sister. You've brought me very good intel, but perhaps what sticks out to me most are the details you've given me concerning Minato's eldest. To counter the hidden Loda successfully by simply infusing his own chakra along with the other information. He sounds like quite the prodigy. There's someone else we need to keep an eye on. Anzo knows very well that the boy is despised by most in the village and isn't too close to his family either. That combination could make him a prime candidate for recruiting. Fugaku being his Jonin instructor just happens to be a big problem and perhaps not worth the headache. Do bad I can't go all out against him if we face each other in the finals. What a rumble that would be Hisateru smiles to himself, Danzo shaking his head. You getting promoted can benefit our goals in the long term of course. But remember, never show your hand history finishes in unison with the old man while rolling his eyes. With Menma. He sits on the edge of his bed staring at a picture of himself and. Flashback six years prior. Bro. He calls, seeing the blonde walk away. Big bro, I'm going to play ball with Kiba and his friends. Come on. He shouts, gesturing to his brother to come along. Naruto looks on at the boy. Every time Menma has him around his friends, he feels invisible. The others make it a point to not acknowledge him in any way. He'd rather actually be alone. He knows it isn't Menma's fault, but it's not like he's going to do anything about it either. It's bigger than him. Some other time Menma, I'm not feeling well he says turning and walking away leaving a dejected Menma. Flashback end. He tucks the now ancient picture back in his drawer, shutting it. He let his mother focus on Mito for the next month. His father has his own responsibilities, so he doesn't plan on bothering him either. This next month he's going to punish himself, he's going to go to hell and come back. He saw what happened to Lee, but that won't faze him. There isn't a conceivable reality where he loses this fight. He can't, he muses to himself, lifting his hand, blue lightning nature chakra dancing around it in the darkness of his room for a moment. It sparks up again, this time a dark red colored hue. He won't lose. He'll stop breathing before he loses. New Chiha clan compound. Show me your neck Makoto orders Sasuke, having already spoken to Minato days ago. The boy gazes back at her reluctantly to her ire. Sasuke, do not make me angry. I said show me your neck. She demands, the boy begrudgingly complying, showing it to her, Mikoto gritting her teeth and bawling her fists at the sight. She wraps her arms around him, tears leaving her eyes, Sasuke wanting to push her off but choosing to be considered. That disgusting low life. No. It won't happen. 
she'll be dead and buried before she loses the son too. Three days later. Gureya sits in front of Minato's desk, a hard frown on his face, as if the day, young as it is, is already ruined. The Sharingan, huh? So his goal is still that silly aspiration of acquiring all he muses, clearly Minato responds. And going after Fugaku's youngest son because he knows the man himself and Itachi are out of the question. Jiraiya adds, pinching the bridge of his nose, are there any depths left you won't sink to Orochimaru? He questions out loud. It doesn't appear so to him. All indications suggest that he would have done the same thing to Fugaku's daughter as well. It just happened that Naruto was there to protect her, speaking of which you say that Naruto fought him? Jiraiya questions as if to suggest Minato had been joking. Are you sure about that Minato? No offense but I have trouble, believing that I'll be honest, believe that a voice interjects, both heads turning to see Fugaku standing in front one of the windows of the office that overlooks the village, the man told me himself he says stepping into the room, you're back already? You found him? Minato questions. The rat escaped through another of his holes apparently. He told me himself that Naruto took his arm away, he says, earning a gasp from Jiraiya. Fugaku produces a bag tossing it onto the table, Minato opening it and taking a look before pushing it across the desk to Jiraiya who looks inside. Several hidden sound headbands, stained in blood. That isn't possible, he's a child Jiraiya utters in disbelief. That's not all he is actually. He says, turning his head to Minato. Orochimaru also told me Naruto is the one he wants now he says, Minato's eyes widening before a dark look is etched in his blue eyes. What? He asks, fury evident in his cool tone. He could have been lying, but we already know he wants the Sharingan, so frankly there's no reason to. And the fact that he told me suggests that he's confident that by some miracle that's going to happen. The only miracle is him living. I'll wipe this so-called hidden sound away from the face of the earth by myself before I allow him to come near my son. Minato utters coldly, a bead of sweat running down Jiraiya's voice. He knows how dangerous his student is and what he's capable of when that look is in his eyes. Hold on now. Minato, we agreed you would allow me to deal with Orochimaru the sage interjects. Agreed. Fugaku questions he's still alive. What have you been doing in the meantime? Where were you three days ago while he was in here running around, preying on kids? Probably off somewhere being a pervert, Fugaku scoffs, Jiraiya standing up and the two coming face to face, inches from one another. It disappoints me to hear you address your sensei this way, Fugaku. After all these years, you still don't have a shred of respect to show me. Jiraiya questions smirking. Nope. Sorry Fugaku responds plainly, you let your feelings get in the way when you had the chance to finish that rat and have continued to do so for years. So now it's off your hands. I'm going to kill your friend myself and if you have a problem with it, let's see you do it first Fugaku retorts coolly while smirking back, Jiraiya's own expression shifting into a frown. Enough Minato interjects the tune in exams in a month's time. My attention will be on ensuring that takes place without a single thing out of place. Once that's over, we will turn our attention to Orochimaru. Fugaku's right, sensei. The longer he's alive, the higher the risk of him running amok in other jurisdictions and the blame for that coming back to the leaf. He's been allowed to live for too long, then let me deal with him, Jiraiya insists, turning to Minato. Just shut up already, you sound pathetic, Fugaku scoffs. Fugaku? Minato reprimands as Jiraiya swiftly turns back to the Achiha, the clan leader unflinching. Stop speaking to sensei like this. It isn't right. Jiraiya sensei, I'm sorry. But this is out of my hands now. Whatever this hidden sound nonsense is, it needs to be crushed before it starts stepping on the wrong people's toes, Minato says with finality. Don't worry Fugaku says to the elder ninja as they gaze into one another's eyes, Jiraiya smiling challengingly, I'll bring a piece of him back to you. He says stepping past the elder ninja towards Minato. How's my team holding up? With Sasuke. Please Kakashi sensei, train me. Help me get prepared for the final Sasuke begs, having dragged himself up the tall butte. Kakashi looks at the boy for a moment before sighing. All right, he says. But Naruto. He bolts upright, sweating profusely, tossing the covers to one side and making a beeline for the bathroom, on his knees, his dinner coming back up. He stands, letting the water run and splashing it all over his face, his breathing only now beginning to slow. He doesn't even remember which one it was this time. Usually he remembers the most common one. He always remembers that one when it happens. He pushes the flush on his toilet, stepping back from his bathroom. He grunts a hand moving to his ribs. He's really starting to feel these injuries now. His brow furrows as he hears a knock on the front door. A knock on his door. Since when? He makes his way out of his room, through the living room and towards the door, pulling it open. Fugaku sensei greets the Ichiha, stepping back, inviting him to step in. Inviting someone into his home, a foreign feeling this. You miss the preliminaries, Naruto says as the Ichiha walks into the neatly organized space. I've been away for a bit, snake hunting, duty calls he says, Naruto turning to look him in the eye after shutting the door. 
Are you successful? Not exactly he responds but that will come. Well done on protecting your teammates Naruto. And on a personal level, I want to thank you for protecting my daughter. You don't know what it means. Ichiha expresses gratitude. There's no need to thank me, he responds. Congratulations on the preliminaries. You and I both know when I'm not around, I expect you step up for Team 12, Higaku says smiling, if it were up to me you'd be up for Jonin frankly, but for now, you're certain to make Chunin in my eyes Higaku says, ruffling the boy's head who sweat drops at the gesture but doesn't complain. Sasuke's going to be training with Kakashi for the next few weeks. So I'll be making sure Satsuki gets ready. I want you to come train with us, I'll have to decline sensei. I already had something in mind. Naruto respectfully declines Fugaku smirking. Look at you, planning on writing your name all over that tournament board huh? Naruto shrugs in response. But Ino injured I just also think it makes more sense for you to take this chance to focus on Satsuki. You can help her continue to develop her proficiency with her Sharingan and fire style he adds, Fugaku's smirk growing. Ever the ninjutsu expert. Alright, Naruto. If you change your mind you know where to find me, Ichiha says walking towards the door. But Kabuto, he stands in a dark room, beneath the hidden leaf candles lining the walls. One of his master's safe houses was never found. Said master is on a screen before him, heavily bandaged. Hey are you certain of what you've just said, Lord Orochimaru? He utters in disbelief. Come now, Kabuto, don't insult me, Orochimaru scoffs. The H the wood style of the first Hokage, he repeats. You say the boy stopped five of the eight inner gates of the hidden lotus? Orochimaru questions. Affirmative, my lord. Orochimaru chuckles darkly at the confirmation. He is the one Kabuto, there's no doubt in my mind about it. The Sharingan will remain one of our objectives, but that boy is now our priority. If there is truly a shinobi in this world who could be the second coming of the god of shinobi, that individual's body must be mine. He could be the key to all of our plans, but could also be the one to ruin them all. With him at his full potential, Minato, Fugaku, the entire Akatsuki and the other four cage, well three now he muses chuckling. None of them would be able to stop me. And if that doesn't end up being the case then he can't be allowed to live the man speaks, he's the fourth son. How would we go about bringing him to us? Kabuto questions. Patience, Kabuto. You see, unlike Sasuke, that boy is despised in the leaf. Even amongst his own kin, he is an outcast. He has no reason to hold any allegiance to any will of fire. His eyes mirror the hatred in his heart. If we can take advantage of that hate, he will turn his back to the leaf the sand and surmises. Remain in the leaf for the time being until the exams are concluded and await further instructions. Uzumaki Namaka's training ground, so you want me to train you huh? Jiraiya muses, Menma standing across from him. It's best if mom focuses all her attention on me though. Dad is Hokage, I can't expect him to give up a month before the Chunin exams to train me, he explains. Jiraiya chuckles at his sneaky reasoning. Minato can just use his shadow clones. The boy really wants to prove himself to his father without his direct help. MHMH. Alright then. I already have something in particular in mind Jiraiya complies, Menma grinning from ear to ear. Before we get started though there's someone I need to have a word with the Sanin ads. Hidden Leaf General Hospital Shinobi Wing. She lays in her bed, fast asleep, and Moichi sitting by her side, face showing clear signs of sleep deprivation. Tsunade walks in, holding a clipboard. Alright Inoichi, if you don't go home, get clean and get something to eat, I'm throwing you out of here, she says firmly. Give me a break Tsunade, he grumbles. You really want your daughter waking up to see you like this? Well I won't allow it, she says firmly, holding a fist up, the Yamanaka grumbling once more to himself before lifting himself from the seat, planting a kiss on his daughter's forehead before exiting the room, Tsunade following. Their footsteps fade before another pair begins to become audible, growing closer to the room. The figure steps forward, darkening the doorway to the room, overlooking the girl. He takes a few steps forward, coming to stand at the foot of the bed. Silence hangs over the room as he begins to lift his hand. You lost, pal. A voice question. Ara turns Kami to see the Ichiha girl standing there, a leaf jonin with brown hair with her, leaning against the doorway. Tsutsuki stares the red head down with a frown. Damn the political consequences, she'll kill this word a right here and now before he hurts her friend again. Yugaku watches on Kami. So this is the Jinchuriki of the Hidden Sand. M.H. It's you. Where's the blonde one? Don't you worry about Naruto. Cause the way it's looking to me now you might not even get to see him, she venomously utters to a nonchalant Gara. I have no interest in you he responds, the girl gritting her teeth even tighter. You're just a child. Your hatred is incomparable to mine. But he is. That is why I want him, he adds, Fugaku frowning a bit at the comment. Alright pal he speaks again for a second time, gesturing behind himself. I tail it, now he orders calmly. The redhead gazes at both of them for a few seconds before calmly walking towards the exit, past both of them. Satsuki briskly walks towards the bed to check on Ino. 
Fugaku remains by the doorway. That kid is being followed by Anbu and he probably knows. If they'd been a few seconds later, it might have got messy in here. But Naruto. Naruto, sitting against the trunk, beneath the shade of his favorite tree, wraps another scroll closed, placing it in the row. Suddenly his preparations for his departure are interrupted. You've gotten older, he looks up to see the silhouette of a grown male sitting in the tree. The figure jumps down to stand over him. Lord Jiraiya greets simply. Naruto the man smiles back. Well aren't you just the spitting image of your father? He says looking at the boy. How have you been kidding? Healthy Naruto responds plainly. I can see. Congrats on making it to the finals of the Chunin exams. Your dad told me all about it. These next few weeks are gonna have to be a whole lot of training for you. Why don't I help you out with that? Jirei offers expecting the boy to jump ecstatically at the opportunity. No, thanks, he declines. No thanks. He repeats. Have you forgotten by some miracle who I am? Jirei questions boisterously getting ready tea. I remember who you are. Please don't start posing and dancing, he responds, Jirei sweat dropping at the comment. This kid seems to take after Fugaku more than Minato, he muses sweat dropping. You're no fun at all, are you? He questions snatching one of the scrolls on the ground and jumping back. Naruto stands up, tucking the rest away while sighing. Tell you what. If you can take this scroll back from me I he doesn't finish his sentence as the air leaves his body, a kick meeting his stomach, releasing his grip on the scroll and sending him into the dirt, the sanin jumping back to his feet. Such speed. That was Jonin level. He says to himself clutching his stomach while Naruto stands there with the scroll in his hand. There. He responds, turning his back. Oh no, we're not done yet. You're gonna show me what you're made of Jiraiya shouts sprinting towards the blonde who whips around blocking a chop to the side of the neck, swinging a kick that Jiraiya parries. The two exchange a flurry of blows cancelling each other out, Jiraiya stepping back and Naruto scoffing. I don't have time for this, he sneers. The two sprint towards one another, Jiraiya launching a flying kick that the boy sidesteps swinging a spinning one of his own that the older male parries. A flurry of blows flies between the two, Naruto scowling while Jiraiya laughs ecstatically, the genin and older shinobi jumping back from one another. The two spring towards one another again, Jiraiya's eyes widening as suddenly the blonde begins to glow a white hue. He tries to dig his heels into the earth as they approach one another. Too late, of Tamari, Kankuro and Baki. Just what good is moaning supposed to do? Tamari asks, visibly frustrated. I'm not moaning, I'm just being honest Tamari, I'm really worried. He's clearly become more unstable as the exams have progressed Kankuro responds. The exams have provided ideal conditions for him to act more violently Baki speaks, the two genin turning their heads, but it's only provoked the bloodlust of the beast, he seems to react particularly differently to that kid. The blonde one's teammate Kankuro adds. Naruto Tamari says. The Hokage already had a word with me about him. The two of you just keep an eye on him. But Ino, he was here? Ino questions. That freak. I would have killed him in this damned hospital before I let him do anything to you Satsuki growls, responding to her friend. That boy Satsuki, is he facing Naruto in the finals? Fugaku asks. No, he's gonna fight Sasuke, she responds looking down, Fugaku frowning in thought. He'll have to check in on Kakashi and Sasuke later. Make sure they're not slacking off. He seems to have some kind of obsession with Naruto. She voices. Where is Naruto? Yamanaka asks. She hasn't spoken to him since that day when she refused to listen to him and he protected her again. Is he still mad at her? He's preparing for the finals, Fugaku answers. Okage Tower, Minato's office. Oh I see Minato says, his son standing in front of him. And so I need your permission to leave the village until the commencement of the finals Naruto finishes. That isn't a problem, Naruto. I was actually hoping to help you out with preparing, the village leader adds. That won't be necessary if he responds to Minato's dejection. Um, alright. Well, there's no problem with Naruto. Until the exams are concluded you're not on official duty anyway, so I'll grant you permission to leave. Thank you, Lord Hokage, he responds, turning and leaving. Good luck, Naruto. He adds, the boy turning and acknowledging with a simple nod before departing, leaving a somber Minato. Is he ever going to get his son back? He sighs to himself, taking the Heaven Curse Mark seal tag back out and continuing his work on it. Leaf General Hospital Shinobi Wing. You're still the same clown you've always been, Sanadi scoffs patching Jiraiya up. How was I supposed to know the kid was gonna set off an exploding clone on me or that he can use shadow clones? Jiraiya pleads his defense as Sanadi tightens the bandage around his temple. He whimpers as she gives him a smack to the head. Minato told you about him and you're surprised he can summon shadow clones. No, you were just being stupid. She retorts to which he sighs. A child for Adorachimaru and survived. I just can't believe Tsunade, he says in a more serious tone. Even if he held back, which is probably the case, it still is. Minato showed you. The proof didn't he? 
she asks in a more somber tone, careful of her wording to which he nods. He's clearly a generational talent, and yet Minato confessed to not teaching him any of what he knows Jiraiya muses. But it be that I was. He'll have to go look for Menma so they can get started soon. The brat might well be in for the fight of his life. With Menma, that jerk. Probably off somewhere prying on undressed women. Damned pervert. Menma huffs, marching through the village. He turns the corner to be met with the sight of none other than Niji Hayuga, carrying a few bruises and cuts. He frowns, images of Hinata's bruised and bloodied body rushing back to him. Well, well. Someone's been hard at work Menma speaks coming to stand across from the Hayuga clansman. The Hayuga simply responds, continuing to walk past Menma. That's what I want to see. Once I've kicked Naruto's ass, you're up next so you better make it worth a while he says, the older genin coming to a stop. He turns his head making eye contact with the rookie. You just focus on doing enough to make Chunin. Because you don't even stand a chance against your brother the boy responds smirking, wiping Menma's own off of his face. And what makes you think that? He questions, narrowing his eyes. You're a talented boy, there's no doubt about it. But your brother. Is cut from a different cloth from you. It's that simple. Are you some kind of an expert on that loser? I've seen enough to know he's nothing like you, he responds. Yeah. And that's exactly why he doesn't stand a chance. Menma fires back, Niji simply smirking. Ignorance is bliss. Him, you and Sasuke. I'm praying I get to face all of you. So that it becomes clear as day who's who in this village. He utters firmly. The Hayuga simply continues to walk, not giving another response. He will lose. But Naruto, his legs are crossed as he sits on the floor of his living room. He had wanted to depart from his place of refuge as had always been the case, years ago, but the Toad Sage had annoyingly ruined that so he'll leave from here. In any case it makes no difference. He grunts slightly, a hand reaching for his side. His chakra had done a considerable bit of work in healing and suppressing the injuries he'd suffered at the hands of Rock Lee, but he's definitely been feeling his battle wounds more as the days have passed. He refused to be examined by the medics to the near murderous rage of a certain blonde Sanin. He might be nursing a few fractures. He bites into his thumb, drawing a drop of blood, weaving through the old signs, not missing a beat before slamming a hand on the floor of his living room, a ceiling array springing from it to surround him. It's time. Reverse summoning he exclaims, smoke immersing with a poof sound, remaining for a few moments before lifting to reveal him gone. The Fugaku, their brother will be preparing for the finals with Kakashi. Naruto says he has his own plans for the month, outside the village the elder Ichiha speaks. He resists a small smile as he notes the look of intrigue mixed with disappointment at this mention of his blonde male student. So it'll be just you and me. Which could be quite beneficial to you actually. Kakashi tells me your opponent is a wielder of the Uzumaki adamantine ceiling chains, as well as the Nine Tails Chakra. That means we have a whole lot of work ahead of us, he says firmly, his daughter nodding in response with a determined look etched on her face. He believes in Naruto fully, and he knows that with his guidance his daughter will be ready as well. Tsutsuki gazes at her father with determination. She will not lose this fight. It isn't an option. But Naruto. The bird call echoes throughout the canopy as Naruto pulls himself up by a vine on the steep incline. He takes a glance below, the jungle stretching out below, clouds obscuring the view in parts. He looks up ahead, pulling himself up again, and taking a leap to stand on a flatter bit of terrain fog ahead of him. His head lifts as he hears roars once in the distance from all directions. A pair of eyes glow in the fog as a silhouette on all fours slowly approaches, its eyes comparable to that of a fully grown horse. The silhouette emerges, mane billowing in the cool wind that passes every few moments. Naruto can't help the smirk that comes onto his face as the lion walks closer. I knew that scent the moment it hit my nose. The great intruder himself the beast greets and speaks in a low voice, Naruto visibly trying to catch his breath. It's been a while and the altitude is showing that to him. Dido he greets smiling as the beast stands before him, towering over him. Well well. You're not as tiny as you once were brat. I don't suppose I'm worth running from anymore. The beast mocks, Naruto scoffing, smirk still in place. You wish he retorts, the beast turning and gesturing with its head. Jump on then, before those little lungs run out of breath completely. Naruto complies, hopping onto the animal's back before it springs away, leaping through the terrain with speed and agility that defy logic for its eyes. Training ground 7, the younger Kinoichi swings her katana laterally, blocked by her teacher's own. She aims a swinging leg to the side of the head, only for this to be caught by a hand before a foot meets her midsection, sending her back onto the ground, Kishina catching her katana and holding both in either hand. Mido jumps back to her feet, already bruised and bloodied, eyes now red, claws on display. Their opponent is in a chair, Mido Kishina speaks a Sharingan wielder, being trained by one of its most adept wielders to emerge from the clan in generations. 
You can't hope to simply rely on the Nine Tails Chakra to win this Kashina speaks, Nido taking her words in for a moment before sighing and nodding, eyes returning to their original color and claws retracting. Your ceiling chains can still be decisive, but not if you allow yourself to fall under a witch, in this case, can happen merely from eye contact. This will likely be more difficult than facing your sister Kashina continues Nido nodding again in affirmative. Facing her sister was difficult, but she expects this to be even harder. We'll get to the strategic element of your preparation, but for now we need to focus on further honing your physicality and sensory. The Sharingan's ability to read and predict movements including hand signs is unparalleled. So we need to maximize your base speed and strength as much as we can, without the multiplier of the Nine Tails Chakra she speaks, tossing the younger Kanoichi's katana back to her, who catches it by the handle in one hand. Now again. But Naruto, Undress roars Echo out as Naruto, still on Jito's back, approaches the huge stone, lions of different sizes, surrounding them, and more roars coming from the surrounding jungle and lush savanna valley below. He drinks in the grand view of the summit as the roars of welcome continue. Dido comes to stand before the stone, Naruto getting off and turning for a moment to bow his head in acknowledgement and gratitude of the welcome. He turns back toward the large stone, the towering stone lions on either side of the open doors still there. He steps forward into the darkened space, walking towards the center where a fire sits, bringing into view the gargantuan male lion laying before it, his eyelids lifting to reveal his golden eyes, as Naruto comes to stand before him, bowing his head while greeting. Chief Naruto Helios responds in a thunderous bellow welcome home. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.